the first book. One, of my grandfather Varus, I have learned to be gentle and meek and to refrain from all anger and passion. From the fame and memory of him that begot me, I have learned both shamefastness and manlike behavior. Of my mother, I have learned to be religious and bountiful and to forbear not only to do, but to intend any evil to content myself with a spare diet and to fly all such excess as is incidental to great wealth. Of my great-grandfather, both to frequent public schools and auditories and to get me good and able teachers at home, and that I ought not to think much if upon such occasions I were at excessive charges. Two, of him that brought me up, not to be fondly addicted to either of the two great factions of the courses in the circus, called Prasini, and vanity, nor in the amphitheatre partially to favour any of the gladiators or fencers, as either the parmulari or the secutores. Moreover, to endure labour, nor to need many things, when I have anything to do, to do it myself rather than by others, not to meddle with many businesses, and not easily to admit of any slander. Three of Diognetus, not to busy myself about vain things and not easily to believe those things which are commonly spoken by such as take upon them to work wonders, and by sorcerers, or prestidigitators, and impostors, concerning the power of charms, and their driving out of demons or evil spirits, and the like. Not to keep quails for the game, nor to be mad after such things, not to be offended with other men's liberty of speech, and to apply myself unto philosophy. Him also I must thank that ever I heard first Bacchius, then Tandasus and Marcianus, and that I did write dialogues in my youth, and that I took liking to the philosopher's little couch and skins, and such other things, which by the Grecian discipline are proper to those who profess philosophy. For to Rusticus I am beholding that I first entered into the conceit that my life wanted some redress and cure, and then that I did not fall into the ambition of ordinary sophists, either to write tracts concerning the common theorems, or to exhort men unto virtue and the study of philosophy by public orations, as also that I never by way of ostentation did affect to show myself an active able man for any kind of bodily exercises, and that I gave over the study of rhetoric and poetry and of elegant, neat language. That I did not use to walk about the house in my long robe, nor to do any such things. Moreover, I learned of him to write letters without any affectation or curiosity, such as that was, which by him was written to my mother from Sinuessa, and to be easy and ready to be reconciled and well pleased again with them that had offended me, as soon as any of them would be content to seek unto me again, to read with diligence, not to rest satisfied with a light and superficial knowledge, nor quickly to assent to things commonly spoken of, whom also I must thank that ever I lighted upon Epictetus, his hypomnemata, or moral commentaries and common factions, which also he gave me of his own. Five. From Apollonius true liberty and unvariable steadfastness, and not to regard anything at all, though never so little, but right and reason, and always, whether in the sharpest pains, or after the loss of a child, or in long diseases, to be still the same man, who also was a present and visible example unto me, that it was possible for the same man to be both vehement and remiss, a man not subject to be vexed, and offended with the incapacity of his scholars and auditors in his lectures and expositions, and a true pattern of a man who of all his good gifts and faculties least esteemed in himself, that his excellent skill and ability to teach and persuade others the common theorems and maxims of the Stoic philosophy. Of him also I learned how to receive favors and kindnesses, as commonly they are accounted, from friends, so that I might not become obnoxious unto them. For them, nor more yielding upon occasion, than in right I ought, and yet so that I should not pass them neither, as an unsensible and unthankful man. 6. Of Sextus, 
mildness and the pattern of a family governed with paternal affection, and a purpose to live according to nature, to be grave without affectation, to observe carefully the several dispositions of my friends, not to be offended with idiots, nor unseasonably to set upon those that are carried with the vulgar opinions, with the theorems and tenets of philosophers, his conversation being an example how a man might accommodate himself to all men and companies, so that though his company were sweeter and more pleasing than any flatterer's cogging and fawning, yet was it at the same time most respected and reverenced, who also had a proper happiness and faculty, rationally and methodically, to find out and set in order all necessary determinations and instructions for a man's life, a man without ever the least appearance of anger or any other passion, able at the same time most exactly to observe the stoic apathiana or unpassionateness, and yet to be most tender-hearted, ever of good credit, and yet almost without any noise or rumor, very learned, and yet making little show. 7. From Alexander the Grammarian, to be unreprovable myself, and not reproachfully to reprehend any man for a barbarism, or a solecism, or any false pronunciation, but dexterously by way of answer, or testimony, or confirmation of the same matter, taking no notice of the word, to utter it as it should have been spoken, or by some other such close and indirect admonition, handsomely and civilly to tell him of it. 8. Of Fronto, to how much envy and fraud and hypocrisy the state of a tyrannous king is subject unto, and how they who are commonly called ephatridae, i.e. nobly born, are in some sort incapable or void of natural affection. 9. Of Alexander the Platonic, not often nor without great necessity to say, or to write to any man in a letter, I am not at leisure, nor in this manner still to put off those duties which we owe to our friends and acquaintances, to everyone in his kind, under pretense of urgent affairs. 10. Of Catullus, not to contemn any friend's expostulation, though unjust, but to strive to reduce him to his former disposition, freely and heartily to speak well of all my masters upon any occasion, as it is reported of Domitius and Athenodotus, and to love my children with true affection. 11. From my brother Severus, to be kind and loving to all them of my house and family, by whom also I came to the knowledge of Thracia and Helvidius, and Cato, and Dio, and Brutus. He it was also that did put me in the first conceit and desire of an equal commonwealth, administered by justice and equality, and of a kingdom wherein should be regarded, nothing more than the good and welfare of the subjects, of him also to observe a constant tenor, not interrupted with any other cares and distractions, in the study and esteem of philosophy, to be bountiful and liberal in the largest measure, always to hope the best, and to be confident that my friends love me, in whom I moreover observed open dealing towards those whom he reproved at any time, and that his friends might without all doubt or much observation know what he would or would not, so open and plain was he. And from Claudius Maximus, in all things to endeavor to have power of myself, and in nothing to be carried about, to be cheerful and courageous in all sudden chances and accidents, as in sicknesses, to love mildness and moderation and gravity, and to do my business, whatsoever it be, thoroughly and without querulousness. Whatsoever he said, all men believed him that as he spake so he thought, and whatsoever he did, that he did it with a good intent. His manner was never to wonder at anything, never to be in haste and yet never slow, nor to be perplexed or dejected, or at any time unseemly, or excessively to laugh, nor to be angry or suspicious, but ever ready to do good, and to forgive, and to speak truth. And all this, as one that seemed rather of himself to have been straight and right, than ever to have been rectified or redressed, neither was there any man that ever thought himself undervalued by him, 
or that could find in his heart to think himself a better man than he. He would also be very pleasant and gracious. 13. In my father, I observed his meekness, his constancy without wavering in those things, which after a due examination and deliberation he had determined. How free from all vanity he carried himself in matter of honor and dignity, as they are esteemed. His laboriousness and assiduity, his readiness to hear any man that had ought to say tending to any common good. How generally and impartially he would give every man his due, his skill and knowledge, when rigor or extremity, or when remissness or moderation was in season, how he did abstain from all unchaste love of youths, his moderate condescending to other men's occasions as an ordinary man, neither absolutely requiring of his friends, that they should wait upon him at his ordinary meals, nor that they should of necessity accompany him in his journeys, and that whensoever any business upon some necessary occasions was to be put off and omitted before it could be ended, he was ever found when he went about it again the same man that he was before, his accurate examination of things in consultations and patient hearing of others. He would not hastily give over the search of the matter as one easy to be satisfied with sudden notions and apprehensions, his care to preserve his friends, how neither at any time he would carry himself towards them with disdainful neglect and grow weary of them nor yet at any time be madly fond of them. His contented mind in all things, his cheerful countenance, his care to foresee things afar off, and to take order for the least, without any noise or clamor. Moreover, how all acclamations and flattery were repressed by him, how carefully he observed all things necessary to the government and kept an account of the common expenses and how patiently he did abide that he was reprehended by some for this his strict and rigid kind of dealing, how he was neither a superstitious worshipper of the gods, nor an ambitious pleaser of men, or studious of popular applause, but sober in all things, and everywhere observant of that which was fitting, no effector of novelties, in those things which conduced to his ease and convenience, plenty whereof his fortune did afford him without pride and bragging, yet with all freedom and liberty, so that as he did freely enjoy them without any anxiety or affectation when they were present, so when absent he found no want of them. Moreover, that he was never commended by any man as either a learned acute man, or an obsequious officious man, or a fine orator, but as a ripe mature man, a perfect sound man, one that could not endure to be flattered able to govern both himself and others. Moreover, how much he did honor all true philosophers without upbraiding those that were not so. His sociableness, his gracious and delightful conversation, but never unto satiety, his care of his body within bounds and measure, not as one that desired to live long or overstudious of neatness and elegancy, and yet not as one that did not regard it, so that through his own care and providence he seldom needed any inward physics or outward applications, but especially how ingeniously he would yield to any that had obtained any peculiar faculty, as either eloquence, or the knowledge of the laws, or of ancient customs, or the like, and how he concurred with them, in his best care and endeavor that every one of them might, in his kind, for that wherein he excelled, be regarded and esteemed. And although he did all things carefully after the ancient customs of his forefathers, yet even of this was he not desirous that men should take notice, that he did imitate ancient customs. Again, how he was not easily moved and tossed up and down, but loved to be constant, both in the same places and businesses, and how after his great fits of headache he would return fresh and vigorous to his wonted affairs. Again, that secrets he neither had many nor often, and such only as concerned public matters, his discretion and moderation, in exhibiting of the public sights and shows for the pleasure and pastime of the people, in public buildings, congieries, and the like. In all these things, 
having a respect unto men only as men, and to the equity of the things themselves, and not unto the glory that might follow, never wont to use the baths at unseasonable hours, no builder, never curious or solicitous, either about his meat, or about the workmanship, or color of his clothes, or about anything that belonged to external beauty. In all his conversation, far from all inhumanity, all boldness and incivility, all greediness and impetuosity, never doing anything with such earnestness and intention that a man could say of him that he did sweat about it, but contrarywise, all things distinctly, as at leisure, without trouble, orderly, soundly, and agreeably. A man might have applied that to him, which is recorded of Socrates, that he knew how to want and to enjoy those things, in the want whereof most men show themselves weak, and in the fruition intemperate, but to hold out firm and constant, and to keep within the compass of true moderation and sobriety in either estate, is proper to a man who hath a perfect and invincible soul, such as he showed himself in the sickness of Maximus. 14. From the gods I received that I had good grandfathers and parents, a good sister, good masters, good domestics, loving kinsmen, almost all that I have, and that I never through haste and rashness transgressed against any of them, notwithstanding that my disposition was such, as that such a thing, if occasion had been, might very well have been committed by me, but that it was the mercy of the gods to prevent such a concurring of matters and occasions as might make me to incur this blame, that I was not long brought up by the concubine of my father, that I preserved the flower of my youth, that I took not upon me to be a man before my time, but rather put it off longer than I needed, that I lived under the government of my lord and father, who would take away from me all pride and vain glory, and reduce me to that conceit and opinion that it was not impossible for a prince to live in the court without a troop of guards and followers, extraordinary apparel, such and such torches and statues, and other like particulars of state and magnificence, but that a man may reduce and contract himself almost to the state of a private man, and yet for all that not to become the more base and remiss in those public matters and affairs wherein power and authority is requisite, that I have had such a brother who by his own example might stir me up to think of myself, and by his respect and love, delight and please me, that I have got ingenuous children, and that they were not born distorted, nor with any other natural deformity, that I was no great proficient in the study of rhetoric and poetry, and of other faculties, which perchance I might have dwelt upon, if I had found myself to go on in them with success, that I did by times prefer those by whom I was brought up to such places and dignities, which they seemed unto me most to desire, and that I did not put them off with hope and expectation, that, since that they were yet but young, I would do the same hereafter, that I ever knew Apollonius and Rusticus and Maximus, that I have had occasion often and effectually to consider and meditate with myself concerning that life which is according to nature, what the nature and manner of it is, so that, as for the gods and such suggestions, helps and inspirations, as might be expected from them, nothing did hinder, but that I might have begun long before to live according to nature, or that even now, that I was not yet partaker and in present possession of that life, that I myself, in that I did not observe those inward motions and suggestions, yea, and almost plain and apparent instructions and admonitions of the gods, was the only cause of it, that my body in such a life hath been able to hold out so long, that I never had to do with Benedicta and Theodotus, yea, and afterwards when I fell into some fits of love, I was soon cured, that having been often displeased with Rusticus, I never did him anything for which afterwards I had occasion to repent, that it being so that my mother was to die young, yet she lived with me all her latter years, 
that as often as I had a purpose to help and succor any that either were poor or fallen into some present necessity, I never was answered by my officers that there was not ready money enough to do it, and that I myself never had occasion to require the like succor from any other, that I have such a wife, so obedient, so loving, so ingenuous, that I had choice of fit and able men to whom I might commit the bringing up of my children, that by dreams I have received help, as for other things, so in particular, how I might stay my casting of blood and cure my dizziness, as that also that happened to thee in Cajeta, as unto Chrysis when he prayed by the seashore. And when I did first apply myself to philosophy, that I did not fall into the hands of some sophists, or spent my time either in reading the manifold volumes of ordinary philosophers, nor in practicing myself in the solution of arguments and fallacies, nor dwelt upon the studies of the meteors and other natural curiosities. All these things without the assistance of the gods and fortune could not have been. 15. In the country of the Quadi at Granua, these. Betimes in the morning say to thyself, This day I shalt have to do with an idle, curious man, with an unthankful man, a railer, a crafty, false, or an envious man, an unsociable, uncharitable man. All these ill qualities have happened unto them through ignorance of that which is truly good and truly bad. But I that understand the nature of that which is good, that it only is to be desired, and of that which is bad, that it only is truly odious and shameful, who know, moreover, that this transgressor, whosoever he be, is my kinsman, not by the same blood and seed, but by participation of the same reason and of the same divine particle. How can I either be hurt by any of those, since it is not in their power to make me incur anything that is truly reproachful or angry and ill-affected towards him, who by nature is so near unto me? For we are all born to be fellow workers, as the feet, the hands, and the eyelids, as the rows of the upper and under teeth. For such, therefore, to be in opposition is against nature. And what is it to chafe at? and to be averse from, but to be in opposition. 16. Whatsoever I am is either flesh or life, or that which we commonly call the mistress and overruling part of man. Reason. Away with thy books, suffer not thy mind any more to be distracted and carried to and fro, for it will not be, but as even now ready to die, think little of thy flesh, blood, bones, and a skin, a pretty piece of knit and twisted work, consisting of nerves, veins, and arteries. Think no more of it than so. And as for thy life, consider what it is, a wind. Not one constant wind, neither, but every moment of an hour let out and sucked in again. The third is thy ruling part. And here consider, thou art an old man. Suffer not that excellent part to be brought in subjection and to become slavish. Suffer it not to be drawn up and down with unreasonable and unsociable lusts and motions, as it were with wires and nerves. Suffer it not any more, either to repine at anything now present, or to fear and fly anything to come, which the destiny hath appointed thee. 17. Whatsoever proceeds from the gods immediately, that any man will grant totally depends from their divine providence. As for those things that are commonly said to happen by fortune, even those must be conceived to have dependence from nature or from that first and general connection and concatenation of all those things, which more apparently by the divine providence are administered and brought to pass. All things flow from thence, and whatsoever it is that is, is both necessary and conducing to the whole, part of which thou art, and whatsoever it is that is requisite and necessary for the preservation of the general, must of necessity for every particular nature be good and be hopeful. And as for the whole, it is preserved as by the perpetual mutation and conversion of the simple elements one into another, so also by the mutation and alteration of things mixed and compounded. Let these things suffice thee. Let them be always unto thee 
as thy general rules and precepts. As for thy thirst after books, away with it with all speed, that thou die not murmuring and complaining, but truly meek and well satisfied, and from thy heart thankful unto the gods. The second book, one. Remember how long thou hast already put off these things, and how often a certain day and hour, as it were, having been set unto thee by the gods, thou hast neglected it. It is high time for thee to understand the true nature both of the world, whereof thou art a part, and of that Lord and Governor of the world, from whom, as a channel from the spring, thou thyself didst flow, and that there is but a certain limit of time appointed unto thee, which if thou shalt not make use of to calm and allay the many distempers of thy soul, it will pass away, and thou with it, and never after return. 2. Let it be thy earnest and incessant care as a Roman and a man to perform whatsoever it is that thou art about, with true and unfeigned gravity, natural affection, freedom and justice. And as for all other cares and imaginations, how thou mayst ease thy mind of them, which thou shalt do, if thou shalt go about every action as thy last action free from all vanity, all passionate and willful aberration from reason, and from all hypocrisy and self-love and dislike of those things, which by the fates or appointment of God have happened unto thee. Thou seest that those things, which for a man to hold on in a prosperous course and to live a divine life are requisite and necessary, are not many. For the gods will require no more of any man, that shall but keep and observe these things. 3. Do, soul, do abuse and contemn thyself. Yet a while and the time for thee to respect thyself will be at an end. Every man's happiness depends from himself, but behold, thy life is almost at an end. Whilst affording thyself no respect, thou dost make thy happiness to consist in the souls and conceits of other men. 4. Why should any of these things that happen externally so much distract thee Give thyself leisure to learn some good thing, and cease roving and wandering to and fro. Thou must also take heed of another kind of wandering, for they are idle in their actions, who toil and labor in this life, and have no certain scope to which to direct all their motions and desires. 5. For not observing the state of another man's soul, scarce was ever any man known to be unhappy. Tell whosoever they be that intend not, and guide not by reason and discretion the motions of their own souls, they must of necessity be unhappy. 6. These things thou must always have in mind. What is the nature of the universe, and what is mine, in particular? This unto that what relation it hath. What kind of part, of what kind of universe it is, and that there is nobody that can hinder thee but that thou mayest always both do and speak those things which are agreeable to that nature, whereof thou art a part. 7. Theophrastus, where he compares sin with sin, as after a vulgar sense such things I grant may be compared, says well and like a philosopher that those sins are greater which are committed through lust than those which are committed through anger. For he that is angry seems with a kind of grief and close contraction of himself to turn away from reason. But he that sins through lust, being overcome by pleasure, doth in his very sin bewray a more impotent and unmanlike disposition. Well then, and like a philosopher doth he say, that he of the two is the more to be condemned that sins with pleasure than he that sins with grief. For indeed this latter may seem first to have been wronged, and so in some manner through grief thereof to have been forced to be angry, whereas he who through lust doth commit anything did of himself merely resolve upon that action. 8. Whatsoever thou dost affect, whatsoever thou dost project, so do and so project all as one who, for aught thou knowest, may at this very present depart out of this life, and as for death, if there be any gods, it is no grievous thing to leave the society of men. The gods will do thee no hurt, thou mayest be sure. 
But if it be so that there be no gods, or that they take no care of the world, why should I desire to live in a world void of gods and of all divine providence? But gods there be certainly, and they take care for the world. And as for those things which be truly evil, as vice and wickedness, such things they have put in a man's own power, that he might avoid them if he would. And had there been anything besides that had been truly bad and evil, they would have had a care of that also, that a man might have avoided it. But why should that be thought to hurt and prejudice a man's life in this world, which cannot any ways make man himself the better or the worse in his own person? Neither must we think that the nature of the universe did either through ignorance pass these things, or if not as ignorant of them, yet as unable either to prevent or better to order and dispose them. It cannot be that she through want either of power or skill should have committed such a thing, so as to suffer all things both good and bad, equally and promiscuously, to happen unto all both good and bad. As for life, therefore, and death, honor and dishonor, labor and pleasure, riches and poverty, all these things happen unto men indeed, both good and bad, equally. But as things which of themselves are neither good nor bad, because of themselves neither shameful nor praiseworthy. 9. Consider how quickly all things are dissolved and resolved, the bodies and substances themselves, into the matter and substance of the world, and their memories into the general age and time of the world. Consider the nature of all worldly sensible things, of those especially, which either ensnare by pleasure, or for their irksomeness are dreadful, or for their outward luster and show are in great esteem and request, how vile and contemptible, how base and corruptible, how destitute of all true life and being they are. 10. It is the part of a man endowed with a good understanding faculty to consider what they themselves are in very deed, from whose bare conceits and voices honor and credit do proceed, as also what it is to die, and how if a man shall consider this by itself alone, to die, and separate from it in his mind, all those things which with it usually represent themselves unto us, he can conceive of it no otherwise than as of a work of nature, and he that fears any work of nature is a very child. Now death, it is not only a work of nature, but also conducing to nature. 11. Consider with thyself how man, and by what part of his, is joined unto God, and how that part of man is affected when it is said to be diffused. There is nothing more wretched than that soul, which in a kind of circuit compasseth all things, searching, as he saith, even the very depths of the earth, and by all signs and conjectures, prying into the very thoughts of other men's souls. And yet of this is not sensible, that it is sufficient for a man to apply himself wholly and to confine all his thoughts and cares to the tendance of that spirit which is within him, and truly and really to serve him. His service doth consist in this, that a man keep himself pure from all violent passion and evil affection, from all rashness and vanity, and from all manner of discontent, either in regard of the gods or men. For indeed, whatsoever proceeds from the gods deserves respect for their worth and excellency. And whatsoever proceeds from men, as they are our kinsmen, should by us be entertained with love always sometimes, as proceeding from their ignorance, of that which is truly good and bad, a blindness no less than that by which we are not able to discern between white and black, with a kind of pity and compassion also. 12. If thou shouldst live three thousand, or as many as ten thousands of years, yet remember this, that man can part with no life properly, save with that little part of life which he now lives, and that which he lives is no other than that which at every instant he parts with. That then, which is longest of duration, and that which is shortest, come both to one effect. For although, in regard of that which is already past, there may be some inequality, 
yet that time, which is now present and in being, is equal unto all men, and that being it which we part with whensoever we die, it doth manifestly appear, that it can be but a moment of time, that we then part with. For as for that which is either past or to come, a man cannot be said properly to part with it, for how should a man part with that which he hath not? These two things, therefore, thou must remember. First, that all things in the world from all eternity, by a perpetual revolution of the same times and things ever continued and renewed, are of one kind and nature, so that whether for a hundred or two hundred years only, or for an infinite space of time, a man see those things which are still the same, it can be no matter of great moment. And secondly, that that life which any the longest liver or the shortest liver parts with is for length and duration the very same for that only which is present is that which either of them can lose as being that only which they have for that which he hath not no man can truly be said to lose 13. remember that all is but opinion and conceit for those things are plain and apparent, which were spoken unto Monimus the Cynic. And as plain and apparent is the use that may be made of those things, if that which is true and serious in them be received as well as that which is sweet and pleasing. 14. A man's soul doth wrong and disrespect itself first, and especially, when as much as in itself lies, it becomes an apostime, and as it were an excrescency of the world. For to be grieved and displeased with anything that happens in the world is direct apostasy from the nature of the universe, part of which all particular natures of the world are. Secondly, when she either is averse from any man or led by contrary desires or affections tending to his hurt and prejudice, such as are the souls of them that are angry. Thirdly, when she is overcome by any pleasure or pain. Fourthly, when she doth dissemble, and covertly and falsely either doth or saith anything. Fifthly, when she doth either affect or endeavor anything to no certain end, but rashly and without due ratiocination and consideration, how consequent or inconsequent it is to the common end. For even the least things ought not to be done without relation unto the end. And the end of the reasonable creatures is to follow and obey him, who is the reason, as it were, and the law of this great city, an ancient commonwealth. 15. The time of a man's life is as a point, the substance of it ever flowing, the sense obscure, and the whole composition of the body tending to corruption. His soul is restless, fortune uncertain, and fame doubtful. To be brief, as a stream so are all things belonging to the body. As a dream, or as a smoke, so are all that belong unto the soul. Our life is a warfare, and a mere pilgrimage. Fame, after life, is no better than oblivion. What is it then that will adhere and follow? Only one thing. Philosophy. And philosophy doth consist in this, for a man to preserve that spirit which is within him, from all manner of contumelies and injuries, and above all, pains or pleasures, never to do anything either rashly or feignedly or hypocritically, wholly to depend from himself and his own proper actions, all things that happen unto him to embrace contentedly as coming from him from whom he himself also came, and above all things, with all meekness and a calm cheerfulness, to expect death as being nothing else but the resolution of those elements of which every creature is composed. And if the elements themselves suffer nothing by this, their perpetual conversion of one into another, that dissolution and alteration, which is so common unto all, why should it be feared by any? Is not this according to nature? But nothing that is according to nature can be evil. The third book, one. A man must not only consider how daily his life wasteth and decreaseth, but this also, that if he live long, he cannot be certain whether his understanding shall continue so able and sufficient 
for either discreet consideration in matter of businesses or for contemplation, it being the thing whereon true knowledge of things both divine and human doth depend. For if once he shall begin to dote, his respiration, nutrition, his imaginative and appetitive and other natural faculties may still continue the same. He shall find no want of them. But how to make that right use of himself that he should, how to observe exactly in all things that which is right and just, how to redress and rectify all wrong, or sudden apprehensions and imaginations, and even of this particular, whether he should live any longer or no, to consider duly, for all such things, wherein the best strength and vigor of the mind is most requisite, his power and ability will be past and gone. Thou must hasten, therefore, not only because thou art every day nearer unto death than other, but also because that intellective faculty in thee, whereby thou art enabled to know the true nature of things, and to order all thy actions by that knowledge, doth daily waste and decay, or may fail thee before thou die. 2. This also thou must observe, that whatsoever it is that naturally doth happen to things natural hath somewhat in itself that is pleasing and delightful. As a great loaf when it is baked, some parts of it cleave as it were, and part asunder, and make the crust of it rugged and unequal. And yet those parts of it, though in some sort it be against the art and intention of baking itself, that they are thus cleft and parted, which should have been, and were first made all even and uniform, they become it well nevertheless, and have a certain peculiar property to stir the appetite. So figs are accounted fairest and ripest then, when they begin to shrink and wither as it were. So ripe olives, when they are next to putrefaction, then are they in their proper beauty, the hanging down of grapes, the brow of a lion, the froth of a foaming wild boar, and many other like things though by themselves considered, they are far from any beauty, yet because they happen naturally, they both are comely and delightful. So that if a man shall, with a profound mind and apprehension, consider all things in the world, even among all those things which are but mere accessories and natural appendices, as it were, there will scarce appear anything unto him, wherein he will not find matter of pleasure and delight so will he behold with as much pleasure the true rictus of wild beasts as those which by skillful painters and other artificers are imitated. So will he be able to perceive the proper ripeness and beauty of old age, whether in man or woman, and whatsoever else it is that is beautiful and alluring in whatsoever is, with chaste and continent eyes he will soon find out and discern. Those and many other things will he discern, not credible unto everyone, but unto them only who are truly and familiarly acquainted, both with nature itself and all natural things. 3. Hippocrates, having cured many sicknesses, fell sick himself and died. The Chaldeans and astrologians, having foretold the deaths of divers, were afterwards themselves surprised by the fates. Alexander and Pompeius and Caius Caesar, having destroyed so many towns and cut off in the field so many thousands both of horse and foot, yet they themselves at last were fain to part with their own lives. Heraclitus, having written so many natural tracts concerning the last and general conflagration of the world, died afterwards all filled with water within and all bedaubed with dirt and dung without. Lyte killed Democritus, and Socrates, another sort of vermin, wicked, ungodly men. How then stands the case? Thou hast taken ship, thou hast sailed, thou art come to land, go out, if to another life, there also shalt thou find gods, who are everywhere. If all life and sense shall cease, then shalt thou cease also to be subject to either pains or pleasures, and to serve and tend this vile cottage so much the viler, by how much that which ministers unto it doth excel, the one being a rational substance and a spirit, 
the other nothing but earth and blood. For spend not the remnant of thy days in thoughts and fancies concerning other men, when it is not in relation to some common good, when by it thou art hindered from some other better work. That is, spend not thy time in thinking what such a man doth, and to what end, what he saith, and what he thinks, and what he is about, and such other things or curiosities, which make a man to rove and wander from the care and observation of that part of himself which is rational and overruling. See therefore in the whole series and connection of thy thoughts that thou be careful to prevent whatsoever is idle and impertinent, but especially whatsoever is curious and malicious, and thou must use thyself to think only of such things, of which if a man upon a sudden should ask thee what it is that thou art now thinking, thou mayest answer this and that freely and boldly, that so by thy thoughts it may presently appear that in all thee is sincere and peaceable, as becometh one that is made for society, and regards not pleasures, nor gives way to any voluptuous imaginations at all, free from all contentiousness, envy, and suspicion, and from whatsoever else thou wouldest blush to confess thy thoughts were set upon. He that is such, is he surely that doth not put off to lay hold on that which is best indeed, a very priest and minister of the gods, well acquainted and in good correspondence with him, especially that is seated and placed within himself, as in a temple and sacrary, to whom also he keeps and preserves himself unspotted by pleasure, undaunted by pain, free from any manner of wrong, or contumely, by himself offered unto himself, not capable of any evil from others, a wrestler of the best sort, and for the highest prize, that he may not be cast down by any passion or affection of his own, deeply dyed and drenched in righteousness, embracing and accepting with his whole heart whatsoever either happeneth or is allotted unto him. One who not often, nor without some great necessity tending to some public good, mindeth what any other either speaks or doth or purposeth, for those things only that are in his own power or that are truly his own are the objects of his employments, and his thoughts are ever taken up with those things, which of the whole universe are by the fates or providence destinated and appropriated unto himself, those things that are his own, and in his own power he himself takes order, for that they be good. And as for those that happen unto him, he believes them to be so. For that lot and portion which is assigned to every one, as it is unavoidable and necessary, so is it always profitable. He remembers besides that whatsoever partakes of reason is akin unto him, and that to care for all men generally is agreeing to the nature of a man. But as for honor and praise, that they ought not generally to be admitted and accepted of from all, but from such only, who live according to nature. As for them that do not, what manner of men they be at home or abroad, day or night, how condition themselves with what manner of conditions, or with men of what conditions they moil and pass away the time together, he knoweth and remembers right well. He therefore regards not such praise and approbation as proceeding from them who cannot like and approve themselves. 5. Do nothing against thy will, nor contrary to the community, nor without due examination, nor with reluctancy, Affect not to set out thy thoughts with curious neat language. Be neither a great talker nor a great undertaker. Moreover, let thy God that is in thee to rule over thee find by thee that he hath to do with a man, an aged man, a sociable man, a Roman, a prince, one that hath ordered his life, as one that expecteth, as it were, nothing but the sound of the trumpet sounding a retreat to depart out of this life with all expedition, one who for his word or actions neither needs an oath nor any man to be a witness. 6. To be cheerful and to stand in no need, either of other men's help or attendance, or of that rest and tranquility which thou must be beholding to others for. Rather like one that is straight of himself, or hath ever been straight, 
than one that hath been rectified. 7. If thou shalt find anything in this mortal life better than righteousness, than truth, temperance, fortitude, and in general better than a mind contented both with those things which according to right and reason she doth, and in those which without her will and knowledge happen unto thee by the providence, if I say, thou canst find out anything better than this, haply the self unto it with thy whole heart, and that which is best wheresoever thou dost find it, enjoy freely. But if nothing thou shalt find worthy to be preferred to that spirit which is within thee, if nothing better than to subject unto thee thine own lusts and desires, and not to give way to any fancies or imaginations before thou hast duly considered of them, nothing better than to withdraw thyself, to use Socrates his words, from all sensuality, and submit thyself unto the gods, and to have care of all men in general, if thou shalt find that all other things in comparison of this are but vile and of little moment, then give not way to any other thing, which being once though but affected and inclined unto, it will no more be in thy power without all distraction as thou oughtest to prefer and to pursue after that good which is thine own and thy proper good. For it is not lawful that anything that is of another and inferior kind and nature, be it what it will, as either popular applause or honor or riches or pleasures, should be suffered to confront and contest, as it were, with that which is rational and operatively good. For all these things, if once though but for a while, they begin to please, they presently prevail, and pervert a man's mind, or turn a man from the right way. Do thou, therefore, I say, absolutely and freely make choice of that which is best, and stick unto it. Now that they say is best, which is most profitable, if they mean profitable to man as he is a rational man, stand thou to it and maintain it. But if they mean profitable, as he is a creature, only reject it. And from this thy tent and conclusion keep off carefully all plausible shows and colors of external appearance, that thou mayest be able to discern things rightly. 8. Never esteem of anything as profitable, which shall ever constrain thee either to break thy faith or to lose thy modesty, to hate any man, to suspect, to curse, to dissemble, to lust after anything that requireth the secret of walls or veils. But he that preferreth before all things his rational part and spirit, and the sacred mysteries of virtue which issueth from it, he shall never lament and exclaim, never sigh. He shall never want either solitude or company, and which is chiefest of all, he shall live without either desire or fear. And as for life, whether for a long or short time he shall enjoy his soul thus compassed about with a body, he is altogether indifferent. For if even now he were to depart, he is as ready for it as for any other action which may be performed with modesty and decency. For all his life long, this is his only care, that his mind may always be occupied in such intentions and objects as are proper to a rational, sociable creature. 9. In the mind that is once truly disciplined and purged, thou canst not find anything either foul or impure, or as it were fested, nothing that is either servile or affected, no partial tie, no malicious averseness, nothing obnoxious, nothing concealed. The life of such an one, death can never surprise as imperfect, as of an actor that should die before he had ended, or the play itself were at an end, a man might speak. 10. Use thine opinative faculty with all honor and respect, for in her indeed is all, that thy opinion do not beget in thy understanding anything contrary to either nature or the proper constitution of a rational creature. The end and object of a rational constitution is to do nothing rashly, to be kindly affected towards men, and in all things willingly to submit unto the gods. Casting therefore all other things aside, keep thyself to these few, and remember withal that no man properly can be said to live more than that which is now present, which is but a moment of time. Whatsoever is besides either is already past 
or uncertain. The time, therefore, that any man doth live is but a little, and the place where he liveth is but a very little corner of the earth, and the greatest fame that can remain of a man after his death, even that is but little, and that too, such as it is whilst it is, is by the succession of silly mortal men preserved, who likewise shall shortly die, and even whilst they live know not what in very deed they themselves are, and much less can know one who long before is dead and gone. 11. To these ever-present helps and mementos let one more be added, ever to make a particular description and delineation as it were of every object that presents itself to thy mind, that thou mayest wholly and throughly contemplate it in its own proper nature, bare and naked, wholly and severally, divided into its several parts and quarters, and then by thyself in thy mind, to call both it and those things of which it doth consist, and in which it shall be resolved by their own proper true names and appellations. For there is nothing so effectual to beget true magnanimity as to be able truly and methodically to examine and consider all things that happen in this life, and so to penetrate into their natures, that at the same time, this also may concur in our apprehensions. What is the true use of it? And what is the true nature of this universe to which it is useful? How much in regard of the universe may it be esteemed? How much in regard of man, a citizen of the supreme city, of which all other cities in the world are as it were but houses and families? 12. What is this that now my fancy is set upon? Of what things doth it consist? How long can it last? Which of all the virtues is the proper virtue for this present use? As whether meekness, fortitude, truth, faith, sincerity, contentation, or any of the rest. Of everything, therefore, thou must use thyself to say, This immediately comes from God. This by that fatal connection and concatenation of things. Or, which almost comes to one, by some coincidental casualty. And as for this, it proceeds from my neighbor, my kinsman, my fellow, through his ignorance indeed, because he knows not what is truly natural unto him, but I know it, and therefore carry myself towards him according to the natural law of fellowship, that is kindly and justly. As for those things that of themselves are altogether indifferent, as in my best judgment I conceive everything to deserve more or less, so I carry myself towards it. 13. If thou shalt intend that which is present, following the rule of right and reason carefully, solidly, meekly, and shalt not intermix any other businesses, but shall study this only to preserve thy spirit unpolluted and pure, and shall cleave unto him without either hope or fear of anything, in all things that thou shalt either do or speak, contenting thyself with heroical truth, thou shalt live happily, and from this there is no man that can hinder thee. 14. As physicians and chirurgeons have always their instruments ready at hand for all sudden cures, so have thou always thy dogmata in a readiness for the knowledge of things, both divine and human. And whatsoever thou dost, even in the smallest things that thou dost, thou must ever remember that mutual relation and connection that is between these two things divine and things human. For without relation unto God, thou shalt never speed in any worldly actions, nor on the other side in any divine, without some respect had to things human. 15. Be not deceived, for thou shalt never live to read thy moral commentaries, nor the acts of the famous Romans and Grecians, nor those excerpta from several books, all which thou hadst provided and laid up for thyself against thine old age. Hasten, therefore, to an end, and giving over all vain hopes, help thyself in time if thou carest for thyself, as thou oughtest to do. 16. To steal, to sow, to buy, to be at rest, to see what is to be done, which is not seen by the eyes, but by another kind of sight, 
What these words mean and how many ways to be understood they do not understand. The body, the soul, the understanding. As the senses naturally belong to the body, and the desires and affections to the soul, so do the dogmata to the understanding. 17. To be capable of fancies and imaginations is common to man and beast. To be violently drawn and moved by the lusts and desires of the soul is proper to wild beasts and monsters, such as Phalaris and Nero were. To follow reason for ordinary duties and actions is common to them also, who believe not that there be any gods, and for their advantage would make no conscience to betray their own country, and who, when once the doors be shut upon them, dare do anything. If therefore all things else be common to these likewise it follows, that for a man to like and embrace all things that happen and are destinated unto him, and not to trouble and molest that spirit which is seated in the temple of his own breast, with a multitude of vain fancies and imaginations, but to keep him propitious and to obey him as a god, never either speaking anything contrary to truth or doing anything contrary to justice, is the only true property of a good man. And such a one, though no man should believe that he liveth as he doth, either sincerely and conscionably, or cheerful and contentedly. Yet is he, neither with any man at all angry for it, nor diverted by it from the way that leadeth to the end of his life, through which a man must pass pure, ever ready to depart, and willing of himself without any compulsion to fit and accommodate himself to his proper lot and portion. The Fourth Book, One. That inward mistress part of man, if it be in its own true natural temper, is towards all worldly chances and events ever so disposed and affected, that it will easily turn and apply itself to that which may be and is within its own power to compass when that cannot be which at first it intended for it never doth absolutely addict and apply itself to any one object but whatsoever it is that it doth now intend and prosecute it doth prosecute it with exception and reservation so that whatsoever it is that falls out contrary to its first intentions even that afterwards it makes its proper object even as the fire when it prevails upon those things that are in his way, by which things indeed a little fire would have been quenched, but a great fire doth soon turn to its own nature, and so consume whatsoever comes in his way, yea, by those very things it is made greater and greater. 2. Let nothing be done rashly, and at random but all things according to the most exact and perfect rules of art. 3. They seek for themselves private retiring places, as country villages, the seashore, mountains. Yea, thou thyself art wont to long much after such places. But all this, thou must know, proceeds from simplicity in the highest degree. At what time soever thou wilt, it is in thy power to retire into thyself, and to be at rest, and free from all businesses. A man cannot any whither retire better than to his own soul. He especially, who is beforehand provided of such things within, which whensoever he doth withdraw himself to look in, may presently afford unto him perfect ease and tranquility. By tranquility I understand a decent orderly disposition and carriage, free from all confusion and tumultuousness. Afford then thyself this retiring continually, and thereby refresh and renew thyself. Let these precepts be brief and fundamental, which as soon as thou dost call them to mind, may suffice thee to purge thy soul throughly, and to send thee away well pleased with those things whatsoever they be, which now again after this short withdrawing of thy soul into herself, thou dost return unto. For what is it that thou art offended at? Can it be at the wickedness of men when thou dost call to mind this conclusion, that all reasonable creatures are made one for another, and that it is part of justice to bear with them, and that it is against their wills that they offend. And how many already, who once likewise prosecuted their enmities, suspected, hated, and fiercely contended, are now long ago stretched out and reduced unto ashes. It is time for thee to make an end. 
As for those things which among the common chances of the world happen unto thee as thy particular lot and portion, canst thou be displeased with any of them? When thou dost call that our ordinary dilemma to mind, either a providence or Democritus, his atoms, and with it whatsoever we brought to prove that the whole world is as it were one city. And as for thy body, what canst thou fear if thou dost consider that thy mind and understanding, when once it hath recollected itself and knows its own power, hath in this life and breath, whether it runs smoothly and gently, or whether harshly and rudely, no interest at all, but is altogether indifferent, and whatsoever else thou hast heard and assented unto concerning either pain or pleasure, but the care of thine honor and reputation will perchance distract thee. How can that be if thou dost look back and consider both how quickly all things that are are forgotten, and what an immense chaos of eternity was before and will follow after all things, and the vanity of praise, and the inconstancy and variableness of human judgments and opinions, and the narrowness of the place, wherein it is limited and circumscribed. For the whole earth is but as one point, and of it, this inhabited part of it, is but a very little part. And of this part, how many in number, and what manner of men are they, that will commend thee? What remains then, but that thou often put in practice this kind of retiring of thyself, to this little part of thyself, and above all things, keep thyself from distraction, and intend not anything vehemently, but be free and consider all things, as a man whose proper object is virtue, as a man whose true nature is to be kind and sociable, as a citizen, as a mortal creature. Among other things, which to consider and look into thou must use to withdraw thyself, let those two be among the most obvious and at hand. One, that the things or objects themselves reach not unto the soul, but stand without still and quiet, and that it is from the opinion only which is within, that all the tumult and all the trouble doth proceed. The next, that all these things, which now thou seest, shall within a very little while be changed and be no more, and ever call to mind how many changes and alterations in the world thou thyself hast already been an eyewitness of in thy time. This world is mere change, and this life, opinion. For, if to understand and to be reasonable be common unto all men, then is that reason, for which we are termed reasonable, common unto all. If reason is general, then is that reason also, which prescribeth what is to be done, and what not, common unto all. If that, then law. If law, then are we fellow citizens. If so, then are we partners in some one commonweal. If so, then the world is as it were a city. For which other commonweal is it, that all men can be said to be members of? From this common city it is, that understanding, reason, and law is derived unto us, for from whence else? For as that which in me is earthly I have from some common earth, and that which is moist from some other element is imparted, as my breath and life hath its proper fountain, and that likewise which is dry and fiery in me, for there is nothing which doth not proceed from something, as also there is nothing that can be reduced unto mere nothing. So also is there some common beginning from whence my understanding hath proceeded. 5. As generation is, so also death, a secret of nature's wisdom, a mixture of elements resolved into the same elements again, a thing surely which no man ought to be ashamed of, in a series of other fatal events and consequences which a rational creature is subject unto, not improper or incongruous, nor contrary to the natural and proper constitution of man himself. 6. Such and such things from such and such causes must of necessity proceed. He that would not have such things to happen is as he that would have the fig tree grow without any sap or moisture. In sum, remember this, that within a very little while, both thou and he shall both be dead, 
and after a little while more, not so much as your names and memories shall be remaining. 7. Let opinion be taken away, and no man will think himself wronged. If no man shall think himself wronged, then is there no more any such thing as wrong. That which makes not man himself the worse cannot make his life the worse, neither can it hurt him either inwardly or outwardly. It was expedient in nature that it should be so, and therefore necessary. 8. Whatsoever doth happen in the world doth happen justly, and so if thou dost well take heed thou shalt find it. I say not only in right order by a series of inevitable consequences, but according to justice, and as it were by way of equal distribution, according to the true worth of everything. Continue then to take notice of it, as thou hast begun, and whatsoever thou dost, do it not without this proviso, that it be a thing of that nature that a good man, as the word good is properly taken, may do it. This observe carefully in every action. 9. Conceit no such things as he that wrongeth thee conceiveth, or would have thee to conceive, but look into the matter itself, and see what it is in very truth. 10. These two rules thou must have always in a readiness. First, do nothing at all, but what reason proceeding from that regal and supreme part shall for the good and benefit of men suggest unto thee. And secondly, if any man that is present shall be able to rectify thee or to turn thee from some erroneous persuasion, that thou be always ready to change thy mind, and this change to proceed, not from any respect of any pleasure or credit thereon depending, but always from some probable apparent ground of justice, or of some public good thereby to be further read, or from some other such inducement. 11. Hast thou reason? I have. Why then makest thou not use of it? For if thy reason do her part, what more canst thou require? 12. As a part hitherto thou hast had a particular subsistence, and now shalt thou vanish away into the common substance of him who first begot thee, or rather thou shalt be resumed again into that original rational substance out of which all others have issued and are propagated. Many small pieces of frankincense are set upon the same altar. One drops first and is consumed, another after, and it comes all to one. 13. Within ten days, if so happen, thou shalt be esteemed a god of them, who now, if thou shalt return to the dogmata and to the honoring of reason, will esteem of thee no better than of a mere brute and of an ape. 14. Not as though thou hadst thousands of years to live. Death hangs over thee, whilst yet thou livest, whilst thou mayest be good. 15. Now much time and leisure doth he gain, who is not curious to know what his neighbor hath said, or hath done, or hath attempted, but only what he doth himself, that it may be just and holy. Or to express it in Agathos's words, not to look about upon the evil conditions of others, but to run on straight in the line, without any loose and extravagant agitation. 16. He who is greedy of credit and reputation after his death doth not consider that they themselves by whom he is remembered shall soon after every one of them be dead, and they likewise that succeed those, until at last all memory, which hitherto by the succession of men admiring and soon after dying hath had its course, be quite extinct. But suppose that both they that shall remember thee and thy memory with them should be immortal, what is that to thee? I will not say to thee after thou art dead, but even to thee living, what is thy praise? But only for a secret and politic consideration which we call economian or dispensation. For as for that, that it is the gift of nature, whatsoever is commended in thee, what might be objected from thence, let that now that we are upon another consideration be omitted as unseasonable, that which is fair and goodly, whatsoever it be, and in what respect soever it be, that it is fair and goodly, it is so of itself and terminates in itself, not admitting praise as a part or member, that therefore which is praised is not thereby made either better or worse. This I understand even of those things, 
that are commonly called fair and good, as those which are commended either for the matter itself or for curious workmanship. As for that which is truly good, what can it stand in need of more than either justice or truth, or more than either kindness and modesty? Which of all those either becomes good or fair, because commended or dispraised suffers any damage? Doth the emerald become worse in itself, or more vile if it be not commended? Doth gold or ivory or purple? Is there anything that doth though never so common as a knife, a flower, or a tree? 17. If so be that the souls remain after death, say they that will not believe it, how is the air from all eternity able to contain them? How is the earth, say I, ever from that time able to contain the bodies of them that are buried? For as here the change and resolution of dead bodies into another kind of subsistence, whatsoever it be, makes place for other dead bodies. So the souls after death transferred into the air, after they have conversed there a while, are either by way of transmutation or transfusion or conflagration, received again into that original rational substance from which all others do proceed and so give way to those souls who before coupled and associated unto bodies now begin to subsist single. This upon a supposition that the souls after death do for a while subsist single may be answered. And here, besides the number of bodies so buried and contained by the earth, we may further consider the number of several beasts eaten by us men and by other creatures. For notwithstanding that such a multitude of them is daily consumed, and as it were buried in the bodies of the eaters, yet is the same place and body able to contain them by reason of their conversion, partly into blood, partly into air and fire. What in these things is the speculation of truth? To divide things into that which is passive and material, and that which is active and formal. 18. Not to wander out of the way, but upon every motion and desire, to perform that which is just, and ever to be careful to attain to the true natural apprehension of every fancy that presents itself. 19. Whatsoever is expedient unto thee, O world, is expedient unto me. Nothing can either be unseasonable unto me, or out of date, which unto thee is seasonable. Whatsoever thy seasons bear, shall ever by me be esteemed as happy fruit and increase. O nature, from thee are all things, in thee all things subsist, and to thee all tend. Could he say of Athens, thou lovely city of sea crops, and shalt not thou say of the world, thou lovely city of God? 20. They will say commonly, meddle not with many things, if thou wilt live cheerfully. Certainly there is nothing better than for a man to confine himself to necessary actions, to such and so many only, as reason in a creature that knows itself born for society, will command and enjoin. This will not only procure that cheerfulness, which from the goodness, but that also, which from the paucity of actions, doth usually proceed. For since it is so, that most of those things, which we either speak or do, are unnecessary. If a man shall cut them off, it must needs follow that he shall thereby gain much leisure and save much trouble, and therefore at every action a man must privately by way of admonition suggest unto himself what. May not this that now I go about be of the number of unnecessary actions? Neither must he use himself to cut off actions only, but thoughts and imaginations also, that are unnecessary, for so will unnecessary consequent actions, the better be prevented and cut off. 21. Try also how a good man's life, of one who is well pleased with those things whatsoever, which among the common changes and chances of this world fall to his own lot and share, and can live well contented and fully satisfied in the justice of his own proper present action and in the goodness of his disposition for the future, will agree with thee. Thou hast had experience of that other kind of life, 
make now trial of this also. Trouble not thyself any more henceforth. Reduce thyself unto perfect simplicity. Doth any man offend? It is against himself that he doth offend. Why should it trouble thee? Hath anything happened unto thee? It is well, whatsoever it be. It is that which of all the common chances of the world from the very beginning in the series of all other things that have or shall happen was destinated and appointed unto thee. To comprehend all in a few words, our life is short. We must endeavor to gain the present time with best discretion and justice. Use recreation with sobriety. 22. Either this world is a cosmos or comely peace, because all disposed and governed by certain order, or if it be a mixture, though confused, yet still it is a comely peace. For is it possible that in thee there should be any beauty at all, and that in the whole world there should be nothing but disorder and confusion, and all things in it too, by natural different properties, one from another, different and distinguished, and yet all through diffused, and by natural sympathy, one to another united as they are. 23. A black or malign disposition, an effeminate disposition, an hard, inexorable disposition, a wild, inhuman disposition, a sheepish disposition, a childish disposition, a blockish, a false, a scurril, a fraudulent, a tyrannical, what then? If he be a stranger in the world, that knows not the things that are in it, why not be a stranger as well, that wonders at the things that are done in it? 24. He is a true fugitive, that flies from reason, by which men are sociable. He blind, who cannot see with the eyes of his understanding. He poor, that stands in need of another, and hath not in himself all things needful for this life. He in aposteem of the world, who by being discontented with those things that happen unto him in the world, doth, as it were, apostatize and separate himself from common nature's rational administration. For the same nature it is that brings this unto thee, whatsoever it be, that first brought thee into the world. He raises sedition in the city, who by irrational actions withdraws his own soul from that one and common soul of all rational creatures. 25. There is who without so much as a coat, and there is who without so much as a book, doth put philosophy in practice. I am half naked, neither have I bread to eat, and yet I depart not from reason, saith one. But I say, I want the food of good teaching and instructions, and yet I depart not from reason. 26. What art and profession soever thou hast learned, endeavor to effect it, and comfort thyself in it, and pass the remainder of thy life as one who from his whole heart commits himself, and whatsoever belongs unto him, unto the gods. And as for men, carry not thyself either tyrannically or servilely towards any. 27. Consider in my mind, for example's sake, the times of Vespasian. Thou shalt see but the same things some marrying, some bringing up children, some sick, some dying, some fighting, some feasting, some merchandising, some tilling, some flattering, some boasting, some suspecting, some undermining, some wishing to die, some fretting and murmuring at their present estate, some wooing, some hoarding, some seeking after magistracies, and some after kingdoms. And is not that their age quite over and ended Again, consider now the times of Trajan. There, likewise, thou seest the very selfsame things, and that age also is now over and ended. In the like manner, consider other periods, both of times and of whole nations, and see how many men, after they had with all their might and main intended and prosecuted some unworldly thing or other, did soon after drop away, and were resolved into the elements. But especially thou must call to mind them, whom thou thyself in thy lifetime hast known much distracted about vain things, and in the meantime neglecting to do that, and closely and inseparably, as fully satisfied with it, to adhere unto it, 
which their own proper constitution did require. And here thou must remember that thy carriage in every business must be according to the worth and due proportion of it. For so shalt thou not easily be tired out and vexed if thou shalt not dwell upon small matters longer than is fitting. 28. Those words which once were common and ordinary are now become obscure and obsolete. And so the names of men once commonly known and famous are now become in a manner obscure and obsolete names. Camillus, Cesso, Valesius, Leonatus. Not long after, Scipio, Cato, then Augustus, then Adrianus, then Antoninus Pius. All these in a short time will be out of date. And as things of another world, as it were, become fabulous. And this I say of them, who once shined as the wonders of their ages, for as for the rest, no sooner are they expired than with them all their fame and memory. And what is it then that shall always be remembered? All is vanity. What is it that we must bestow our care and diligence upon, even upon this only, that our minds and wills be just, that our actions be charitable, that our speech be never deceitful, or that our understanding be not subject to error, that our inclination be always set to embrace whatsoever shall happen unto us, as necessary, as usual, as ordinary, as flowing from such a beginning and such a fountain, from which both thou thyself and all things are, willingly therefore, and wholly surrender up thyself unto that fatal concatenation, yielding up thyself unto the fates to be disposed of at their pleasure. 29. Whatsoever is now present, and from day to day hath its existence, all objects of memories, and the minds and memories themselves incessantly consider, all things that are, have their being by change and alteration. Use thyself therefore often to meditate upon this, that the nature of the universe delights in nothing more than in altering those things that are, and in making others like unto them. So that we may say, that whatsoever is, is but as it were the seed of that which shall be. For if thou think that that only is seed which either the earth or the womb receiveth, thou art very simple. 30. Thou art now ready to die, and yet hast thou not attained to that perfect simplicity. Thou art yet subject to many troubles and perturbations, not yet free from all fear and suspicion of external accidents nor yet either so meekly disposed towards all men as thou shouldest, or so affected as one whose only study and only wisdom is to be just in all his actions. 31. Behold and observe what is the state of their rational part, and those that the world doth account wise. See what things they fly and are afraid of, and what things they hunt after. 32. In another man's mind and understanding thy evil cannot subsist, nor in any proper temper or distemper of the natural constitution of thy body, which is but as it were the coat or cottage of thy soul. Wherein then, but in that part of thee, wherein the conceit and apprehension of any misery can subsist, let not that part therefore admit any such conceit, and then all is well though thy body, which is so near it should either be cut or burnt, or suffer any corruption or putrefaction, yet let that part to which it belongs to, judge of these, be still, at rest. That is, let her judge this, that whatsoever it is that equally may happen to a wicked man and to a good man is neither good nor evil. For that which happens equally to him that lives according to nature and to him that doth not, is neither according to nature, nor against it, and by consequent, neither good nor bad. 33. Ever consider and think upon the world as being but one living substance, and having but one soul, and how all things in the world are terminated into one sensitive power, and are done by one general motion, as it were, and deliberation of that one soul, and how all things that are concur in the cause of one another's being, and by what manner of connection and concatenation all things happen. 34. What art thou that better and divine part accepted, but as Epictetus said, well, a wretched soul, appointed to carry a carcass up and down? 
35. To suffer change can be no hurt, as no benefit it is, by change to attain to being. The age and time of the world is as it were a flood and swift current, consisting of the things that are brought to pass in the world. For as soon as anything hath appeared, and is passed away, another succeeds, and that also will presently out of sight. 36. Whatsoever doth happen in the world is in the course of nature as usual and ordinary as a rose in the spring and fruit in summer. Of the same nature is sickness and death, slander and lying in wait, and whatsoever else ordinarily doth unto fools use to be occasion either of joy or sorrow, that, whatsoever it is, that comes after, doth always very naturally, and as it were familiarly, follow upon that which was before. For thou must consider the things of the world not as a loose independent number, consisting merely of necessary events, but as a discrete connection of things orderly and harmoniously disposed. There is then to be seen in the things of the world, not a bare succession, but an admirable correspondence and affinity. 37. Let that of Heraclitus never be out of thy mind, that the death of earth is water, and the death of water is air, and the death of air is fire, and so on the contrary. Remember him also who was ignorant whither the way did lead, and how that reason being the thing by which all things in the world are administered, and which men are continually and most inwardly conversant with, yet is the thing which ordinarily they are most in opposition with, and how those things which daily happen among them cease not daily to be strange unto them, and that we should not either speak or do anything as men in their sleep by opinion and bare imagination. For then we think we speak and do, and that we must not be as children who follow their father's example, for best reason alleging their bare cathodi parilofamen, or as by successive tradition from our forefathers we have received it. 38. Even as if any of the gods should tell thee, Thou shalt certainly die tomorrow or next day, thou wouldst not, except thou wert extremely base and pusillanimous. Take it for a great benefit, rather to die the next day after than tomorrow, for alas, what is the difference? So, for the same reason, think it no great matter to die rather many years after than the very next day. 39. Let it be thy perpetual meditation, how many physicians who once looked so grim and so theatrically shrunk their brows upon their patients are dead and gone themselves. How many astrologers, after that, in great ostentation, they had foretold the death of some others. How many philosophers, after so many elaborate tracts and volumes concerning either mortality or immortality. How many brave captains and commanders, after the death and slaughter of so many, how many kings and tyrants, after they had with such horror and insolency abused their power upon men's lives, as though themselves had been immortal, how many, that I may so speak, whole cities, both men and towns, Helice, Pompeii, Herculaneum, and others innumerable are dead and gone, run them over also, whom thou thyself, one after another, hast known in thy time to drop away. Such and such a one took care of such and such a one's burial, and soon after was buried himself. So one, so another, and all things in a short time. For herein lieth all indeed, ever to look upon all worldly things, as things for their continuance, that are but for a day, and for their worth, most vile and contemptible. As for example, what is man? that which but the other day when he was conceived was vile snivel, and within few days shall be either an embalmed carcass or mere ashes. Thus must thou, according to truth in nature, truly consider how man's life is but for a very moment of time, and so depart meek and contented, even as if a ripe olive falling should praise the ground that bare her and give thanks to the tree that begat her. 40. Thou must be like a promontory of the sea, against which, though the waves beat continually, yet it both itself stands, and about it are those swelling waves stilled and quieted. 41. 
O oh, wretched I to whom this mischance is happened! Nay, happy I to whom this thing being happened I can continue without grief, neither wounded by that which is present, nor in fear of that which is to come. For as for this, it might have happened unto any man, but any man having such a thing befallen him could not have continued without grief. Why then should that rather be an unhappiness than this a happiness? But however, canst thou, O man, term that unhappiness which is no mischance to the nature of man? I canst thou think that a mischance to the nature of man which is not contrary to the end and will of his nature? What then hast thou learned is the will of man's nature? Doth that then which hath happened unto thee hinder thee from being just, or magnanimous, or temperate, or wise, or circumspect, or true, or modest, or free, or from anything else of all those things in the present enjoying in possession, whereof the nature of man, as then enjoying all that is proper unto her, is fully satisfied? Now to conclude, upon all occasion of sorrow remember henceforth to make use of this dogma, that whatsoever it is that hath happened unto thee is in very deed no such thing of itself as a misfortune, but that to bear it generously is certainly great happiness. 42. It is but an ordinary coarse one, yet it is a good effectual remedy against the fear of death for a man to consider in his mind the examples of such who greedily and covetously, as it were, did for a long time enjoy their lives. What have they got more than they whose deaths have been untimely? Are not they themselves dead at the last, as Cadiciants, Fabius, Julianus, Lepidus, or any other who in their lifetime, having buried many, were at the last buried themselves? The whole space of any man's life is but little, and as little as it is, with what troubles, with what manner of dispositions, and in the society of how wretched a body must it be passed? Let it be therefore unto thee altogether as a matter of indifferency. For if thou shalt look backward, behold what an infinite chaos of time doth present itself unto thee, and as infinite a chaos if thou shalt look forward. In that which is so infinite, what difference can there be between that which liveth but three days and that which liveth three ages? 43. Let thy course ever be the most compendious way. The most compendious is that which is according to nature, that is in all both words and deeds, ever to follow that which is most sound and perfect. For such a resolution will free a man from all trouble, strife, dissembling, and ostentation. The Fifth Book, One. In the morning when thou findest thyself unwilling to rise, consider with thyself presently, it is to go about a man's work that I am stirred up. Am I then yet unwilling to go about that, for which I myself was born and brought forth into this world? Or was I made for this, to lay me down, and make much of myself in a warm bed? Oh, but this is pleasing. And was it then for this, that thou wert born, that thou mightest enjoy pleasure? Was it not in very truth for this, that thou mightest always be busy and in action. Seest thou not how all things in the world besides, how every treamed plant, how sparrows and ants, spiders and bees, how all in their kind are intent, as it were, orderly to perform whatsoever, towards the preservation of this orderly universe, naturally doth become and belong unto thin? And wilt not thou do that which belongs unto a man to do, Wilt not thou run to do that which thy nature doth require? Well, but thou must have some rest. Yes, thou must. Nature hath of that also, as well as of eating and drinking, allowed thee a certain stint. But thou guessed beyond thy stint, and beyond that which would suffice, and in matter of action, there thou comest short of that which thou mayest. It must needs be, therefore, that thou dost not love thyself, for if thou didst, thou wouldst also love thy nature, and that which thy nature doth propose unto herself as her end. Others, as many as take pleasure in their trade and profession, can even pine themselves at their works, 
and neglect their bodies and their food for it? And dost thou less honor thy nature than an ordinary mechanic his trade, or a good dancer his art, than a covetous man his silver, and vainglorious man applause? These to whatsoever they take an affection can be content to want their meat and sleep, to further that every one which he affects, and shall actions tending to the common good of human society seem more vile unto thee, or worthy of less respect and intention? Two, how easy a thing is it for a man to put off from him all turbulent adventitious imaginations, and presently to be in perfect rest and tranquility? And three, think thyself fit and worthy to speak, or to do anything that is according to nature, and let not the reproach or report of some that may ensue upon it ever deter thee. If it be right and honest to be spoken or done, undervalue not thyself so much as to be discouraged from it. As for them, they have their own rational overruling part, and their own proper inclination, which thou must not stand and look about to take notice of, but go on straight, whither both thine own particular and the common nature do lead thee, and the way of both these is but one. For I continue my course by actions according to nature until I fall and cease, breathing out my last breath into that air by which continually breathed in I did live, and falling upon that earth out of whose gifts and fruits my father gathered his seed, my mother her blood, and my nurse her milk, out of which for so many years I have been provided, both of meat and drink. And lastly, which beareth me that tread upon it, and beareth with me that so many ways do abuse it, or so freely make use of it, so many ways to so many ends. 5. No man can admire thee for thy sharp, acute language, such is thy natural disability that way. Be it so, yet there be many other good things, for the want of which thou canst not plead the want or natural ability. Let them be seen in thee which depend wholly from thee, sincerity, gravity, laboriousness, contempt of pleasures. Be not querulous, be content with little, be kind, be free. Avoid all superfluity, all vain prattling, be magnanimous. Dost not thou perceive how many things there be, which notwithstanding any pretense of natural indisposition and unfitness, thou mightest have performed and exhibited, and yet still thou doest voluntarily continue drooping downwards? Or wilt thou say that it is through defect of thy natural constitution, that thou art constrained to murmur, to be base and wretched to flatter, now to accuse and now to please and pacify thy body, to be vainglorious, to be so giddy-headed, and unsettled in thy thoughts. Nay, witnesses be the gods, of all these thou mightest have been rid long ago, only this thou must have been contented with, to have borne the blame of one that is somewhat slow and dull, wherein thou must so exercise thyself, as one who neither doth much take to heart, this is natural defect, nor yet pleaseth himself in it. 6. Such there be who, when they have done a good turn to any, are ready to set them on the score for it, and to require retaliation. Others there be, who, though they stand not upon retaliation to require any, yet they think with themselves nevertheless, that such a one is their debtor, and they know as their word is what they have done. Others again there be, who, when they have done any such thing, do not so much as know what they have done, but are like unto the vine, which beareth her grapes, and when once she hath borne her own proper fruit, is contented and seeks for no further recompense. As a horse after a race, and a hunting dog, when he hath hunted, and a bee when she hath made her honey, look not for applause and commendation. So neither doth that man that rightly doth understand his own nature, when he hath done a good turn, but from one doth proceed to do another, even as the vine after she hath once borne fruit in her own proper season, is ready for another time. Thou therefore must be one of them, who what they do, barely do it without any further thought. 
and are in a manner insensible of what they do. Nay, but, will some reply perchance, this very thing a rational man is bound unto, to understand what it is that he doeth. For it is the property, say they, of one that is naturally sociable, to be sensible that he doth operate sociably, nay, and to desire that the party himself that is sociably dealt with should be sensible of it too. I answer, that which thou sayest is true indeed, but the true meaning of that which is said thou dost not understand, and therefore art thou one of those first whom I mentioned, for they also are led by a probable appearance of reason. But if thou dost desire to understand truly what it is that is said, fear not that thou shalt therefore give over any sociable action. 7. The form of the Athenians' prayer did run thus. O rain, rain, good Jupiter, upon all the grounds and fields that belong to the Athenians. Either we should not pray at all, or thus absolutely and freely, and not every one for himself in particular alone. And 8. As we say commonly, the physician hath prescribed unto this man riding, unto another cold baths, unto a third to go barefoot. So it is alike to say, the nature of the universe hath prescribed unto this man sickness, or blindness, or some loss, or damage, or some such thing. For as there, when we say of a physician, that he hath prescribed anything, our meaning is, that he hath appointed this for that, as subordinate and conducing to health. So here, whatsoever doth happen unto any, is ordained unto him as a thing, subordinate unto the fates, and therefore do we say of such things, that they do simvenin, that is, happen or fall together. As of square stones, when either in walls or pyramids in a certain position they fit one another, and agree, as it were, in an harmony, the masons say, that they do simvenin, as if thou shouldest say, fall together, so that in the general, though the things be diverse that make it, yet the consent or harmony itself is but one, and as the whole world is made up of all the particular bodies of the world, one perfect and complete body, of the same nature that particular bodies, so is the destiny of particular causes and events one general one, of the same nature that particular causes are. What I now say, even they that are mere idiots are not ignorant of. For they say commonly tuto efferenafto, that is, this his destiny hath brought upon him. This therefore is by the fates properly and particularly brought upon this, as that unto this in particular is by the physician prescribed. These therefore let us accept of in like manner as we do those that are prescribed unto us, our physicians. For them also in themselves shall we find to contain many harsh things, but we nevertheless, in hope of health and recovery, accept of them. Let the fulfilling and accomplishment of those things which the common nature hath determined be unto thee as thy health. Accept then, and be pleased with whatsoever doth happen, though otherwise harsh and unpleasing, as tending to that end, to the health and welfare of the universe, and to Jove's happiness and prosperity. For this whatsoever it be, should not have been produced, had it not conduced to the good of the universe. For neither doth any ordinary particular nature bring anything to pass, that is not to whatsoever is within the sphere of its own proper administration and government, agreeable and subordinate. For these two considerations, then, thou must be well pleased with anything that doth happen unto thee. First, because that for thee properly it was brought to pass, and unto thee it was prescribed, and that from the very beginning, by the series and connection of the first causes, it hath ever had a reference unto thee. And secondly, because the good success and perfect welfare and indeed the very continuance of him, that is, the administrator of the whole, doth in a manner depend on it. For the whole, because whole, therefore entire and perfect, is maimed and mutilated, 
if thou shalt cut off anything at all, whereby the coherence and contiguity, as of parts, so of causes, is maintained and preserved. Of which certain it is, that thou doest, as much as lieth in thee, cut off, and in some sort violently take somewhat away, as often as thou art displeased with anything that happeneth. 9. Be not discontented, be not disheartened, be not out of hope. If often it succeed not so well with thee punctually and precisely to do all things according to the right dogmata, but being once cast off, return unto them again. And as for those many and more frequent occurrences, either of worldly distractions or human infirmities, which as a man thou canst not but in some measure be subject unto, be not thou discontented with them. But however, love and affect that only, which thou dost return unto, a philosopher's life and proper occupation, after the most exact manner. And when thou dost return to thy philosophy, Return not unto it, as the manner of some is, after play and liberty, as it were, to their schoolmasters and pedagogues. But as they that have sore eyes to their sponge and egg, or as another to his cataplasm, or as others to their fomentations, so shalt not thou make it a matter of ostentation at all, to obey reason, but of ease and comfort. And remember that philosophy requireth nothing of thee, but what thy nature requireth, and wouldest thou thyself desire anything that is not according to nature? For which of these sayest thou, that which is according to nature or against it, is of itself more kind and pleasing? Is it not for that respect especially that pleasure itself is to so many men's hurt and overthrow, most prevalent, because esteemed commonly most kind and natural? But consider well whether magnanimity rather, and true liberty, and true simplicity, and equanimity, and holiness, whether these be not most kind and natural, and prudency itself, what more kind and amiable than it, when thou shalt truly consider with thyself what it is through all the proper objects of thy rational intellectual faculty currently to go on without any fall or stumble. As for the things of the world, their true nature is in a manner so involved with obscurity that unto many philosophers, and those no mean ones, they seemed altogether incomprehensible, and the Stoics themselves, though they judged them not altogether incomprehensible, yet scarce and not without much difficulty comprehensible, so that all assent of ours is fallible, for who is he that is infallible in his conclusions? From the nature of things, pass now unto their subjects and matter. How temporary, how vile are they. I such as may be in the power and possession of some abominable loose liver, of some common strumpet, of some notorious oppressor and extortioner. Pass from thence to the dispositions of them that thou doest ordinarily converse with. How hardly do we bear even with the most loving and amiable that I may not say how hard it is for us to bear even with our own selves in such obscurity and impurity of things, in such and so continual a flux both of the substances and time, both of the motions themselves and things moved, what it is that we can fasten upon, either to honor and respect especially, or seriously and studiously to seek after, I cannot so much as conceive, for indeed they are things contrary. Ten. Thou must comfort thyself in the expectation of thy natural dissolution, and in the meantime not grieve at the delay, but rest contented in those two things. First, that nothing shall happen unto thee, which is not according to the nature of the universe. Secondly, that it is in thy power to do nothing against thine own proper God and inward spirit. For it is not in any man's power to constrain thee to transgress against him. 11. What is the use that now at this present I make of my soul? Thus from time to time and upon all occasions thou must put this question to thyself. What is now that part of mine which they call the rational mistress part employed about? Whose soul do I now properly possess? A child's or a youth's? A woman's or a tyrant's? 
some brute or some wild beast soul. Twelve. What those things are in themselves which by the greatest part are esteemed good, thou mayest gather even from this. For if a man shall hear things mentioned as good, which are really good indeed, such as our prudence, temperance, justice, fortitude, after so much heard and conceived, he cannot endure to hear of any more. For the word good is properly spoken of them. But as for those which by the vulgar are esteemed good, if he shall hear them mentioned as good, he doth hearken for more. He is well contented to hear that what is spoken by the comedian is but familiarly and popularly spoken, so that even the vulgar apprehend the difference. For why is it else that this offends not and needs not to be excused, when virtues are styled good, but that which is spoken in commendation of wealth, pleasure, or honor, we entertain it only as merrily and pleasantly spoken? Proceed, therefore, and inquire further, whether it may not be that those things also, which being mentioned upon the stage were merrily and with great applause of the multitude, scoffed at with this jest, that they that possessed them had not in all the world of their own, such was their affluence and plenty, so much as a place where to avoid their excrements, whether, I say, those ought not also in very deed to be much respected and esteemed of, as the only things that are truly good. 13. All that I consist of is either form or matter. No corruption can reduce either of these unto nothing for neither did I of nothing become a subsistent creature. Every part of mine then will by mutation be disposed into a certain part of the whole world, and that in time into another part, and so, in infinitum, by which kind of mutation I also became what I am, and so did they that begot me, and they before them, and so upwards, in infinitum. For so we may be allowed to speak, though the age and government of the world be to some certain periods of time limited and confined. 14. Reason and rational power are faculties which content themselves with themselves and their own proper operations. And as for their first inclination and motion that they take from themselves, but their progress is right to the end and object, which is in their way, as it were, and lieth just before them, that is, which is feasible and possible, whether it be that which at the first they propose to themselves or no, for which reason also such actions are termed catathoses, to intimate the directness of the way by which they are achieved. Nothing must be thought to belong to a man which doth not belong unto him as he is a man. These, the event of purposes, are not things required in a man the nature of man doth not profess any such things. The final ends and consummations of actions are nothing at all to a man's nature. The end, therefore, of a man, or the summum bonum whereby that end is fulfilled, cannot consist in the consummation of actions purposed and intended. Again, concerning these outward worldly things, were it so that any of them did properly belong unto man, then would it not belong unto man to condemn them and to stand in opposition with them. Neither would he be praiseworthy that can live without them, or he good, if these were good indeed, who of his own accord doth deprive himself of any of them. But we see contrariwise that the more a man doth withdraw himself from these wherein external pomp and greatness doth consist, or any other like these, or the better he doth bear with the loss of these, the better he is accounted. 15. Such as thy thoughts and ordinary cogitations are, such will thy mind be in time. For the soul doth as it were receive its tincture from the fancies and imaginations. Dye it therefore and thoroughly soak it with the assiduity of these cogitations. As for example, wheresoever thou mayst live, there it is in thy power to live well and happy. But thou mayst live at the court, there then also mayst thou live well and happy. Again, that which everything is made for, he is also made unto that, and cannot but naturally incline unto it. 
that which anything doth naturally incline unto, therein is his end. Wherein the end of everything doth consist, therein also doth his good and benefit consist. Society, therefore, is the proper good of a rational creature. For that we are made for society, it hath long since been demonstrated. Or can any man make any question of this? That whatsoever is naturally worse and inferior is ordinarily subordinated to that which is better, and that those things that are best are made one for another, and those things that have souls are better than those that have none, and of those that have, those best that have rational souls. 16. To desire things impossible is the part of a madman, but it is a thing impossible that wicked man should not commit some such things. Neither doth anything happen to any man, which in the ordinary course of nature as natural unto him doth not happen. Again, the same things happen unto others also. And truly, if either he that is ignorant that such a thing hath happened unto him, or he that is ambitious to be commended for his magnanimity can be patient and is not grieved, is it not a grievous thing that either ignorance or a vain desire to please and to be commended should be more powerful and effectual than true prudence? As for the things themselves, they touch not the soul, neither can they have any access unto it, neither can they of themselves any ways either affect it or move it. For she herself alone can affect and move herself, and according as the dogmata and opinions are, which she doth vouchsafe herself. So are those things which, as accessories, have any coexistence with her. 17. After one consideration, man is nearest unto us, as we are bound to do them good and to bear with them. But as he may oppose any of our true proper actions, so man is unto me but as a thing indifferent, even as the sun or the wind or some wild beast. By some of these it may be that some operation or other of mine may be hindered. However, of my mind and resolution itself, there can be no let or impediment by reason of that ordinary constant both exception or reservation wherewith it inclineth and ready conversion of objects from that which may not be to that which may be, which in the prosecution of its inclinations as occasion serves, it doth observe for by these the mind doth turn and convert any impediment whatsoever to be her aim and purpose, so that what before was the impediment is now the principal object of her working, and that which before was in her way is now her readiest way. 18. Honor that which is chiefest and most powerful in the world, and that is it which makes use of all things and governs all things. So also in thyself, Honor that which is chiefest and most powerful, and is of one kind and nature with that which we now spake of. For it is the very same which being in thee turneth all other things to its own use, and by whom also thy life is governed. 19. That which doth not hurt the city itself cannot hurt any citizen. This rule thou must remember to apply and make use of upon every conceit and apprehension of wrong. If the whole city be not hurt by this, neither am I certainly. And if the whole be not, why should I make it my private grievance? Consider rather what it is wherein he is overseen that is thought to have done the wrong. Again, often meditate how swiftly all things that subsist and all things that are done in the world are carried away, and as it were conveyed out of sight. For both the substance themselves we see as a flood are in a continual flux and all actions in a perpetual change, and the causes themselves subject to a thousand alterations. Neither is there anything almost that may ever be said to be now settled and constant. Next unto this, and which follows upon it, consider both the infiniteness of the time already past and the immense vastness of that which is to come, wherein all things are to be resolved and annihilated. Art not thou then a very fool who for these things art either puffed up with pride or distracted with cares or canst find in thy heart to make such moans 
as for a thing that would trouble thee for a very long time, consider the whole universe, whereof thou art but a very little part, and the whole age of the world together, whereof but a short and very momentary portion is allotted unto thee, and all the fates and destinies together, of which how much is it that comes to thy part and share? Again, another doth trespass against me. Let him look to that. He is master of his own disposition and of his own operation. I, for my part, am in the meantime in possession of as much as the common nature would have me to possess, and that which mine own nature would have me do, I do. 20. Let not that chief commanding part of thy soul be ever subject to any variation through any corporal, either pain or pleasure, neither suffer it to be mixed with these, but let it both circumscribe itself and confine those affections to their own proper parts and members. But if at any time they do reflect and rebound upon the mind and understanding, as in an united and compacted body it must needs, then must thou not go about to resist sense and feeling, it being natural. However, let not thy understanding to this natural sense and feeling, which whether unto our flesh pleasant or painful, is unto us nothing properly, add an opinion of either good or bad, and all is well. 21. To live with the gods. He liveth with the gods, who at all times affords unto them the spectacle of a soul, both contented and well pleased with whatsoever is afforded or allotted unto her and performing whatsoever is pleasing to that spirit, whom, being part of himself, Jove hath appointed to every man as his overseer and governor. 22. Be not angry neither with him whose breath, neither with him whose armholes are offensive. What can he do? Such is his breath naturally, and such are his armholes, and from such, such an effect and such a smell must of necessity proceed. Oh, but the man sayest thou, hath understanding in him, and might of himself know that he by standing near cannot choose but offend. And thou also, God bless thee, hast understanding. Let thy reasonable faculty work upon his reasonable faculty, show him his fault, admonish him. If he hearken unto thee, thou hast cured him, and there will be no more occasion of anger. And twenty-three, where there shall neither roarer be nor harlot. Why so? As thou dost purpose to live, when thou hast retired thyself to some such place, where neither roarer nor harlot is, so mayest thou hear. And if they will not suffer thee, then mayest thou leave thy life rather than thy calling, but so as one that doth not think himself anyways wronged. Only as one would say, Here is a smoke, I will out of it, and what a great matter is this. Now till some such thing force me out, I will continue free. Neither shall any man hinder me to do what I will, and my will shall ever be by the proper nature of a reasonable and sociable creature, regulated and directed. 24. That rational essence by which the universe is governed is for community and society and therefore hath it both made the things that are worse for the best, and hath allied and knit together those which are best, as it were in an harmony. Seest thou not how it hath subordinated and coordinated, and how it hath distributed unto everything according to its worth? And those which have the preeminency and superiority above all, hath it united together into a mutual consent and agreement, 25. How hast thou carried thyself hitherto towards the gods, towards thy parents, towards thy brethren, towards thy wife, towards thy children, towards thy masters, thy foster fathers, thy friends, thy domestics, thy servants? Is it so with thee that hitherto thou hast neither by word or deed wronged any of them? Remember withal through how many things thou hast already passed, and how many thou hast been able to endure so that now the legend of thy life is full and thy charge is accomplished. Again, how many truly good things have certainly by thee been discerned? How many pleasures, how many pains hast thou passed over with contempt? How many things eternally glorious hast thou despised? 
towards how many perverse unreasonable men hast thou carried thyself kindly and discreetly? 26. Why should imprudent unlearned souls trouble that which is both learned and prudent? And which is that that is so? She that understandeth the beginning and the end, and hath the true knowledge of that rational essence that passeth through all things subsisting, and through all ages being ever the same, disposing and dispensing, as it were, this universe by certain periods of time. 27. Within a very little while thou wilt be either ashes or a skeletum, and a name perchance, and perchance not so much as a name. And what is that but an empty sound and a rebounding echo? Those things which in this life are dearest unto us, and of most account, they are in themselves but vain, putrid, contemptible, the most weighty and serious, if rightly esteemed, but as puppies, biting one another, or untoward children, now laughing and then crying. As for faith and modesty and justice and truth, they long since, as one of the poets hath it, have abandoned this spacious earth and retired themselves unto heaven. What is it then that doth keep thee here, if things sensible be so mutable and unsettled, and the sense is so obscure and so fallible, and our souls nothing but an exhalation of blood, and to be in credit among such be but vanity? What is it that thou dost stay for? An extinction or a translation, either of them with a propitious and contented mind. But still that time come, what will content thee? What else but to worship and praise the gods, and to do good unto men, to bear with them, and to forbear to do them any wrong? And for all external things, belonging either to this thy wretched body, or life, to remember that they are neither thine nor in thy power. 28. Thou mayest always speed if thou wilt but make choice of the right way, if in the course both of thine opinions and actions thou wilt observe a true method. These two things be common to the souls, as of God, so of men, and of every reasonable creature. First, that in their own proper work they cannot be hindered by anything, and secondly, that their happiness doth consist in a disposition to and in the practice of righteousness, and that in these their desire is terminated. 29. If this neither be my wicked act, nor an act anyways depending from any wickedness of mine, and that by it the public is not hurt, what doth it concern me? And wherein can the public be hurt? For thou must not altogether be carried by conceit and common opinion. As for help, thou must afford that unto them after thy best ability, and as occasion shall require, though they sustain damage, but in these middle or worldly things. But however do not thou conceive that they are truly hurt thereby, for that is not right. But as that old foster father in the comedy, being now to take his leave, doth with a great deal of ceremony, require his foster child's rhombus or rattle-top, remembering nevertheless that it is but a rhombus, so here also do thou likewise. For indeed, what is all this pleading and public bawling for at the courts? O man, hast thou forgotten what those things are? Yea, but they are things that others much care for, and highly esteem of. Wilt thou therefore be a fool too? Once I was, let that suffice. 30. Let death surprise me when it will, and where it will I may be a Mirus, or a happy man nevertheless. For he is a happy man who in his lifetime dealeth unto himself a happy lot and portion. A happy lot and portion is good inclinations of the soul, good desires, good actions. The Sixth Book 1. What is wickedness? It is that which many time and often thou hast already seen and known in the world. And so oft as anything doth happen that might otherwise trouble thee, let this memento presently come to thy mind, that it is that which thou hast already often seen and known. Generally, above and below, thou shalt find but the same things, the very same things whereof ancient stories, middle-aged stories, and fresh stories are full, whereof towns are full, and houses full, 
There is nothing that is new. All things that are, are both usual and of little continuance. 2. Be it all one unto thee, whether half frozen or well warm, whether only slumbering or after a full sleep, whether discommended or commended thou do thy duty, or whether dying or doing somewhat else, for that also to die must among the rest be reckoned as one of the duties and actions of our lives. 3. Look in, let not either the proper quality or the true worth of anything pass thee before thou hast fully apprehended it. 4. All substances come soon to their change, and either they shall be resolved by way of exhalation, if so be that all things shall be reunited into one substance, or as others maintain, they shall be scattered and dispersed. As for that rational essence by which all things are governed, as it best understandeth itself, both its own disposition, and what it doth, and what matter it hath to do with, and accordingly doth all things. So we that do not know wonder, if we wonder at many things, the reasons whereof we cannot comprehend. 5. The best kind of revenge is, not to become like unto them. Let this be thy only joy, and thy only comfort. From one sociable kind action without intermission to pass unto another, God being ever in thy mind. 7. The rational commanding part as it alone can stir up and turn itself, so it maketh both itself to be, and everything that happeneth to appear unto itself, as it will itself. 8. According to the nature of the universe, all things particular are determined, not according to any other nature, either about compassing and containing, or within dispersed and contained, or without depending, Either this universe is a mere confused mass and an intricate context of things, which shall in time be scattered and dispersed again, or it is an union consisting of order and administered by providence. If the first, why should I desire to continue any longer in this fortuit confusion and commixtion? Or why should I take care for anything else, but that as soon as may be I may be earth again? And why should I trouble myself any more whilst I seek to please the gods? Whatsoever I do, dispersion is my end, and will come upon me whether I will or no. But if the latter be, then am not I religious in vain. Then will I be quiet and patient, and put my trust in him who is the governor of all. Nine. Whensoever by some present hard occurrences thou art constrained to be in some sort troubled and vexed, return unto thyself as soon as may be, and be not out of tune longer than thou must needs. For so shalt thou be the better able to keep thy part another time, and to maintain the harmony, if thou dost use thyself to this continually, once out presently to have recourse unto it, and to begin again. Ten. If it were that thou hadst at one time both a stepmother and a natural mother living, thou wouldst honor and respect her also. Nevertheless, to thine own natural mother would thy refuge and recourse be continually. So let the court and thy philosophy be unto thee. Have recourse unto it often and comfort thyself in her by whom it is that those other things are made tolerable unto thee and thou also in those things not intolerable unto others. 11. How marvelous useful it is for a man to represent unto himself meats and all such things that are for the mouth under a right apprehension and imagination. As for example, this is the carcass of a fish, this of a bird, and this of a hog, and again more generally, this falernum, this excellent highly commended wine, is but the bare juice of an ordinary grape, this purple robe but sheep's hairs dyed with the blood of a shellfish. So for coitus, it is but the attrition of an ordinary base entrail and the excretion of a little vile snivel with a certain kind of convulsion, according to Hippocrates' his opinion. How excellent useful are these lively fancies and representations of things, thus penetrating and passing through the objects to make their true nature known and apparent. This must thou use all thy life long and upon all occasions, 
and then especially when matters are apprehended as of great worth and respect, thy art and care must be to uncover them and to behold their vileness and to take away from them all those serious circumstances and expressions under which they made so grave a show. For outward pomp and appearance is a great juggler, and then especially art thou most in danger to be beguiled by it, when, to a man's thinking, thou most seemest to be employed about matters of moment. 12. See what Crates pronounceth concerning Xenocrates himself. 13. Those things which the common sort of people do admire are most of them such things as are very general and may be comprehended under things merely natural or naturally affected and qualified as stones, wood, figs, vines, olives. Those that be admired by them that are more moderate and restrained are comprehended under things animated as flocks and herds. Those that are yet more gentle and curious, their admiration is commonly confined to reasonable creatures only, not in general as they are reasonable, but as they are capable of art or of some craft and subtile invention, or perchance barely to reasonable creatures, as they that delight in the possession of many slaves. But he that honors a reasonable soul in general, as it is reasonable and naturally sociable, doth little regard anything else, and above all things is careful to preserve his own in the continual habit and exercise both of reason and sociableness, and thereby doth cooperate with him, of whose nature he doth also participate. God. 14. Some things hasten to be, and others to be no more. And even whatsoever now is, some part thereof hath already perished. Perpetual fluxes and alterations renew the world, as the perpetual course of time doth make the age of the world, of itself infinite, to appear always fresh and new. In such a flux and course of all things, what of these things that hasten so fast away should any man regard, since among all there is not any that a man may fasten and fix upon? As if a man would settle his affection upon some ordinary sparrow living by him, who is no sooner seen than out of sight. For we must not think otherwise of our lives than as a mere exhalation of blood or of an ordinary respiration of air. For what in our common apprehension is to breathe in the air and to breathe it out again, which we do daily, so much is it and no more, at once to breathe out all thy respirative faculty into that common air, from whence but lately, as being but from yesterday, and today thou didst first breathe it in, and with it life. 15. Not vegetative spiration, it is not surely which plants have, that in this life should be so dear unto us, nor sensitive respiration, the proper life of beasts, both tame and wild, nor this our imaginative faculty, nor that we are subject to be led and carried up and down by the strength of our sensual appetites, or that we can gather and live together, or that we can feed. For that, in effect, is no better than that we can void the excrements of our food. What is it, then, that should be dear unto us? To hear a clattering noise? If not that, then neither to be applauded by the tongues of men. For the praises of many tongues is, in effect, no better than the clattering of so many tongues. If then neither applause, what is there remaining that should be dear unto thee? This I think, that in all thy motions and actions thou be moved and restrained according to thine own true natural constitution and construction only. And to this even ordinary arts and professions do lead us, for it is that which every art doth aim at, that whatsoever it is, that is by art effected and prepared, may be fit for that work that it is prepared for. This is the end that he that dresseth the vine, and he that takes upon him either to tame colts or to train up dogs doth aim at. What else doth the education of children and all learned professions tend unto? Certainly then it is that which should be dear unto us also, if in this particular it go well with thee. Care not for the obtaining of other things, but is it so? 
that thou canst not but respect other things also, then canst not thou truly be free? Then canst thou not have self-content, then wilt thou ever be subject to passions? For it is not possible, but that thou must be envious, and jealous, and suspicious of them, whom thou knowest can bereave thee of such things, and again, a secret underminer of them whom thou seest in present possession of that which is dear unto thee. To be short, he must of necessity be full of confusion within himself, and often accuse the gods, whosoever stands in need of these things. But if thou shalt honor and respect thy mind only, that will make thee acceptable towards thyself, towards thy friends very tractable, and conformable and concordant with the gods, that is, accepting with praises whatsoever they shall think good to appoint and allot unto thee. 16. Under, above, and about are the motions of the elements, but the motion of virtue is none of those motions, but is somewhat more excellent and divine, whose way to speed and prosper in it must be through a way that is not easily comprehended. 17. Who can choose but wonder at them? They will not speak well of them that are at the same time with them, and live with them, yet they themselves are very ambitious that they that shall follow, whom they have never seen, nor shall ever see, should speak well of them. As if a man should grieve that he hath not been commended by them that lived before him. 18. Do not ever conceive anything impossible to man which by thee cannot or not without much difficulty be effected. But whatsoever in general thou canst conceive possible and proper unto any man, think that very possible unto thee also. 19. Suppose that at the palestra somebody hath all to torn thee with his nails, and hath broken thy head. Well, thou art wounded, yet thou dost not exclaim, thou art not offended with him. Thou dost not suspect him for it afterwards, as one that watcheth to do thee a mischief. Yea, even then, though thou dost thy best to save thyself from him, yet not from him as an enemy, it is not by way of any suspicious indignation, but by way of gentle and friendly declination. Keep the same mind and disposition in other parts of thy life also, for many things there be, which we must conceit and apprehend as though we had had to do with an antagonist at the palestra. For, as I said, it is very possible for us to avoid and decline, though we neither suspect nor hate. 20. If anybody shall reprove me and shall make it apparent unto me that in any either opinion or action of mine I do err, I will most gladly retract. For it is the truth that I seek after by which I am sure that never any man was hurt, and as sure that he is hurt that continueth in any error or ignorance whatsoever. 21. I for my part will do what belongs unto me, as for other things, whether things unsensible or things irrational, or if rational yet deceived and ignorant of the true way, they shall not trouble or distract me. For as for those creatures which are not endued with reason and all other things and matters of the world, Whatsoever I freely and generously, as one endued with reason, of things that have none, make use of them. And as for men, towards them as naturally partakers of the same reason, my care is to carry myself sociably. But whatsoever it is that thou art about, remember to call upon the gods. And as for the time how long thou shalt live to do these things, let it be altogether indifferent unto thee for even three such hours are sufficient. 22. Alexander of Macedon, and he that dressed his mules, when once dead, both came to one. For either they were both resumed into those original rational essences from whence all things in the world are propagated, or both after one fashion were scattered into atoms. 23. Consider how many different things, whether they concern our bodies or our souls, in a moment of time come to pass in every one of us, and so thou wilt not wonder if many more things, or rather all things that are done, can at one time subsist, 
and coexist in that both one and general, which we call the world. 24. If any should put this question unto thee, how this word Antoninus is written, wouldst thou not presently fix thine intention upon it, and utter out in order every letter of it? And if any shall begin to gainsay thee, and quarrel with thee about it, wilt thou quarrel with him again, or rather go on meekly as thou hast begun, until thou hast numbered out every letter? Here then likewise remember that every duty that belongs unto a man doth consist of some certain letters or numbers, as it were, to which without any noise or tumult keeping thyself thou must orderly proceed to thy proposed end, forbearing to quarrel with him that would quarrel and fall out with thee. 25. Is it not a cruel thing to forbid men to effect those things which they conceive to agree best with their own natures, and to tend most to their own proper good and behoof? But thou, after a sort, deniest them this liberty, as often as thou art angry with them for their sins. For surely they are led unto those sins whatsoever they be, as to their proper good and commodity. But it is not so, thou wilt object perchance. Thou therefore teach them better, and make it appear unto them, but be not thou angry with them. 26. Death is a cessation from the impression of the senses, the tyranny of the passions, the errors of the mind, and the servitude of the body. 27. If in this kind of life thy body be able to hold out, it is a shame that thy soul should faint first, and give over, take heed, lest of a philosopher thou become a mere Caesar in time, and receive a new tincture from the court. For it may happen if thou dost not take heed. Keep thyself therefore truly simple, good, sincere, grave, free from all ostentation, a lover of that which is just, religious, kind, tender-hearted, strong and vigorous to undergo anything that becomes thee. Endeavor to continue such, as philosophy, hadst thou wholly and constantly applied thyself unto it, would have made and secured thee. Worship the gods, procure the welfare of men. This life is short. Charitable actions and a holy disposition is the only fruit of this earthly life. 28. Do all things as becometh the disciple of Antoninus Pius. Remember his resolute constancy in things that were done by him according to reason, his equability in all things, his sanctity, the cheerfulness of his countenance, his sweetness, and how free he was from all vain glory. How careful to come to the true and exact knowledge of matters in hand, and how he would by no means give over till he did fully and plainly understand the whole state of the business, and how patiently and without any contestation he would bear with them that did unjustly condemn him, how he would never be over hasty in anything nor give ear to slanders and false accusations, but examine and observe with best diligence the several actions and dispositions of men. Again, how he was no backbiter, nor easily frightened, nor suspicious, and in his language free from all affectation and curiosity, and how easily he would content himself with few things, as lodging, bedding, clothing, and ordinary nourishment and attendance. How able to endure labor, how patient, able through his spare diet to continue from morning to evening without any necessity of withdrawing before his accustomed hours to the necessities of nature, his uniformity and constancy in matter of friendship, how he would bear with them that with all boldness and liberty opposed his opinions and even rejoice if any man could better advise him. And lastly, how religious he was without superstition. All these things of him remember that whensoever thy last hour shall come upon thee, it may find thee, as it did him, ready for it in the possession of a good conscience. 29. Stir up thy mind and recall thy wits again from thy natural dreams and visions, and when thou art perfectly awoken, and canst perceive that they were but dreams that troubled thee as one newly awakened out of another kind of sleep. Look upon these worldly things with the same mind as thou didst upon those that thou sawest in thy sleep. 30. I consist of body and soul. Unto my body all things are indifferent, 
for of itself it cannot affect one thing more than another with apprehension of any difference. As for my mind, all things which are not within the verge of her own operation are indifferent unto her, and for her own operations those altogether depend of her. Neither does she busy herself about any but those that are present. For as for future and past operations, those also are now at this present indifferent unto her. 31. As long as the foot doth that which belongeth unto it to do, and the hand that which belongs unto it, their labor, whatsoever it be, is not unnatural. So a man, as long as he doth that which is proper unto a man, his labor cannot be against nature, and if it be not against nature, then neither is it hurtful unto him. But if it were so that happiness did consist in pleasure, how came notorious robbers, impure, abominable livers, parasites, and tyrants in so large a measure to have their part of pleasures? 32. Dost thou not see how even those that profess mechanic arts, though in some respect they be no better than mere idiots, yet they stick close to the course of their trade, neither can they find in their heart to decline from it. And is it not a grievous thing that an architect or a physician shall respect the course and mysteries of their profession? More than a man the proper course and condition of his own nature, reason which is common to him and to the gods. 33. Asia, Europe, what are they but as corners of the whole world? of which the whole sea is but as one drop, and the great Mount Athos, but as a clod, as all present time is but as one point of eternity. All petty things, all things that are soon altered, soon perished, and all things come from one beginning, either all severally and particularly deliberated and resolved upon by the general ruler and governor of all, or all by necessary consequence so that the dreadful hiatus of a gaping lion and all poison and all hurtful things are but, as the thorn and the mire, the necessary consequences of goodly fair things. Think not of these, therefore, as things contrary to those which thou dost much honor and respect, but consider in thy mind the true fountain of all. 34. He that seeth the things that are now hath seen all that either was ever or ever shall be, for all things are of one kind, and all like one unto another. Meditate often upon the connection of all things in the world, and upon the mutual relation that they have one unto another. For all things are after a sort folded and involved one within another, and by these means all agree well together. For one thing is consequent unto another, by local motion, by natural conspiration and agreement, and by substantial union, or reduction of all substances into one. 35. Fit and accommodate thyself to that estate and to those occurrences which by the destinies have been annexed unto thee, and love those men whom thy fate it is to live with, but love them truly, an instrument a tool and utensil, whatsoever it be, if it be fit for the purpose it was made for, it is as it should be, though he perchance that made and fitted it be out of sight and gone. But in things natural, that power which hath framed and fitted them is and abideth within them still, for which reason she ought also the more to be respected, and we are the more obliged, if we may live and pass our time according to her purpose and intention to think that all is well with us, and according to our own minds. After this manner also, and in this respect it is, that he that is all in all, doth enjoy his happiness. 36. What things soever are not within the proper power and jurisdiction of thine own, will either to compass or avoid, if thou shalt propose unto thyself any of those things as either good or evil? It must needs be that according as thou shalt either fall into that which thou dost think evil, or miss of that which thou dost think good, 
So wilt thou be ready both to complain of the gods and to hate those men who either shall be so indeed or shall by thee be suspected as the cause either of thy missing of the one or falling into the other. And indeed we must needs commit many evils if we incline to any of these things, more or less, with an opinion of any difference. But if we mind and fancy those things only as good and bad, which wholly depend of our own wills. There is no more occasion why we should either murmur against the gods or be at enmity with any man. 37. We all work to one effect, some willingly and with a rational apprehension of what we do, others without any such knowledge. As I think Heraclitus in a place speaketh of them that sleep, that even they do work in their kind, and do confer to the general operations of the world. One man therefore doth co-operate after one sort, and another after another sort, but even he that doth murmur, and to his power doth resist and hinder, even he, as much as any, doth co-operate. For of such also did the world stand in need. Now do thou consider among which of these thou wilt rank thyself, for as for him who is the administrator of all, he will make good use of thee whether thou wilt or no, and make thee, as a part and member of the whole, so to cooperate with him, that whatsoever thou doest shall turn to the furtherance of his own counsels and resolutions. But be not thou for shame such a part of the whole as that vile and ridiculous verse which Chrysippus in a place doth mention is a part of the comedy. 38. Doth either the sun take upon him to do that which belongs to the rain, or his son Aesculapius, that which unto the earth doth properly belong? How is it with every one of the stars in particular? Though they all differ one from another, and have their several charges and functions by themselves, do they not all nevertheless concur, and cooperate to one end? 39. If so be that the gods have deliberated in particular of those things that should happen unto me, I must stand to their deliberation as discreet and wise. For that a god should be an imprudent god is a thing hard even to conceive. And why should they resolve to do me hurt? For what profit either unto them or the universe, which they specially take care for, could arise from it? But if so be that they have not deliberated of me in particular, certainly they have of the whole in general, and those things which in consequence and coherence of this general deliberation happen unto me in particular, I am bound to embrace and accept of. But if so be that they have not deliberated at all, which indeed is very irreligious for any man to believe, for then let us neither sacrifice, nor pray, nor respect our oaths, Neither let us any more use any of those things which we persuaded of the presence and secret conversation of the gods among us, daily use and practice. But, I say, if so be that they have not indeed either in general or particular deliberated of any of those things that happen unto us in this world, yet God be thanked that of those things that concern myself, it is lawful for me to deliberate myself and all my deliberation is but concerning that which may be to me most profitable. Now that unto everyone is most profitable, which is according to his own constitution and nature. And my nature is to be rational in all my actions, and as a good and natural member of a city and commonwealth, towards my fellow members ever to be sociably and kindly disposed and affected my city and country, as I am Antoninus is Rome, as a man, the whole world. Those things, therefore, that are expedient and profitable to those cities are the only things that are good and expedient for me. 40. Whatsoever in any kind doth happen to anyone is expedient to the whole, and thus much to content us might suffice, that it is expedient for the whole in general. But yet this also shalt thou generally perceive if thou dost diligently take heed that whatsoever doth happen to any one man or men. And now I am content that the word expedient 
should more generally be understood of those things which we otherwise call middle things, or things indifferent, as health, wealth, and the like. O 41. As the ordinary shows of the theater and of other such places, when thou art presented with them, affect thee, as the same things still seen and in the same fashion make the sight ingrateful and tedious, so must all the things that we see all our life long affect us. For all things above and below are still the same, and from the same causes. When then will there be an end? 42. Let the several deaths of men of all sorts and of all sorts of professions and of all sort of nations be a perpetual object of thy thoughts, so that thou mayest even come down to Philistio, Phobus, and Oregonian. Pass now to other generations. Thither shall we, after many changes, where so many brave orators are, where so many grave philosophers, Heraclitus, Pythagoras, Socrates, where so many heroes of the old times, and then so many brave captains of the latter times, and so many kings. After all these, where Eudoxus, Hipparchus, Archimedes, where so many other sharp, generous, industrious, subtile, peremptory dispositions, and among others, even they, that have been the greatest scoffers and deriders of the frailty and brevity of this our human life, as Manippus and others, as many as there have been such as he, of all these consider that they long since are all dead and gone. And what do they suffer by it? Nay, they that have not so much as a name remaining, what are they the worse for it? One thing there is, and that only, which is worth our while in this world, and ought by us much to be esteemed, and that is, according to truth and righteousness, meekly and lovingly, to converse with false and unrighteous men. 43. When thou wilt comfort and cheer thyself, Call to mind the several gifts and virtues of them whom thou dost daily converse with, as for example the industry of the one, the modesty of another, the liberality of a third, of another some other thing. For nothing can so much rejoice thee as the resemblances and parallels of several virtues, visible and eminent in the dispositions of those who live with thee, especially when, all at once, as near as may be, they represent themselves unto thee and therefore thou must have them always in a readiness. 44. Dost thou grieve that thou dost weigh but so many pounds, and not three hundred rather? Just as much reason hast thou to grieve that thou must live but so many years, and not longer. For as for bulk and substance, thou dost content thyself with that proportion of it that is allotted unto thee, so shouldst thou for time. 45. Let us do our best endeavors to persuade them. But however, if reason and justice lead thee to it, do it, though they be never so much against it. But if any shall by force withstand thee and hinder thee in it, convert thy virtuous inclination from one object unto another, from justice to contented equanimity and cheerful patience, so that what in the one is thy hindrance thou mayest make use of it for the exercise of another virtue. And remember that it was with due exception and reservation that thou didst at first incline and desire. For thou didst not set thy mind upon things impossible. Upon what then? That all thy desires might ever be moderated with this due kind of reservation. And this thou hast and mayst always obtain, whether the thing desired be in thy power or no. And what do I care for more, if that for which I was born and brought forth into the world, to rule all my desires with reason and discretion, may be? 46. The ambitious supposeth another man's act, praise and applause, to be his own happiness, the voluptuous his own sense and feeling, but he that is wise his own action. 47. It is in thy power absolutely to exclude all manner of conceit and opinion as concerning this matter, and by the same means to exclude all grief and sorrow from thy soul. For as for the things and objects themselves, they of themselves have no such power, 
whereby to beget and force upon us any opinion at all. 48. Use thyself when any man speaks unto thee, so to hearken unto him, as that in the interim thou give not way to any other thoughts, that so thou mayest, as far as is possible, seem fixed and fastened to his very soul, whosoever he be that speaks unto thee. 49. That which is not good for the beehive cannot be good for the bee. 50. Will either passengers or patients find fault and complain, either the one if they be well carried, or the others if well cured? Do they take care for any more than this? The one, that their shipmaster may bring them safe to land, and the other, that their physician may effect their recovery? 51. How many of them who came into the world at the same time when I did are already gone out of it? 52. To them that are sick of the jaundice, honey seems bitter, and to them that are bitten by a mad dog, the water terrible, and to children a little ball seems a fine thing. And why then should I be angry? Or do I think that error and false opinion is less powerful to make men transgress than either choler, being immoderate and excessive, to cause the jaundice, or poison, to cause rage. 53. No man can hinder thee to live as thy nature doth require. Nothing can happen unto thee but what the common good of nature doth require. 54. What manner of men they be whom they seek to please, and what to get, and by what actions, how soon time will cover and bury all things, and how many it hath already buried. The seventh book. 1. What is wickedness? It is that which many time and often thou hast already seen and known in the world. And so oft as anything doth happen that might otherwise trouble thee, let this memento presently come to thy mind, that it is that which thou hast already often seen and known. Generally above and below thou shalt find but the same things, the very same things, whereof ancient stories, middle-aged stories, and fresh stories are full whereof towns are full and houses full. There is nothing that is new. All things that are are both usual and of little continuance. 2. What fear is there that thy dogmata or philosophical resolutions and conclusions should become dead in thee and lose their proper power and efficacy to make thee live happy? as long as those proper and correlative fancies and representations of things on which they mutually depend, which continually to stir up and revive is in thy power, are still kept fresh and alive? It is in my power concerning this thing that has happened, whatsoever it be, to conceit that which is right and true. If it be, why then am I troubled? Those things that are without my understanding, are nothing to it at all, and that is it only, which doth properly concern me. Be always in this mind, and thou wilt be right. 3. That which most men would think themselves most happy for, and would prefer before all things, if the gods would grant it unto them after their deaths, thou mayest, whilst thou livest, grant unto thyself to live again. See the things of the world again, as thou hast already seen them, for what is it else to live again? Public shows and solemnities with much pomp and vanity, stage plays, flocks and herds, conflicts and contentions, a bone thrown to a company of hungry curs, a bait for greedy fishes, the painfulness and continual burden-bearing of wretched ants, the running to and fro of terrified mice, little puppets drawn up and down with wires and nerves, these be the objects of the world, among all these thou must stand steadfast, meekly affected, and free from all manner of indignation. With this right ratiocination and apprehension, that as the worth is of those things which a man doth affect, so is in very deed every man's worth more or less. For, word after word, every one by itself, must the things that are spoken be conceived and understood. And so the things that are done, purpose after purpose, every one by itself likewise. And as in matter of purposes and actions, we must presently see what is the proper use and relation of every one. So of words must we be as ready to consider of every one. 
What is the true meaning and signification of it according to truth and nature, however it be taken in common use? 5. Is my reason and understanding sufficient for this or no? If it be sufficient without any private applause or public ostentation as of an instrument which by nature I am provided of, I will make use of it for the work in hand as of an instrument which by nature I am provided of. If it be not, and that otherwise it belong not unto me particularly as a private duty, I will either give it over and leave it to some other that can better effect it, or I will endeavor it, but with the help of some other who with the joint help of my reason is able to bring somewhat to pass that will now be seasonable and useful for the common good. For whatsoever I do either by myself or with some other, the only thing that I must intend is that it be good and expedient for the public. For as for praise, consider how many who once were much commended are now already quite forgotten, yea, they that commended them, how even they themselves are long since dead and gone. Be not therefore ashamed, whensoever thou must use the help of others. For whatsoever it be that lieth upon thee to effect, thou must propose it unto thyself, as the scaling of walls is unto a soldier. And what if thou through either lameness, or some other impediment art, not able to reach unto the top of the battlements alone, which with the help of another thou mayst? Wilt thou therefore give it over, or go about it with less courage and alacrity, because thou canst not effect it all alone. 6. Let not things future trouble thee, for if necessity so require that they come to pass, thou shalt, whensoever that is, be provided for them with the same reason by which whatsoever is now present is made both tolerable and acceptable unto thee. All things are linked and knitted together, and the knot is sacred. Neither is there anything in the world that is not kind and natural in regard of any other thing, or that hath not some kind of reference and natural correspondence with whatsoever is in the world besides. For all things are ranked together, and by that decency of its due place and order that each particular doth observe, they all concur together to the making of one and the same cosmos or world. As if you said, a comely piece, or an orderly composition. For all things throughout, there is but one and the same order, and through all things, one and the same God, the same substance and the same law. There is one common reason and one common truth that belongs unto all reasonable creatures, for neither is there save one perfection of all creatures that are of the same kind and partakers of the same reason. 7. Whatsoever is material doth soon vanish away into the common substance of the whole, and whatsoever is formal, or whatsoever doth animate that which is material, is soon resumed into the common reason of the whole, and the fame and memory of anything is soon swallowed up by the general age and duration of the whole. 8. To a reasonable creature the same action is both according to nature and according to reason. 9. Straight of itself, not made straight. 10. As several members in one body united, so are reasonable creatures in a body divided and dispersed, all made and prepared for one common operation. And this thou shalt apprehend the better, if thou shalt use thyself often to say to thyself, I am Melos, or a member of the mass and body of reasonable substances. But if thou shalt say, I am Meros, or a part, thou dost not yet love men from thy heart. The joy that thou takest in the exercise of bounty is not yet grounded upon a due ratiocination and right apprehension of the nature of things. Thou dost exercise it as yet upon this ground barely, as a thing convenient and fitting, not as doing good to thyself when thou dost good unto others. 11. Of things that are external, happen what will to that which can suffer by external accidents. Those things that suffer, let them complain themselves, if they will. As for me, as long as I conceive no such thing, that that which has happened is evil, I have no hurt, and it is in my power not to conceive any such thing. 12. Whatsoever any man either doth or saith, thou must be good, not for any man's sake, but for thine own nature's sake, as if either gold or the emerald or purple should ever be saying to themselves, 
Whatsoever any man either doth or saith, I must still be an emerald, and I must keep my color. 13. This may ever be my comfort and security. My understanding that ruleth over all will not of itself bring trouble and vexation upon itself. This I say, it will not put itself in any fear, it will not lead itself into any concupiscence. If it be in the power of any other to compel it to fear or to grieve, it is free for him to use his power. But sure if itself do not of itself, through some false opinion or supposition, incline itself to any such disposition, there is no fear. For as for the body, why should I make the grief of my body to be the grief of my mind? If that itself can either fear or complain, let it. But as for the soul, which indeed can only be truly sensible of either fear or grief, to which only it belongs according to its different imaginations and opinions, to admit of either of these or of their contraries, thou mayest look to that thyself, that it suffer nothing, induce her not to any such opinion or persuasion. The understanding is of itself sufficient unto itself, and needs not, if itself doth not bring itself to need, any other thing besides itself, and by consequent as it needs nothing, so neither can it be troubled or hindered by anything, if itself doth not trouble and hinder itself. 14. What is Evdemonia or happiness, but Agathos Daimon, or a good demon or spirit? What then dost thou do here? O opinion, by the gods I adjure thee that thou get thee gone as thou earnest, for I need thee not. Thou earnest indeed unto me according to thy ancient wonted manner. It is that that all men have ever been subject unto. That thou camest therefore I am not angry with thee, only be gone, now that I have found thee what thou art. Mere 15. Is any man so foolish as to fear change, to which all things that once were not owe their being? And what is it that is more pleasing and more familiar to the nature of the universe? How couldst thou thyself use thy ordinary hot baths? Should not the wood that heateth them first be changed? How couldst thou receive any nourishment from those things that thou hast eaten, if they should not be changed? Can anything else almost that is useful and profitable, be brought to pass without change? How then dost not thou perceive that for thee also by death to come to change is a thing of the very same nature and is necessary for the nature of the universe? 16. Through the substance of the universe, as through a torrent pass all particular bodies, being all of the same nature, and all joint workers with the universe itself, as in one of our bodies, so many members among themselves. How many such as Chrysippus, how many such as Socrates, how many such as Epictetus, hath the age of the world long since swallowed up and devoured? Let this, be it either men or businesses, that thou hast occasion to think of, to the end that thy thoughts be not distracted and thy mind too earnestly set upon anything, upon every such occasion presently come to thy mind. Of all my thoughts and cares, one only thing shall be the object, that I myself do nothing which to the proper constitution of man, either in regard of the thing itself, or in regard of the manner, or of the time of doing, is contrary. The time when thou shalt have forgotten all things is at hand, and that time also is at hand, when thou thyself shalt be forgotten by all. Whilst thou art, apply thyself to that especially which unto man as he is a mart, is most proper and agreeable, and that is, for a man even to love them that transgress against him. This shall be, if at the same time that any such thing doth happen, thou call to mind that they are thy kinsmen, that it is through ignorance and against their wills that they sin, and that within a very short while after, both thou and he shall be no more but above all things, that he hath not done thee any hurt, for that by him thy mind and understanding is not made worse or more vile than it was before. 17. The nature of the universe, of the common substance of all things as it were, of so much wax hath now perchance formed a horse, and then destroying that figure, hath new-tempered and fashioned the matter of it into the form and substance of a tree 
then that again into the form and substance of a man, and then that again into some other. Now every one of these doth subsist but for a very little while. As for dissolution, if it be no grievous thing to the chest or trunk, to be joined together, why should it be more grievous to be put asunder? 18. An angry countenance is much against nature, and it is oftentimes the proper countenance of them that are at the point of death. But were it so, that all anger and passion were so thoroughly quenched in thee, that it were altogether impossible to kindle it any more, yet herein must not thou rest satisfied, but further endeavour by good consequence of true ratiocination, perfectly to conceive and understand that all anger and passion is against reason. For if thou shalt not be sensible of thine innocence, if that also shall be gone from thee, the comfort of a good conscience, that thou doest all things according to reason, what shouldest thou live any longer for? All things that now thou seest are but for a moment. That nature, by which all things in the world are administered, will soon bring change and alteration upon them, and then of their substances make other things like unto them, and then soon after others again of the matter and substance of these, that so by these means the world may still appear fresh and new. When 19. Whensoever any man doth trespass against other, presently consider with thyself what it was that he did suppose to be good, what to be evil when he did trespass. For this when thou knowest, thou wilt pity him, thou wilt have no occasion either to wonder or to be angry. For either thou thyself dost yet live in that error and ignorance, as that thou dost suppose either that very thing that he doth, or some other like worldly thing, to be good. And so thou art bound to pardon him if he have done that which thou in the like case wouldst have done thyself. Or if so be that thou dost not any more suppose the same things to be good or evil that he doth, how canst thou but be gentle unto him that is in an error? 20. Fancy not to thyself things future, as though they were present but of those that are present. Take some aside, that thou takest most benefit of, and consider of them particularly, how wonderfully thou wouldst want them, if they were not present. But take heed withal, lest that whilst thou dost settle thy contentment in things present, thou grow in time so to overprize them, as that the want of them, whensoever it shall so fall out, should be a trouble and a vexation unto thee. Wind up thyself into thyself. Such is the nature of thy reasonable commanding part, as that if it exercise justice, and have by that means tranquility within itself, it doth rest fully satisfied with itself without any other thing. 21. Wipe off all opinion. Stay the force and violence of unreasonable lusts and affections. Circumscribe the present time, examine whatsoever it be that is happened, either to thyself or to another. Divide all present objects, either in that which is formal or material, think of the last hour. That which thy neighbor hath committed, where the guilt of it lieth, there let it rest. Examine in order whatsoever is spoken. Let thy mind penetrate both into the effects and into the causes. Rejoice thyself with true simplicity and modesty, and that all middle things between virtue and vice are indifferent unto thee. Finally, love mankind. Obey God. 22. All things, saith he, are by certain order and appointment. And what if the elements only? It will suffice to remember that all things in general are by certain order and appointment, or if it be but few. And as concerning death, that either dispersion, or the atoms, or annihilation, or extinction, or translation, will ensue. And as concerning pain, that that which is intolerable is soon ended by death, and that which holds long must needs be tolerable, and that the mind in the meantime, which is all in all, may by way of interclusion or interception, by stopping all manner of commerce and sympathy with the body, still retain its own tranquility. Thy understanding is not made worse by it. As for those parts that suffer, let them, if they can, declare their grief themselves. As for praise and commendation, view their mind and understanding, 
what a state they are in, what kind of things they fly, and what things they seek after, and that as in the seaside, whatsoever was before to be seen is by the continual succession of new heaps of sand cast up one upon another, soon hid and covered. So in this life, all former things by those which immediately succeed. 23. Out of Plato. He then whose mind is endowed with true magnanimity, who hath accustomed himself to the contemplation both of all times and of all things in general, can this mortal life, thinkest thou, seem any great matter unto him? It is not possible, answered he, then neither will such a one account death a grievous thing? By no means. 24. Out of Antisthenes It is a princely thing to do well, and to be ill spoken of. It is a shameful thing that the face should be subject unto the mind, to be put into what shape it will, and to be dressed by it as it will, and that the mind should not bestow so much care upon herself as to fashion herself, and to dress herself as best becometh her. 25. Out of several poets and comics, it will but little avail thee to turn thine anger and indignation upon the things themselves that have fallen across unto thee. For as for them, they are not sensible of it, etc. Thou shalt but make thyself a laughingstock, both unto the gods and men, etc. Our life is reaped like a ripe ear of corn, one is yet standing and another is down, etc. But if so be that I and my children be neglected by the gods, there is some reason even for that, etc. As long as right and equity is of my side, etc. Not to lament with them, not to tremble, etc. 26. Out of Plato. My answer, full of justice and equity, should be this. Thy speech is not right, O man. If thou supposest that he that is of any worth at all should apprehend either life or death as a matter of great hazard and danger, and should not make this rather his only care to examine his own actions, whether just or unjust, whether actions of a good or of a wicked man, etc. For thus, in very truth, stands the case, O ye men of Athens. What place or station soever a man either hath chosen to himself judging it best for himself, or is by lawful authority put and settled in. Therein do I think, all appearance of danger notwithstanding, that he should continue, as one who feareth neither death nor anything else, so much as he feareth to commit anything that is vicious and shameful, etc. But, O oh, noble sir, consider, I pray, whether true generosity and true happiness do not consist in somewhat else rather, than in the preservation either of our or other men's lives. For it is not the part of a man that is a man indeed to desire to live long or to make much of his life whilst he liveth, but rather he that is such will in these things wholly refer himself unto the gods, and believing that which every woman can tell him, that no man can escape death. The only thing that he takes thought and care for is this, that what time he liveth he may live as well and as virtuously as he can possibly, etc., to look about, and with the eyes to follow the course of the stars and planets, as though thou wouldst run with them, and to mind perpetually the several changes of the elements one into another, for such fancies and imaginations help much to purge away the dross and filth of this our earthly life, etc. That also is a fine passage of Plato's, where he speaketh of worldly things in these words, Thou must also, as from some higher place, look down, as it were, upon the things of this world, as flocks, armies, husbandmen's labors, marriages, divorces, generations, deaths, the tumults of courts and places of judicatures, desert places, the several nations of barbarians, public festivals, mornings, fairs, markets, how all things upon earth are pell-mell, and how miraculously things contrary one to another concur to the beauty and perfection of this universe. 27. To look back upon things of former ages, as upon the manifold changes and conversions of several monarchies and commonwealths, 
We may also foresee things future, for they shall all be of the same kind. Neither is it possible that they should leave the tune, or break the concert that is now begun, as it were, by these things that are now done and brought to pass in the world. It comes all to one, therefore, whether a man be a spectator of the things of this life but forty years, or whether he see them ten thousand years together, for what shall he see more? And as for those parts that came from the earth, they shall return unto the earth again, and those that came from heaven, they also shall return unto those heavenly places. Whether it be a mere dissolution and unbinding of the manifold intricacies and entanglements of the confused atoms, or some such dispersion of the simple and incorruptible elements. With meats and drinks and divers charms, they seek to divert the channel that they might not die. Yet must we needs endure that blast of wind that cometh from above, though we toil and labor never so much. 28. He hath a stronger body and is a better wrestler than I. What then? Is he more bountiful? Is he more modest? Doth he bear all adverse chances with more equanimity, or with his neighbor's offenses with more meekness and gentleness than I? 29. Where the matter may be affected agreeably to that reason, which both unto the gods and men is common, there can be no just cause of grief or sorrow. For where the fruit and benefit of an action well begun and prosecuted according to the proper constitution of man may be reaped and obtained, or is sure and certain, it is against reason that any damage should there be suspected. In all places and at all times, it is in thy power religiously to embrace whatsoever, by God's appointment, is happened unto thee, and justly to converse with those men whom thou hast to do with and accurately to examine every fancy that presents itself, that nothing may slip and steal in, before thou hast rightly apprehended the true nature of it. 30. Look not about upon other men's minds and understandings, but look right on forwards with a nature, both that of the universe, in those things that happen unto thee, and thine in particular, in those things that are done by thee, doth lead and direct thee. Now everyone is bound to do that, which is consequent and agreeable to that end, which by his true natural constitution he was ordained unto. As for all other things, they are ordained for the use of reasonable creatures, as in all things we see that that which is worse and inferior is made for that which is better. Reasonable creatures, they are ordained one for another, that therefore which is chief in every man's constitution is that he intend the common good. The second is, that he yield not to any lusts and motions of the flesh, for it is the part and privilege of the reasonable and intellective faculty that she can so bound herself as that neither the sensitive nor the appetitive faculties may not anyways prevail upon her, for both these are brutish, and therefore over both she challengeth mastery and cannot anyways endure, if in her right temper, to be subject unto either, and this indeed most justly. For by nature she was ordained to command all in the body. The third thing proper to man by his constitution is to avoid all rashness and precipitancy and not to be subject to error. To these things then, let the mind apply herself and go straight on without any distraction about other things. And she hath her end and by consequent her happiness. 31. As one who had lived and were now to die by right whatsoever is yet remaining, bestow that holy as a gracious overplus upon a virtuous life. Love and affect that only, whatsoever it be that happeneth, and is by the fates appointed unto thee. For what can be more reasonable? And as anything doth happen unto thee by way of cross or calamity, call to mind presently, and set before thine eyes the examples of some other men, to whom the self-same thing did once happen likewise. Well, what did they? They grieved, they wondered, they complained, and where are they now, all dead and gone? Wilt thou also be like one of them, or rather leaving to men of the world, whose life both in regard of themselves and them that they converse with is nothing but mere mutability, 
or men of as fickle minds as fickle bodies, ever changing and soon change themselves, let it be thine only care and study how to make a right use of all such accidents. For there is good use to be made of them, and they will prove fit matter for thee to work upon, if it shall be both thy care and thy desire, that whatsoever thou doest, thou thyself mayst like and approve thyself for it. And both these see that thou remember well, according as the diversity of the matter of the action that thou art about shall require. Look within. Within is the fountain of all good. Such a fountain, where springing waters can never fail. So thou dig still deeper and deeper. 32. Thou must use thyself also to keep thy body fixed and steady, free from all loose fluctuant either motion or posture. And as upon thy face and looks, thy mind hath easily power over them to keep them to that which is grave and decent. So let it challenge the same power over the whole body also. But so observe all things in this kind, as that it be without any manner of affectation. 33. The art of true living in this world is more like a wrestler's than a dancer's practice. For in this they both agree, to teach a man whatsoever falls upon him, that he may be ready for it, and that nothing may cast him down. 34. Thou must continually ponder and consider with thyself what manner of men they be, and for their minds and understandings what is their present estate, whose good word and testimony thou dost desire. For then neither wilt thou see cause to complain of them that offend against their wills, or find any want of their applause, if once thou dost but penetrate into the true force and ground both of their opinions and of their desires. No soul, saith he, is willingly bereft of the truth, and by consequent neither of justice or temperance or kindness and mildness, nor of anything that is of the same kind. It is most needful that thou shouldst always remember this, for so shalt thou be far more gentle and moderate towards all men. 35. What pain soever thou art in, let this presently come to thy mind, that it is not a thing whereof thou needest to be ashamed, neither is it a thing whereby thy understanding, that hath the government of all, can be made worse. For neither in regard of the substance of it, nor in regard of the end of it, which is to intend the common good, can it alter and corrupt it. This also of Epicurus mayst thou in most pains find some help of, that it is neither intolerable nor eternal. So thou keep thyself to the true bounds and limits of reason, and give not way to opinion. This also thou must consider, that many things there be which oftentimes unsensibly trouble and vex thee, as not armed against them with patience, because they go not ordinarily under the name of pains, which in very deed are of the same nature as pain, as to slumber unquietly, to suffer heat, to want appetite, when therefore any of these things make thee discontented, check thyself with these words. Now hath pain given thee the foil, thy courage hath failed thee. 36. Take heed lest at any time thou stand so affected, though towards unnatural evil men, as ordinary men are commonly one towards another. 37. How know we whether Socrates were so eminent indeed, and of so extraordinary a disposition, for that he died more gloriously, that he disputed with the sophists more subtlety, that he watched in the frost more assiduously, that being commanded to fetch innocent Salaminius, he refused to do it more generously. All this will not serve, nor that he walked in the streets with much gravity and majesty, as was objected unto him by his adversaries, which nevertheless a man may well doubt of, whether it were so or no or which above all the rest, if so be that it were true, a man would well consider of, whether commendable or discommendable. The thing therefore that we must inquire into is this, what manner of soul Socrates had, whether his disposition was such, as that all that he stood upon and sought after in this world was barely this, that he might ever carry himself justly towards men and holily towards the gods neither vexing himself to no purpose at the wickedness of others, nor yet ever condescending to any man's evil fact or evil intentions through either fear 
or engagement of friendship, whether of those things that happened unto him by God's appointment. He neither did wonder at any when it did happen, or thought it intolerable in the trial of it. And lastly, whether he never did suffer his mind to sympathize with the senses and affections of the body. For we must not think that nature hath so mixed and tempered it with the body, as that she hath not power to circumscribe herself, and by herself to intend her own ends and occasions. 38. For it is a thing very possible that a man should be a very divine man, and yet be altogether unknown. This thou must ever be mindful of, as of this also, that a man's true happiness doth consist in very few things, and that although thou dost despair, that thou shalt ever be a good, either logician or naturalist, yet thou art never the further off by it from being either liberal or modest or charitable or obedient unto God. 39. Free from all compulsion, in all cheerfulness and alacrity thou mayest run out thy time, though men should exclaim against thee never so much, and the wild beasts should pull in sunder the poor members of thy pampered mass of flesh. For what in either of these or the like cases should hinder the mind to retain her own rest and tranquility, consisting both in the right judgment of those things that happen unto her, and in the ready use of all present matters and occasions, so that her judgment may say, to that which is befallen her by way of cross, this thou art in very deed, and according to thy true nature, notwithstanding that in the judgment of opinion thou dost appear otherwise, and her discretion to the present object, thou art that which I sought for. For whatsoever it be that is now present shall ever be embraced by me as a fit and seasonable object, both for my reasonable faculty and for my sociable or charitable inclination to work upon. And that which is principal in this matter is that it may be referred either unto the praise of God or to the good of men. For either unto God or man, whatsoever it is that doth happen in the world, hath in the ordinary course of nature its proper reference. Neither is there anything that in regard of nature is either new or reluctant and intractable, but all things both usual and easy. 40. Then hath a man attained to the estate of perfection in his life and conversation, when he so spends every day, as if it were his last day, never hot and vehement in his affections, nor yet so cold and stupid as one that had no sense, and free from all manner of dissimulation. 41. Can the gods who are immortal for the continuance of so many ages bear without indignation with such and so many sinners as have ever been, yea, not only so, but also take such care for them that they want nothing. And dost thou so grievously take on as one that could bear with them no longer, thou that art but for a moment of time? Yea, thou that art one of those sinners thyself? A very ridiculous thing it is, that any man should dispense with vice and wickedness in himself, which is in his power to restrain, and should go about to suppress it in others, which is altogether impossible. 42. What object soever our reasonable and sociable faculty doth meet with, that affords nothing either for the satisfaction of reason or for the practice of charity, she worthily doth think unworthy of herself. 43. When thou hast done well, and another is benefited by thy action, must thou like a very fool look for a third thing besides, as that it may appear unto others also that thou hast done well, or that thou mayest in time receive one good turn for another. No man useth to be weary of that which is beneficial unto him, but every action according to nature is beneficial. Be not weary then of doing that which is beneficial unto thee, whilst it is so unto others. 44. The nature of the universe did once certainly before it was created. Whatsoever it hath done since, deliberate and so resolve upon the creation of the world. Now since that time, whatsoever it is, that is and happens in the world, is either but a consequent of that one and first deliberation, or if so be that this ruling rational part of the world 
takes any thought and care of things particular, they are surely his reasonable and principal creatures that are the proper object of his particular care and providence. This often thought upon will much conduce to thy tranquility. The Eighth Book 1. This also, among other things, may serve to keep thee from vain glory, if thou shalt consider that thou art now altogether incapable of the commendation of one who all his life long, or from his youth at least, hath lived a philosopher's life. For both unto others, and to thyself especially, it is well known that thou hast done many things contrary to that perfection of life. Thou hast therefore been confounded in thy course, and henceforth it will be hard for thee to recover the title and credit of a philosopher. And to it also is thy calling and profession repugnant. If therefore thou dost truly understand what it is that is of moment indeed, as for thy fame and credit, take no thought or care for that. Let it suffice thee if all the rest of thy life, be it more or less, thou shalt live as thy nature requireth, or according to the true and natural end of thy making. Take pains, therefore, to know what it is that thy nature requireth, and let nothing else distract thee. Thou hast already had sufficient experience, that of those many things that hitherto thou hast erred and wandered about, thou couldst not find happiness in any of them, not in syllogisms and logical subtleties, not in wealth, not in honor and reputation, not in pleasure, in none of all these. Wherein, then, is it to be found? in the practice of those things which the nature of man, as he is a man, doth require. How then shall he do those things, if his dogmata, or moral tenets and opinions, from which all motions and actions do proceed, be right and true? Which be those dogmata, those that concern that which is good or evil, as that there is nothing truly good and beneficial unto man, but that which makes him just, temperate, courageous, liberal, and that there is nothing truly evil and hurtful unto man, but that which causeth the contrary effects. 2. Upon every action that thou art about, put this question to thyself, how will this, when it is done, agree with me? Shall I have no occasion to repent of it? Yet a very little while, and I am dead and gone, and all things are at end. What then do I care for more than this, that my present action, whatsoever it be, may be the proper action of one that is reasonable, whose end is the common good, who in all things is ruled and governed by the same law of right and reason by which God himself is. 3. Alexander, Caius, Pompeius. What are these to Diogenes, Heraclitus, and Socrates? These penetrated into the true nature of things, into all causes and all subjects, and upon these did they exercise their power and authority. But as for those, as the extent of their error was, so far did their slavery extend. For what they have done they will still do, although thou shouldst hang thyself. First, let it not trouble thee, for all things both good and evil come to pass according to the nature and general condition of the universe, and within a very little while all things will be at an end no man will be remembered. As now of Africanus, for example, and Augustus, it is already come to pass. Then secondly, fix thy mind upon the thing itself, look into it, and remembering thyself, that thou art bound nevertheless to be a good man, and what it is that thy nature requireth of thee as thou art a man, be not diverted from what thou art about, and speak that which seemeth unto thee most just, only speak it kindly, modestly, and without hypocrisy. 5. That which the nature of the universe doth busy herself about is, that which is here, to transfer it thither, to change it, and thence again to take it away, and to carry it to another place, so that thou needest not fear any new thing. For all things are usual and ordinary, and all things are disposed by equality. 6. Every particular nature hath content, when in its own proper course it speeds. A reasonable nature doth then speed, when first in matter of fancies and imaginations, it gives no consent to that which is either false uncertain. Secondly, 
when in all its motions and resolutions it takes its level at the common good only, and that it desireth nothing and flieth from nothing, bet what is in its own power to compass or avoid. And lastly, when it willingly and gladly embraceth whatsoever is dealt and appointed unto it by the common nature, for it is part of it, even as the nature of any one leaf is part of the common nature of all plants and trees. But that the nature of a leaf is part of a nature both unreasonable and unsensible, and which in its proper end may be hindered, or which is servile and slavish, whereas the nature of man is part of a common nature which cannot be hindered, and which is both reasonable and just. From whence also it is that according to the worth of everything, she doth make such equal distribution of all things, as of duration, substance form, operation, and of events and accidents. But herein consider not whether thou shalt find this equality in everything absolutely and by itself, but whether in all the particulars of some one thing taken together, and compared with all the particulars of some other thing, and them together likewise. 7. Thou hast no time nor opportunity to read. What then? Hast thou not time and opportunity to exercise thyself, not to wrong thyself, to strive against all carnal pleasures and pains, and to get the upper hand of them, to contemn honor and vainglory, and not only, not to be angry with them, whom towards thee thou doest find unsensible and unthankful, but also to have a care of them still, and of their welfare. 8. Forbear henceforth to complain of the trouble of a courtly life, either in public before others, or in private by thyself. 9. Repentance is an inward and self-reprehension for the neglect or omission of somewhat that was profitable. Now whatsoever is good is also profitable, and it is the part of an honest virtuous man to set by it, and to make reckoning of it accordingly. But never did any honest virtuous man repent of the neglect or omission of any carnal pleasure. No carnal pleasure then is either good or profitable. 10. This, what is it in itself, and by itself, according to its proper constitution? What is the substance of it? What is the matter or proper use? What is the form or efficient cause? What is it for in this world, and how long will it abide? Thus must thou examine all things that present themselves unto thee. 11. When thou art hard to be stirred up and awaked out of thy sleep, admonish thyself and call to mind that to perform actions tending to the common good is that which thine own proper constitution and that which the nature of man do require. But to sleep is common to unreasonable creatures also. And what more proper and natural Yea, what more kind and pleasing than that which is according to nature? 12. As every fancy and imagination presents itself unto thee, consider, if it be possible, the true nature and the proper qualities of it, and reason with thyself about it. 13. At thy first encounter with anyone, say presently to thyself, This man, what are his opinions concerning that which is good or evil? as concerning pain, pleasure, and the causes of both, concerning honor and dishonor, concerning life and death, thus and thus. Now, if it be no wonder that a man should have such and such opinions, how can it be a wonder that he should do such and such things? I will remember then that he cannot but do as he doth, holding those opinions that he doth. Remember that as it is a shame for any man to wonder that a fig tree should bear figs, so also to wonder that the world should bear anything, whatsoever it is, which in the ordinary course of nature it may bear. To a physician also and to a pilot it is a shame either for the one to wonder that such and such a one should have an egg, or for the other that the winds should prove contrary. 14. Remember that to change thy mind upon occasion and to follow him that is able to rectify thee is equally ingenuous as to find out at the first what is right and just, without help. For of thee nothing is required, Tai, is beyond the extent of thine own deliberation and jun, merit, and of thine own understanding. 15. If it were thine act, and in thine own power, wouldest thou do it? 
If it were not, whom does Tin accuse? The atoms or the gods? For to do either the part of a mad man, thou must therefore blame nobody, but if it be in thy power, redress what is amiss. If it be not, to what end is it to complain? For nothing should be done but to some certain end. 16. Whatsoever dieth and falleth, however, and wheresoever it die and fall, it cannot fall out of the world. Here it have its abode and change. Here also shall it have its dissolution into its proper elements. The same are the world's elements, and the elements of which thou dost consist. And they, when they are changed, they murmur not. Why shouldest thou? 17. Whatsoever is was made for something, as a horse, a vine. Why wonderest thou? The sun itself will say of itself, I was made for something, and so hath every god its proper function. What then were then made for? To disport and delight thyself? See how even common sense and reason cannot brook it. 18. Nature hath its end as well in the end and final consummation of anything that is, as in the begin nine and continuation of it. 19. As one that tosseth up a ball, and what is a ball the better, if the motion of it be upwards, or the worse if it be downwards, or if it chance to fall upon the ground, so for the bubble, if it continue, what it the better, and if it dissolve, what is it the worse, and so is it of a candle too. And so must thou reason with thyself, both in matter of fame and in matter of death. For as for the body itself, the subject of death, wouldest thou know the vileness of it? Turn it about that thou mayest behold it the worst sides upwards as well, as in its more ordinary pleasant shape. How doth it look when it is old and withered, when sick and pained, when in the act of lust and fornication? And as for fame, this life is short. Both he that praiseth and he that is praised, he that remembers and he that is remembered, will soon be dust and ashes. Besides, it is but in one corner of this part of the world that thou art praised, and yet in this corner thou hast not the joint praises of all men, no, nor scarce of any one constantly, and yet the whole earth itself, what is it but as one point in regard of the whole world? 20. That which must be the subject of thy consideration is either the matter itself, or the dogma, or the operation, or the true sense and signification. 21. Most justly have these things happened unto thee. Why dost not thou amend? Oh, but thou hadst rather become good tomorrow than to be so today. 22. Shall I do it? I will. So the end of my action be to do good unto men. Doth anything by way of cross or adversity happen unto me? I accept it with reference unto the gods and their providence, the fountain of all things, from which whatsoever comes to pass doth hang and depend. 23. By one action judge of the rest, this bathing which usually takes up so much of our time. What is it? Oil, sweat, filth, or the swords of the body, an excrementitious viscosity, the excrements of oil and other ointments used about the body, and mixed with the swords of the body, all base and loathsome. And such almost is every part of our life, and every worldly object. 24. Lucilla buried Verus, then was Lucilla herself buried by others. So Secunda Maximus, then Secunda herself. So Epitynchanus Diotimus, then Epitynchanus himself. So Antoninus Pius, Faustina his wife, then Antoninus himself. This is the course of the world. First sailor, Adrianus, then Adrianus himself, and those austere ones, those that foretold other men's deaths, those that were so proud and stately, where are they now? Those austere ones, I mean such as were Carax, and Demetrius the Platonic, and Eudaemon, and others like unto those. They were all but for one day, all dead and gone long since, some of them no sooner dead than forgotten, others soon turned into fables. Of others, even that which was fabulous, is now long since forgotten. This thereafter thou must remember, that whatsoever thou art compounded of, shall soon be dispersed, and that thy life and breath, or thy soul, shall either be no more, or shall ranslated, spee, and appointed to some certain place and station, 
25. The true joy of a man is to do that which properly belongs unto a man. That which is most proper unto a man is, first, to be kindly affected towards them that are of the same kind and nature as he is himself, to contemn all sensual motions and appetites, to discern rightly all plausible fancies and imaginations, to contemplate the nature of the universe, both it and things that are done in it, in which kind of contemplation three several relations are to be observed, the first to the apparent secondary cause, the second to the first original cause, God, from whom originally proceeds whatsoever doth happen in the world, the third and last to them that we live and converse with, what use may be made of it to their use and benefit. 26. If pain be an evil, either it is in regard of the body, and that cannot be, because the body of itself is altogether insensible, or in regard of the soul, but it is in the power of the soul to preserve her own peace and tranquility, and not to suppose that pain is evil, for all judgment and deliberation, all prosecution or avasation is from within, whither the sense of evil, except it be let in by opinion, cannot penetrate. 27. Wipe off all idle fancies, and say unto thyself incessantly, Now if I will, it is in my power to keep out of this my soul all wickedness, all lust and concupiscences, all trouble and confusion. But on the contrary to behold, and consider all things according to their true nature, and to carry myself towards everything according to its true worth. Remember then, this thy power that nature hath given thee. 28. Whether thou speak in the Senate, or whether thou speak to any particular, let thy speech in always grave and modest. But thou must not openly and vulgarly observe that sound and exact form of speaking, concerning that which is truly good and truly civil, the vanity of the world and of worldly men, which otherwise truth and reason doth prescribe. 29. Augustus is court, his wife, his daughter, his nephews, his sons-in-law, his sister, Agrippa, his kinsmen, his domestics, his friends, Arius, Emodras, Sinas, his slayers of beasts for sacrifice and divination. There thou hast the death of a whole court together. Proceed now unto the rest that have been since that of Augustus. Hath death dwelt with them otherwise, though so many and so stately whilst they lived, than it doth use to deal with any one particular man? Consider now the death of a whole kindred and family, as of that of the Pompeys, as that also that useth to be written upon some monuments, he was the last of his own kindred. Oh, what care did his predecessors take, that they might leave a successor, yet behold at last one or other must of necessity be the last. Here again, therefore, consider the death of a whole kindred. 30. Contract thy whole life to the measure and proportion of one single action. And if in every particular action thou dost perform what is fitting to the utmost of thy power, let it suffice thee. And who can hinder thee, but that thou mayest perform what is fitting? But there may be some outward let and impediment. Not any that can hinder thee, but that whatsoever thou dost, thou may do it, justly, temperately, and with the praise of God. Yea, but there may be somewhat, whereby some operation or other of thine may be hindered, and then with that very thing that doth hinder, thou mayest he well pleased. And so by this gentle and equanimous conversion of thy mind unto that which may be, instead of that which at first thou didst intend, in the room of that former action there succeedeth another, which agrees as well with this contraction of thy life that we now speak of. 31. Receive temporal blessings without ostentation, when they are sent, and thou shalt be able to part with them with all readiness and facility, when they are taken from thee again. If ever thou sawest either a hand or a foot or a head lying by itself, in some place or other, as cut off from the rest of the body, such must thou conceive him to make himself, as much as in him lieth, that either is offended with anything that has happened, whatsoever it be, and as it were divides himself from it, or that commits anything against the natural law of mutual correspondence and society among men, 
or he that commits any act of uncharitableness. Whosoever thou art, thou art such, thou art cast forth, I know not whither out of the general unity, which is according to nature. Thou went born indeed apart, but now thou hast cut thyself off. However, herein is matter of joy and exultation, that thou mayst be united again. God hath not granted it unto any other part, that once separated and cut off, it might be reunited and come together again. But behold, that goodness, how great and immense it is, which hath so much esteemed man, as at first he was so made, that he needed not, except he would himself, have divided himself from the whole. So once divided and cut off, it hath so provided and ordered it, that if he would himself he might return and grow together again, and be admitted into its former rank and place of a part, as he was before. 33. As almost all her other faculties and properties the nature of the universe hath imparted unto every reasonable creature, so this in particular we have received from her, that as whatsoever doth oppose itself unto her, and doth withstand her in her purposes and intentions, she doth, though against its will and intention, bring it about to herself, to serve herself of it, in the execution of her own destinated ends, and so by this though not intended cooperation of it, with herself makes it part of herself whether it will or no. So may every reasonable creature, what crosses and impediments soever it meets with in the course of this mortal life, it may use them as fit and proper objects, to the furtherance of whatsoever it intended and absolutely proposed unto itself as its natural end and happiness. 34. Let not the general representation unto thyself of the wretchedness of this our mortal life trouble thee. Let not thy mind wander up and down and heap together in her thoughts the many troubles and grievous calamities which thou art as subject unto as any other. But as everything in particular doth happen, put this question unto thyself and say, what is it that in this present matter seems unto thee so intolerable? For thou wilt be ashamed to confess it. Then upon this presently call to mind, that neither that which is future, nor that which is past can hurt thee, but that only which is present, and that also is much lessened, if thou dost lightly circumscribe it. And then check thy mind, if for so little a while, a mere instant, it cannot hold out with patience. 35. What? Are either Panthea or Pergamus abiding to this day by their master's tombs? Or either Chabrias or Diotimus by that of Adrianus? O oh, foolery! For what if they did? Would their masters be sensible of it? Or if sensible, would they be glad of it? Or if glad, were these immortal? Was not it appointed unto them also, both men and women, to become old in time, and then to die? And these once dead, what would become of these former? And when all is done, what is all this for, but for a mere bag of blood and corruption? 36. If thou beest quick-sighted, be so in matter of judgment, and best discretion, saith he. 37. In the whole constitution of man, I see not any virtue contrary to justice, whereby it may be resisted and opposed, but one whereby pleasure and voluptuousness may be resisted and opposed. I see, continence, 38. If thou canst but withdraw conceit and opinion concerning that which may seem hurtful and offensive, thou thyself art as safe as safe may be. Thou thyself, and who is that? Thy reason. Yea, but I am not reason. Well, be it so. However, let not thy reason or understanding admit of grief. And if there be anything in thee that is grieved, let that whatsoever it be, conceive its own grief, if it can. 39. That which is a hindrance of the senses is an evil to the sensitive nature. That which is a hindrance of the appetitive and persecutive faculty is an evil to the sensitive nature. As of the sensitive, so of the vegetative constitution, whatsoever is a hindrance unto it is also in that respect an evil unto the same. And so likewise, Whatsoever is a hindrance unto the mind and understanding must needs be the proper evil of the reasonable nature. Now apply all those things unto thyself, 
do either pain or pleasure seize on thee? Let the senses look to that. Hast thou met with some obstacle or other in thy purpose and intention? If thou didst propose without due reservation and exception, now hath thy reasonable part received a blow indeed. But if in general thou didst propose unto thyself whatsoever might be, thou art not thereby either hurt nor properly hindered. For in those things that properly belong unto the mind, she cannot be hindered by any man. It is not fire, nor iron, nor the power of a tyrant, nor the power of a slandering tongue, nor anything else that can penetrate into her. 40. If once round and solid, there is no fear that ever it will change. 41. Why should I grieve myself, who never did willingly grieve any other? One thing rejoices one, and another thing another. As for me, this is my joy, if my understanding be right and sound, as neither averse from any man, nor refusing any of those things which as a man I am subject unto. If I can look upon all things in the world meekly and kindly, accept all things and carry myself towards everything according to the true worth of the thing itself. 42. This time that is now present bestow thou upon thyself. They that rather hunt for fame after death do not consider that those men that shall be hereafter will be even such as these whom now they can so hardly bear with. And besides, they also will be mortal men. But to consider the thing in itself, if so many with so many voices shall make such and such a sound, or shall have such and such an opinion concerning thee, what is it to thee? 43. Take me and throw me where thou wilt. I am indifferent. For there also I shall have that spirit which is within me propitious, that is well pleased and fully contented both in that constant disposition and with those particular actions which to its own proper constitution are suitable and agreeable. 44. Is this then a thing of that worth, that for it my soul should suffer and become worse than it was, as either basely dejected or disordinately affected or confounded within itself, or terrified. What can there be that thou shouldest so much esteem? 45. Nothing can happen unto thee which is not incidental unto thee, as thou art a man, as nothing can happen either to an ox, a vine, or to a stone, which is not incidental unto them, unto everyone in his own kind. If therefore nothing can happen unto anything which is not both usual and natural, why art thou displeased? Sure, the common nature of all would not bring anything upon any that were intolerable. If therefore it be a thing external that causes thy grief, know that it is not that properly that doth cause it, but thine own conceit and opinion concerning the thing, which thou mayest rid thyself of when thou wilt. But if it be somewhat that is amiss in thine own disposition that doth grieve thee, mayest thou not rectify thy moral tenets and opinions. But if it grieve thee that thou doest not perform that which seemeth unto thee right and just, why doest not thou choose rather to perform it than to grieve? But somewhat that is stronger than thyself doth hinder thee. Let it not grieve thee then, if it be not thy fault that the thing is not performed. Yea, but it is a thing of that nature, as that thy life is not worth the while, except it may be performed. If it be so, upon condition that thou be kindly and lovingly disposed towards all men, thou mayest be gone. For even then, as much as at any time, art thou in a very good estate of performance, when thou doest die in charity with those that are an obstacle unto thy performance. 46. Remember that thy mind is of that nature as that it becometh altogether unconquerable. When once recollected in herself, she seeks no other content than this, that she cannot be forced, yea, though it so fall out, that it be even against reason itself, that it cloth bandy. How much less when by the help of reason she is able to judge of things with discretion. And therefore let thy chief fort and place of defense be a mind free from passions, a stronger place, 
whereunto to make his refuge, and so to become impregnable, and better fortified than this hath no man. He that seeth not this is unlearned. He that seeth it and betaketh not himself to this place of refuge is unhappy. 47. Keep thyself to the first bare and naked apprehensions of things, as they present themselves unto thee, and add not unto them. It is reported unto thee that such a one speaketh ill of thee. Well, that he speaketh ill of thee, so much is reported. But that thou art hurt thereby is not reported. That is the addition of opinion, which thou must exclude. I see that my child is sick. That he is sick, I see. But that he is in danger of his life also, I see it not. Thus thou must use to keep thyself to the first motions and apprehensions of things, as they present themselves outwardly, and add not unto them from within thyself through mere conceit and opinion, or rather add unto them, hot as one that understandeth the true nature of all things that happen in the world. 48. Is the cucumber bitter? Set it away. Brambles are in the way? Avoid them. Let this suffice. Add not presently speaking unto thyself, what serve these things for in the world? For this, one that is acquainted with the mysteries of nature, will laugh at thee for it. As a carpenter would or a shoemaker, if meeting in either of their shops with some shavings or small remnants of their work, thou shouldest blame them for it. And yet those men, it is not for want of a place where to throw them that they keep them in their shops for a while. But the nature of the universe hath no such out place. But herein doth consist the wonder of her art and skill, that she, having once circumscribed herself within some certain bounds and limits, whatsoever is within her that seems either corrupted or old or unprofitable, she can change it into herself, and of these very things can make new things, so that she needeth not to seek elsewhere out of herself, either for a new supply of matter and substance, or for a place where to throw out whatsoever is irrecoverably putrid and corrupt. Thus she, as for place, so for matter and art, is herself sufficient unto herself. 49. Not to be slack and negligent, or loose and wanton in thy actions, nor contentious and troublesome in thy conversation, nor to rove and wander in thy fancies and imaginations, not basely to contract thy soul, nor boisterously to sally out with it, or furiously to launch out as it were, nor ever to want employment. Fifteen, and they kill me, they cut my flesh, they persecute my person with curses. What then? May not thy mind for all this continue pure, prudent, temperate, just, as a fountain of sweet and clear water, though she be cursed by some stander by, yet do her springs nevertheless still run as sweet and clear as before? Yea, though either dirt or dung be thrown in, yet is it no sooner thrown than dispersed, and she cleared. She cannot be dyed or infected by it. What then must I do, that I may have within myself an overflowing fountain and not a well? Beget thyself by continual pains and endeavors to true liberty with charity and true simplicity and modesty. 51. He that knoweth not what the world is, knoweth not where he himself is. And he that knoweth not what the world was made for, cannot possibly know either what are the qualities, or what is the nature of the world. Now he that in either of these is to seek, for what he himself was made is ignorant also. What then dost thou think of that man, who proposeth unto himself, as a matter of great moment, the noise and applause of men, who both where they are, and what they are themselves, are altogether ignorant? Dost thou desire to be commended of that man, who thrice in one hour perchance doth himself curse himself? Dost thou desire to please him, who pleaseth not himself? Or dost thou think that he pleaseth himself, who doth use to repent himself almost of everything that he doth? 52. Not only now henceforth to have a common breath, or to hold correspondency of breath with that air that compasseth us about, but to have a common mind or to hold correspondency of mind also with that rational substance which compasseth all things. For that also is of itself and of its own nature, if a man can but draw it in as he should, 
everywhere diffused, and passeth through all things, no less than the air doth, if a man can but suck it in. 53. Wickedness in general doth not hurt the world, particular wickedness doth not hurt any other, only unto him it is hurtful, whosoever he be that offends, unto whom in great favor and mercy it is granted, that whensoever he himself shall but first desire it, he may be presently delivered of it. Unto my free will, my neighbor's free will, whoever he be, as his life or his bode, is altogether indifferent. For though we are all made one for another, yet have our minds and understandings each of them their own proper and limited jurisdiction. For else another man's wickedness might be my evil, which God would not have, that it might not be in another man's power to make me unhappy, which nothing now can do but mine own wickedness. 54. The sun seemeth to be shed abroad, and indeed it is diffused but not effused, for that diffusion of it is a tasis or an extension, for therefore are the beams of it called actines from the word actiniste, to be stretched out and extended. Now what a sunbeam is, thou mayest know if thou observe the light of the sun, when through some narrow hole it pierceth into some room that is dark, for it is always in a direct line, and as by any solid body, that it meets with in the way that is not penetrable by air, it is divided and abrupted, and yet neither slides off, or falls down, but stayeth there nevertheless. Such must the diffusion in the mind be, not an effusion, but an extension. What obstacles and impediments soever she meeteth within her way, she must not violently, and by way of an impetuous onset light upon them. Neither must she fall down, but she must stand and give light unto that which doth admit of it. For as for that which doth not, it is its own fault and loss if it bereave itself of her light. 55. He that feareth death, either feareth that he shall have no sense at all, or that his senses will not be the same. Whereas he should rather comfort himself, that either no sense at all, and so no sense of evil, or if any sense, then another life, and so no death properly. 56. All men are made one for another. Either then teach them better, or bear with them. 57. The motion of the mind is not as the motion of a dart. For the mind, when it is wary and cautelous, and by way of diligent circumspection turneth herself many ways, may then as well be said to go straight on to the object, as when it useth no such circumspection. 58. To pierce and penetrate into the estate of everyone's understanding that thou hast to do with, as also to make the estate of thine own open and penetrable to any other. The Ninth Book 1. He that is unjust is also impious. For the nature of the universe, having made all reasonable creatures one for another, to the end that they should do one another good, more or less according to the several persons and occasions but in no wise hurt one another, it is manifest that he that doth transgress against this her will is guilty of impiety towards the most ancient and venerable of all the deities. For the nature of the universe is the nature the common parent of all, and therefore piously to be observed of all things that are, and that which now is, to whatsoever first was, and gave it its being, hath relation of blood and kindred. She is also called truth, and is the first cause of all truths. He therefore that willingly and wittingly doth lie, is impious in that he doth receive, and so commit injustice, but he that against his will, in that he disagreeth from the nature of the universe, and in that striving with the nature of the world, he doth in his particular violate the general order of the world. For he doth no better than strive and war against it, who contrary to his own nature, applieth himself to that which is contrary to truth. For nature had before furnished him with instincts and opportunities sufficient for the attainment of it, which he having hitherto neglected, is not now able to discern that which is false from that which is true. He also that pursues after pleasures, as that which is truly good and flies from pains, as that which is truly evil, is impious. For such a one must of necessity oftentimes accuse that common nature, 
as distributing many things both unto the evil and unto the good, not according to the deserts of either, as unto the bad oftentimes pleasures and the causes of pleasures, so unto the good, pains, and the occasions of pains. Again, he that feareth pains and crosses in this world, feareth some of those things which some time or other must needs happen in the world, and that we have already showed to be impious. And he that pursueth after pleasures will not spare, to compass his desires, to do that which is unjust, and that is manifestly impious. Now those things which unto nature are equally indifferent, for she had not created both, both pain and pleasure, if both had not been unto her equally indifferent. They that will live according to nature must in those things, as being of the same mind and disposition that she is, be as equally indifferent. Whosoever therefore in either matter of pleasure and pain, death and life, honor and dishonor, which things nature in the administration of the world indifferently doth make use of, is not as indifferent, it is apparent that he is impious. When I say that common nature doth indifferently make use of them, my meaning is that they happen indifferently in the ordinary course of things, which by a necessary consequence, whether as principal or accessory, come to pass in the world, according to that first and ancient deliberation of providence by which she from some certain beginning did resolve upon the creation of such a world, conceiving then in her womb, as it were, some certain rational generative seeds and faculties of things future, whether subjects, changes, successions, both such and such, and just so many, too. It were indeed more happy and comfortable for a man to depart out of this world, having lived all his life long clear from all falsehood, dissimulation, voluptuousness, and pride. But if this cannot be, yet it is some comfort for a man joyfully to depart as weary, and out of love with those, rather than to desire to live, and to continue long in those wicked courses. Hath not yet experience taught thee to fly from the plague? For a far greater plague is the corruption of the mind than any certain change and distemper of the common air can be. This is a plague of creatures as they are living creatures, but that of men as they are men or reasonable. 3. Thou must not, in matter of death, carry thyself scornfully, but as one that is well pleased with it, as being one of those things that nature hath appointed. For what thou dost conceive of these, of a boy to become a young man, to wax old, to grow, to ripen, to get teeth, or a beard, or gray hairs to beget, to bear, or to be delivered, or what other action soever it be, that is natural unto man according to the several seasons of his life. Such a thing is it also to be dissolved. It is therefore the part of a wise man, in matter of death, not in any wise to carry himself either violently or proudly, but patiently to wait for it, as one of nature's operations, that with the same mind as now thou dost expect when that which yet is but an embryo in thy wife's belly shall come forth. Thou mayst expect also when thy soul shall fall off from that outward coat or skin, wherein as a child in the belly it lieth involved and shut up. But thou desirest a more popular, and though not so direct and philosophical, yet a very powerful and penetrative recipe against the fear of death. Nothing can make thee more willing to part with thy life than if thou shalt consider both what the subjects themselves are that thou shalt part with, and what manner of disposition thou shalt no more have to do with. True it is, that offended with them thou must not be by no means, but take care of them, and meekly bear with them. However, this thou mayst remember, that whensoever it happens that thou depart, it shall not be from men that held the same opinions that thou dost. For that indeed, if it were so, is the only thing that might make thee averse from death, and willing to continue here, if it were thy hap to live with men that had obtained the same belief that thou hast. But now, what a toil it is for thee to live with men of different opinions thou seest, so that thou hast rather occasion to say, Hasten, I thee pray, O death, lest I also in time forget myself. For he that sinneth, sinneth unto himself. He that is unjust hurts himself. 
in that he makes himself worse than he was before. Not he only that committeth, but he also that omitteth something, is oftentimes unjust. 5. If my present apprehension of the object be right, and my present action charitable, and this, towards whatsoever doth proceed from God, be my present disposition, to be well pleased with it, it sufficeth. 6. To wipe away fancy, to use deliberation, to quench concupiscence, to keep the mind free to herself. 7. Of all unreasonable creatures, there is but one unreasonable soul, and of all that are reasonable, but one reasonable soul divided betwixt them all. As of all earthly things, there is but one earth, and but one light that we see by, and but one air that we breathe in, as many as either breathe or see. Now whatsoever partakes of some common thing, naturally affects and inclines unto that whereof it is part, being of one kind and nature with it. Whatsoever is earthly, presseth downwards to the common earth. Whatsoever is liquid, would flow together, and whatsoever is airy, would be together likewise, so that without some obstacle and some kind of violence they cannot well be kept asunder. Whatsoever is fiery doth not only by reason of the elementary fire tend upwards, but here also is so ready to join and to burn together that whatsoever doth want sufficient moisture to make resistance is easily set on fire. Whatsoever therefore is partaker of that reasonable common nature naturally doth as much and more long after his own kind. For by how much in its own nature it excels all other things, by so much more is it desirous to be joined and united unto that which is of its own nature. As for unreasonable creatures then, they had not long been, but presently begun among them swarms and flocks and broods of young ones and a kind of mutual love and affection. For though but unreasonable, yet a kind of soul these had, and therefore was that natural desire of union more strong and intense in them, as in creatures of a more excellent nature, than either in plants, or stones, or trees. But among reasonable creatures, begun commonwealths, friendships, families, public meetings, and even in their wars, conventions, and truces. Now among them that were yet of a more excellent nature, as the stars and planets, though by their nature far distant one from another, yet even among them began some mutual correspondency and unity. So proper is it to excellency in a high degree to affect unity, as that even in things so far distant it could operate unto a mutual sympathy. But now behold what is now come to pass. Those creatures that are reasonable are now the only creatures that have forgotten their natural affection and inclination of one towards another. Among them alone of all other things that are of one kind, there is not to be found a general disposition to flow together. But though they fly from nature, yet are they stopped in their course and apprehended. Do they what they can, nature doth prevail, and so shalt thou confess if thou dost observe it. For sooner mayest thou find a thing earthly, where no earthly thing is, than find a man that naturally can live by himself alone. 8. Man, God, the world, everyone in their kind bear some fruits. All things have their proper time to bear, though by custom the word itself is in a manner become proper unto the vine, and the like, yet is it so nevertheless, as we have said. As for reason, that beareth both common fruit for the use of others, and peculiar, which itself doth enjoy. Reason is of a diffusive nature, what itself is in itself. It begets in others, and so doth multiply. 9. Either teach them better if it be in thy power, or if it be not, remember that for this use, to bear with them patiently, was mildness and goodness granted unto thee. The gods themselves are good unto such, yea, and in some things, as in matter of health, of wealth, of honour, are content often to further their endeavours, so good and gracious are they. And mightest thou not be so too, or tell me what doth hinder thee? 10. Labour not as one to whom it is appointed to be wretched, nor as one that either would be pitied or admired, 
but let this be thine only care and desire, so always and in all things to prosecute or to forbear, as the law of charity or mutual society doth require. 11. This day I did come out of all my trouble. Nay, I have cast out all my trouble. It should rather be for that which troubled thee, whatsoever it was, was not without anywhere that thou shouldest come out of it, but within in thine own opinions, from whence it must be cast out, before thou canst truly and constantly be at ease. 12. All those things for matter of experience are usual and ordinary, for their continuance but for a day, and for their matter most base and filthy. As they were in the days of those whom we have buried, so are they now also, and no otherwise. 13. The things themselves that affect us, they stand without doors, neither knowing anything themselves, nor able to utter anything unto others concerning themselves. What then is it that passeth verdict on them? The understanding. 14. As virtue and wickedness consist not in passion, but in action, so neither doth the true good or evil of a reasonable charitable man consist in passion, but in operation and action. 15. To the stone that is cast up, when it comes down it is no hurt unto it, as neither benefit when it doth ascend. 16. Sift their minds and understandings, and behold what men they be, whom thou dost stand in fear of what they shall judge of thee, what they themselves judge of themselves. 17. All things that are in the world are always in the estate of alteration. Thou also art in a perpetual change, yea, and under corruption too, in some part, and so is the whole world. 18. It is not thine but another man's sin. Why should it trouble thee? Let him look to it whose sin it is. 19. Of an operation and of a purpose there is an ending, or of an action and of a purpose we say commonly that it is at an end. From opinion also there is an absolute cessation, which is, as it were, the death of it. In all this there is no hurt. Apply this now to a man's age as first a child, then a youth, then a young man, then an old man, Every change from one age to another is a kind of death, and all this while here no matter of grief yet. Pass now unto that life first, that which thou livedest under thy grandfather, then under thy mother, then under thy father. And thus, when through the whole course of thy life hitherto thou hast found and observed many alterations, many changes, many kinds of endings and cessations, put this question to thyself. What matter of grief or sorrow dost thou find in any of these? Or what dost thou suffer through any of these? If in none of these, then neither in the ending and consummation of thy whole life, which is also but a cessation and change. 20. As occasion shall require, either to thine own understanding, or to that of the universe, or to his, whom thou hast now to do with, let thy refuge be with all speed to thine own, that it resolve upon nothing against justice, to that of the universe, that thou mayest remember, part of whom thou art, of his, that thou mayest consider whether in the estate of ignorance, or of knowledge, and then also must thou call to mind, that he is thy kinsman, twenty-one, as thou thyself, whoever thou art, were made for the perfection and consummation, being a member of it, of a common society, so must every action of thine tend to the perfection and consummation of a life that is truly sociable. What action soever of thine therefore that either immediately or afar off hath not reference to the common good, that is an exorbitant and disorderly action. Yea, it is seditious, as one among the people who from such and such a consent and unity should factiously divide and separate himself. 22. Children's anger, mere babels, wretched souls bearing up dead bodies, that they may not have their fall so soon, even as it is in that common dirge song. 23. Go to the quality of the cause from which the effect doth proceed. Behold it by itself bare and naked, separated from all that is material. 
then consider the utmost bounds of time that that cause, thus and thus qualified, can subsist and abide. 24. Infinite are the troubles and miseries that thou hast already been put to by reason of this only, because that for all happiness it did not suffice thee, or that thou didst not account it sufficient happiness that thy understanding did operate according to its natural constitution. 25. When any shall either impeach thee with false accusations, or hatefully reproach thee, or shall use any such carriage towards thee, get thee presently to their minds and understandings, and look in them, and behold what manner of men they be. Thou shalt see that there is no such occasion why it should trouble thee, what such as they are think of thee. Yet must thou love them still, for by nature they are thy friends and the gods themselves in those things that they seek from them as matters of great moment are well content all manner of ways as by dreams and oracles to help them as well as others. 26. Up and down from one age to another go the ordinary things of the world being still the same and either of everything in particular before it come to pass the mind of the universe doth consider with itself and deliberate and if so then submit for shame unto the determination of such an excellent understanding. Or once for all it did resolve upon all things in general, and since that whatsoever happens, happens by a necessary consequence, and all things indivisibly in a manner and inseparably hold one of another, in some either there is a God and then all is well. Or if all things go by chance and fortune, yet mayest thou use thine own providence in those things that concern thee properly and then art thou well. 27. Within a while the earth shall cover us all, and then she herself shall have her change. And then the course will be from one period of eternity unto another, and so a perpetual eternity. Now can any man that shall consider with himself in his mind the several rollings or successions of so many changes and alterations, and the swiftness of all these rulings, can he otherwise but contemn in his heart and despise all worldly things? The cause of the universe is, as it were, a strong torrent. It carrieth all away. 28. And these your professed politicians, the only true practical philosophers of the world, as they think of themselves, so full of affected gravity, or such professed lovers of virtue and honesty, what wretches be they in very deed? How vile and contemptible in themselves! O oh man, what ado dost thou keep? Do what thy nature doth now require. Resolve upon it if thou mayest, and take no thought whether anybody shall know it or no. Yea, but sayest thou, I must not expect a Plato's commonwealth. If they profit, though never so little, I must be content, and think much even of that little progress. Doth then any of them forsake their former false opinions that I should think they profit? For without a change of opinions, alas, what is all that ostentation but mere wretchedness of slavish minds that groan privately and yet would make a show of obedience to reason and truth? Go to now and tell me of Alexander and Philippus and Demetrius Philarius, whether they understood what the common nature requireth and could rule themselves or no, they know best themselves. But if they kept a life and swaggered, I, God be thanked, am not bound to imitate them. The effect of true philosophy is unaffected simplicity and modesty. Persuade me not to ostentation and vainglory. 29. From some high place as it were to look down, and to behold here flocks and their sacrifices without number, and all kind of navigation, some in a rough and stormy sea, and some in a calm the general differences or different estates of things, some that are now first upon being, the several and mutual relations of those things that are together, and some other things that are at their last, their lives also, who were long ago, and theirs who shall be hereafter, and the present estate and life of those many nations of barbarians that are now in the world, thou must likewise consider in thy mind and how many there be, who never so much as heard of thy name, how many that will soon forget it, 
how many who but even now did commend thee, within a very little while perchance will speak ill of thee, so that neither fame, nor honor, nor anything else that this world doth afford, is worth the while. The sum then of all, whatsoever doth happen unto thee, whereof God is the cause, to accept it contentedly, whatsoever thou doest, whereof thou thyself art the cause, to do it justly, which will be, if both in thy resolution and in thy action, thou have no further end than to do good unto others, as being that, which by thy natural constitution as a man, thou art bound unto. 30. Many of those things that trouble and straiten thee, it is in thy power to cut off, as wholly depending from mere conceit and opinion, and then thou shalt have room enough. 31. To comprehend the whole world together in thy mind, and the whole course of this present age to represent it unto thyself, and to fix thy thoughts upon the sudden change of every particular object. How short the time is from the generation of anything unto the dissolution of the same. But how immense and infinite both that which was before the generation and that which after the generation of it shall be. All things that thou seest will soon be perished, and they that see their corruptions will soon vanish away themselves. He that dieth a hundred years old, and he that dieth young, shall come all to one. 32. What are their minds and understandings, and what the things that they apply themselves unto? What do they love, and what do they hate for? Fancy to thyself the estate of their souls openly to be seen, when they think they hurt them shrewdly, whom they speak ill of, and when they think they do them a very good turn, whom they commend and extol. Oh, how full are they then of conceit and opinion. 33. Loss and corruption is in very deed nothing else but change and alteration, and that is it which the nature of the universe doth most delight in, by which, and according to which, whatsoever is done, is well done. For that was the estate of worldly things from the beginning, and so shall it ever be. Or wouldest thou rather say, that all things in the world have gone ill from the beginning for so many ages, and shall ever go ill? And then among so many deities, could no divine power be found all this while, that could rectify the things of the world? Or is the world, to incessant woes and miseries, forever condemned. 34. How base and putrid every common matter is, water, dust, and from the mixture of these bones and all that loathsome stuff that our bodies do consist of, so subject to be infected and corrupted, and again those other things that are so much prized and admired as marble stones, what are they? But as it were the kernels of the earth, gold and silver, what are they, but as the more gross feces of the earth, thy most royal apparel for matter, it is but as it were the hair of a silly sheep, and for color the very blood of a shellfish. Of this nature are all other things. Thy life itself is some such thing too, a mere exhalation of blood, and it also apt to be changed into some other common thing. 35. Will this querulousness, this murmuring, this complaining and dissembling never be at an end? What then is it that troubleth thee? Doth any new thing happen unto thee? What doest thou so wonder at, at the cause or the matter? Behold, either by itself is either of that weight and moment indeed. And besides these there is not anything. But thy duty towards the gods also, it is time thou shouldst acquit thyself of it with more goodness and simplicity. 36. It is all one to see these things for a hundred of years together, or but for three years. If he have sinned, his is the harm, not mine, but perchance he hath not. 38. Either all things by the providence of reason happen unto every particular as a part of one general body, and then it is against reason that a part should complain of anything that happens for the good of the whole. Or if, according to Epicurus, atoms be the cause of all things, and that life be nothing else but an accidentary confusion of things, and death nothing else but a mere dispersion, and so of all other things. What doest thou trouble thyself for? 39. 
Sayest thou unto that rational part, Thou art dead, corruption hath taken hold on thee? Doth it then also void excrements? Doth it like either oxen or sheep graze or feed, that it also should be mortal as well as the body? 40. Either the gods can do nothing for us at all, or they can still and allay all the distractions and distempers of thy mind. If they can do nothing, why dost thou pray? If they can, why wouldst not thou rather pray that they will grant unto thee that thou mayst neither fear nor lust after any of those worldly things which cause these distractions and distempers of it? Why not rather that thou mayst not at either their absence or presence be grieved and discontented than either that thou mayest obtain them or that thou mayest avoid them? For certainly it must needs be that if the gods can help us in anything, they may in this kind also. But thou wilt say, perchance, in those things the gods have given me my liberty, and it is in mine own power to do what I will. But if thou mayst use this liberty, rather to set thy mind at true liberty, than willfully with baseness and servility of mind to effect those things, which either to compass or to avoid is not in thy power, Wert not thou better? And as for the gods who hath told thee that they may not help us up even in those things that they have put in our own power, whether it be so or no, thou shalt soon perceive, if thou wilt but try thyself and pray. One prayeth that he may compass his desire to lie with such or such a one. Pray thou that thou mayest not lust to lie with her. Another, how he may be rid of such a one. Pray thou that thou mayest so patiently bear with him as that thou have no such need to be rid of him. Another, that he may not lose his child. Pray thou that thou mayst not fear to lose him. To this end and purpose, let all thy prayer be, and see what will be the event. 41. In my sickness, saith Epicurus of himself, my discourses were not concerning the nature of my disease, neither was that to them that came to visit me, the subject of my talk, but in the consideration and contemplation of that, which was of a special weight and moment, was all my time bestowed and spent, and among others in this very thing, how my mind, by a natural and unavoidable sympathy, partaking in some sort with the present indisposition of my body, might nevertheless keep herself free from trouble, and in present possession of her own proper happiness. Neither did I leave the ordering of my body to the physicians altogether to do with me what they would, as though I expected any great matter from them, or as though I thought it a matter of such great consequence by their means to recover my health. For my present estate, methought, liked me very well and gave me good content. Whether therefore in sickness, if thou chance to sicken, or in what other kind of extremity soever, Endeavor thou also to be in thy mind so affected as he doth report of himself, not to depart from thy philosophy for anything that can befall thee, nor to give ear to the discourses of silly people and mere naturalists. 42. It is common to all trades and professions to mind and intend that only, which now they are about, and the instrument whereby they work. 43. When at any time thou art offended with anyone's impudency, put presently this question to thyself. What? Is it then possible that there should not be any impudent men in the world? Certainly it is not possible. Desire not then that which is impossible. For this one thou must think, whosoever he be is one of those impudent ones, that the world cannot be without. So of the subtile and crafty, so of the perfidious, so of every one that offendeth, must thou ever be ready to reason with thyself? For whilst in general thou dost thus reason with thyself, that the kind of them must needs be in the world, thou wilt be the better able to use meekness towards every particular. This also thou shalt find a very good use upon every such occasion, presently to consider with thyself what proper virtue nature hath furnished man with against such a vice, or to encounter with a disposition vicious in this kind. As for example against the unthankful, 
it hath given goodness and meekness as an antidote, and so against another vicious in another kind some other peculiar faculty. And generally, is it not in thy power to instruct him better, that is in an error? For whosoever sinneth doth in that decline from his purposed end, and is certainly deceived. And again, what art thou the worse for his sin? For thou shalt not find that any one of these, against whom thou art incensed, hath in very deed done anything whereby thy mind, the only true subject of thy hurt and evil, can be made worse than it was. And what a matter of either grief or wonder is this, if he that is unlearned do the deeds of one that is unlearned? Should not thou rather blame thyself, who, when upon very good grounds of reason, thou mightst have thought it very probable that such a thing would by such a one be committed, didst not only not foresee it, but moreover dost wonder at it that such a thing should be. But then especially when thou dost find fault with either an unthankful or a false man, must thou reflect upon thyself. For without all question, thou thyself art much in fault. If either of one that were of such a disposition, thou didst expect that he should be true unto thee, or when unto any thou didst a good turn, thou didst not there bound thy thoughts as one that had obtained his end, nor didst not think that from the action itself thou hadst received a full reward of the good that thou hadst done. For what wouldst thou have more? Unto him that is a man, thou hast done a good turn, doth not that suffice thee? What thy nature required that hast thou done, must thou be rewarded for it? As if either the eye for that it seeth, or the feet that they go should require satisfaction. For as these being by nature appointed for such an use, can challenge no more, than that they may work according to their natural constitution. So man being born to do good unto others, whensoever he doth a real good unto any, by helping them out of error, or though but in middle things as in matter of wealth, life, preferment and the like, doth help to further their desires, he doth that for which he was made, and therefore can require no more. The Tenth Book, One. O my soul, the time I trust will be, when thou shalt be good, simple, single, more open and visible, than that body by which it is enclosed. Thou wilt one day be sensible of their happiness, whose end is love, and their affections dead to all worldly things. Thou shalt one day be full, and in want of no external thing, not seeking pleasure from anything, either living or insensible, that this world can afford, neither wanting time for the continuation of thy pleasure, nor place and opportunity, nor the favor either of the weather or of men, when thou shalt have content in thy present estate, and all things present shall add to thy content, when thou shalt persuade thyself that thou hast all things, all for thy good, and all by the providence of the gods, and of things future also shalt be as confident that all will do well as tending to the maintenance and preservation in some sort of his perfect welfare and happiness, who is perfection of life, of goodness and beauty, who begets all things, and containeth all things in himself, and in himself doth recollect all things from all places that are dissolved, that of them he may beget others again like unto them. Such one day shall be thy disposition, that thou shalt be able both in regard of the gods and in regard of men, so to fit and order thy conversation, as neither to complain of them at any time for anything that they do, nor to do anything thyself, for which thou mayest justly be condemned, too. As one who is altogether governed by nature, let it be thy care to observe what it is that thy nature in general doth require. That done, if thou find not that thy nature, as thou art a living sensible creature, will be the worse for it, thou mayest proceed. Next then thou must examine what thy nature as thou art a living sensible creature doth require, and that whatsoever it be thou mayest admit of and do it, if thy nature as thou art a reasonable living creature, will not be the worse for it. Now whatsoever is reasonable is also sociable. Keep thyself to these rules, and trouble not thyself about idle things. 3. 
Whatsoever doth happen unto thee, thou art naturally by thy natural constitution either able or not able to bear. If thou beest able, be not offended, but bear it according to thy natural constitution, or as nature hath enabled thee. If thou beest not able, be not offended, for it will soon make an end of thee and itself, whatsoever it be, at the same time end with thee. But remember, that whatsoever by the strength of opinion, grounded upon a certain apprehension of both true profit and duty, thou canst conceive tolerable, that thou art able to bear that by thy natural constitution. Him that offends, to teach with love and meekness, and to show him his error. But if thou canst not, then to blame thyself, or rather not thyself neither, if thy will and endeavors have not been wanting. 5. Whatsoever it be that happens unto thee, it is that which from all time was appointed unto thee. For by the same coherence of causes, by which thy substance from all eternity was appointed to be, was also whatsoever should happen unto it, destinated and appointed. 6. Either with Epicurus we must fondly imagine the atoms to be the cause of all things, or we must needs grant a nature. Let this then be thy first ground, that thou art part of that universe, which is governed by nature. Then secondly, that to those parts that are of the same kind and nature as thou art, thou hast relation of kindred. For of these, if I shall always be mindful, first as I am a part, I shall never be displeased with anything that falls to my particular share of the common chances of the world, for nothing that is behoveful unto the whole can be truly hurtful to that which is part of it. For this being the common privilege of all natures, that they contain nothing in themselves that is hurtful unto them. It cannot be that the nature of the universe, whose privilege beyond other particular natures is, that she cannot against her will by any higher external cause be constrained, should beget anything and cherish it in her bosom that should tend to her own hurt and prejudice. As then I bear in mind that I am a part of such an universe, I shall not be displeased with anything that happens, and as I have relation of kindred to those parts that are of the same kind and nature that I am, so I shall be careful to do nothing that is prejudicial to the community, but in all my deliberations shall they that are of my kind ever be, and the common good, that which all my intentions and resolutions shall drive unto, as that which is contrary unto it, I shall by all means endeavor to prevent and avoid. These things once so fixed and concluded, as thou wouldst think him a happy citizen, whose constant study and practice were for the good and benefit of his fellow citizens, and the carriage of the city such towards him, that he were well pleased with it. So must it needs be with thee, that thou shalt live a happy life. 7. All parts of the world, all things I mean that are contained within the whole world, must of necessity at some time or other come to corruption. Alteration, I should say, to speak truly and properly, but that I may be the better understood, I am content at this time to use that more common word. Now say I, if so be that this be both hurtful unto them, and yet unavoidable, would not, thinkest thou, the whole itself be in a sweet case, all the parts of it being subject to alteration, yea, and by their making itself fitted for corruption, as consisting of things different and contrary? And did nature then either of herself thus project and purpose the affliction and misery of her parts, and therefore of purpose so made them, not only that haply they might, but of necessity that they should fall into evil? Or did not she know what she did when she made them? For either of these two to say is equally absurd, but to let pass nature in general, and to reason of things particular according to their own particular natures, how absurd and ridiculous is it, first to say that all parts of the whole are, by their proper natural constitution, subject to alteration, and then when any such thing doth happen, as when one doth fall sick and dieth, to take on and wonder as though some strange thing had happened though this besides might move not so grievously to take on when any such thing doth happen, that whatsoever is dissolved, it is dissolved into those things. 
whereof it was compounded. For every dissolution is either a mere dispersion of the elements into those elements again whereof everything did consist, or a change of that which is more solid into earth, and of that which is pure and subtile or spiritual into air, so that by this means nothing is lost, but all resumed again into those rational generative seeds of the universe. And this universe, either after a certain period of time to lie consumed by fire, or by continual changes to be renewed, and so forever to endure. Now that solid and spiritual that we speak of, thou must not conceive it to be that very same, which at first was when thou wert born. For alas, all this that now thou art in either kind, either for matter of substance or of life, hath but two or three days ago, partly from meats eaten, and partly from air breathed in, received all its influx, being the same then in no other respect than a running river, maintained by the perpetual influx and new supply of waters, is the same. That therefore which thou hast since received, not that which came from thy mother, is that which comes to change and corruption. But suppose that that for the general substance and more solid part of it should still cleave unto thee never so close, yet what is that to the proper qualities and affections of it by which persons are distinguished, which certainly are quite different. 8. Now that thou hast taken these names upon thee of good, modest, true, of emphron, sumphron, upperfron, take heed lest at any times by doing anything that is contrary, thou be but improperly so called, and lose thy right to these appellations, or if thou do, return unto them again with all possible speed. And remember, that the word emphron notes unto thee an intent and intelligent consideration of every object that presents itself unto thee without distraction. And the word sumphron, a ready and contented acceptation of whatsoever by the appointment of the common nature, happens unto thee. And the word uperfron, a superextension, or a transcendent and outreaching disposition of thy mind, whereby it passeth by all bodily pains and pleasures, honor and credit, death and whatsoever is of the same nature, as matters of absolute indifferency, and in no wise to be stood upon by a wise man. These then, if inviolably thou shalt observe, and shalt not be ambitious to be so called by others, both thou thyself shalt become a new man, and thou shalt begin a new life. For to continue such as hitherto thou hast been, to undergo those distractions and distempers, as thou must needs for such a life as hitherto thou hast lived, is the part of one that is very foolish, and is over-fond of his life, whom a man might compare to one of those half-eaten wretches, matched in the amphitheatre with wild beasts, who as full as they are all the body over with wounds and blood, desire for a great favour that they may be reserved till the next day. Then also, and in the same estate, to be exposed to the same nails and teeth as before. Away therefore ship thyself, and from the troubles and distractions of thy former life convey thyself as it were unto these few names, and if thou canst abide in them, or be constant in the practice and possession of them, continue there as glad and joyful as one that were translated unto some such place of bliss and happiness as that which by Hesiod and Plato is called the Islands of the Blessed, by others called the Elysian Fields. And whensoever thou findest thyself, that thou art in danger of a relapse, and that thou art not able to master and overcome those difficulties and temptations that present themselves in thy present station, get thee into any private corner where thou mayst be better able. Or if that will not serve, forsake even thy life rather. But so that it be not in passion, but in a plain, voluntary, modest way, this being the only commendable action of thy whole life, that thus thou art departed, or this having been the main work and business of thy whole life, that thou mightest thus depart. Now for the better remembrance of those names that we have spoken of, thou shalt find it a very good help to remember the gods as often as may be, and that the thing which they require at our hands of as many of us, as are by nature reasonable creation, is not that with fair words 
an outward show of piety and devotion we should flatter them, but that we should become like unto them, and that as all other natural creatures, the fig tree, for example, the dog, the bee, both do, all of them, and apply themselves unto that which by their natural constitution is proper unto them. So man likewise should do that, which by his nature, as he is a man, belongs unto him. 9. Toys and fooleries at home, wars abroad, sometimes terror, sometimes torpor or stupid sloth. This is thy daily slavery. By little and little, if thou doest not better look to it, those sacred dogmata will be blotted out of thy mind. How many things be there which when, as a mere naturalist, thou hast barely considered of according to their nature, thou doest let pass without any further use. Whereas thou shouldst in all things so join action and contemplation, that thou mightest both at the same time attend all present occasions, to perform everything duly and carefully, and yet so intend the contemplative part too, that no part of that delight and pleasure, which the contemplative knowledge of everything according to its true nature doth of itself afford, might be lost. Or, that the true and contemplative knowledge of everything according to its own nature might of itself, action being subject to many lets and impediments, afford unto thee sufficient pleasure and happiness, not apparent indeed, but not concealed. And when shalt thou attain to the happiness of true simplicity and unaffected gravity? When shalt thou rejoice in the certain knowledge of every particular object according to its true nature, as what the matter and substance of it is, what use it is for in the world, how long it can subsist, what things it doth consist of, who they be that are capable of it, and who they that can give it and take it away? 10. As the spider when it hath caught the fly that it hunted after is not little proud nor meanly conceited of herself, as he likewise that hath caught an hare, or hath taken a fish with his net, as another for the taking of a boar, and another of a bear. So may they be proud, and applaud themselves for their valiant acts against the Sarmatai, or northern nations lately defeated. For these also, these famous soldiers and warlike men, if thou dost look into their minds and opinions, what do they for the most part but hunt after prey? 11. To find out, and set to thyself some certain way and method of contemplation, whereby thou mayest clearly discern and represent unto thyself the mutual change of all things, the one into the other. Bear it in thy mind evermore, and see that thou be truly well exercised in this particular. For there is not anything more effectual to beget true magnanimity. 12. He hath got loose from the bonds of his body, and perceiving that within a very little while he must of necessity bid the world farewell and leave all these things behind him, he wholly applied himself as to righteousness in all his actions, so to the common nature in all things that should happen unto him. And contenting himself with these two things, to do all things justly, and whatsoever God doth send to like well of it, what others shall either say or think of him, or shall do against him, he doth not so much as trouble his thoughts with it, to go on straight, whither right and reason directed him, and by so doing to follow God, was the only thing that he did mind, that his only business and occupation. 13. What use is there of suspicion at all? Or why should thoughts of mistrust and suspicion concerning that which is future trouble thy mind at all? What now is to be done if thou mayest search and inquiry into that, what needs thou care for more? And if thou art well able to perceive it alone, let no man divert thee from it. But if alone thou doest not so well perceive it, suspend thine action, and take advice from the best. And if there be anything else that doth hinder thee, go on with prudence and discretion, according to the present occasion and opportunity, still proposing that unto thyself, which thou doest conceive most right and just. For to hit that aright, and to speed in the prosecution of it, must needs be happiness, since it is that only which we can truly and properly be said to miss of or miscarry in. 14. 
What is that that is slow and yet quick, merry and yet grave? He that in all things doth follow reason for his guide. 15. In the morning, as soon as thou art awaked, when thy judgment, before either thy affections or external objects have wrought upon it, is yet most free and impartial. Put this question to thyself, whether if that which is right and just be done, the doing of it by thyself or by others when thou art not able thyself, be a thing material or no, for sure it is not. And as for these that keep such a life and stand so much upon the praises or dispraises of other men, hast thou forgotten what manner of men they be, that such and such upon their beds and such at their board, what their ordinary actions are, what they pursue after, and what they fly from, what thefts and rapines they commit, if not with their hands and feet, yet with that more precious part of theirs, their minds, which, would it but admit of them, might enjoy faith, modesty, truth, justice, a good spirit. 16. Give what thou wilt, and take away what thou wilt, saith he that is well taught and truly modest, to him that gives and takes away. And it is not out of a stout and peremptory resolution that he saith it, but in mere love and humble submission. 17. So live as indifferent to the world and all worldly objects, as one who liveth by himself alone upon some desert hill. For whether here or there, if the whole world be but as one town, it matters not much for the place. Let them behold and see a man, that is a man indeed, living according to the true nature of man. If they cannot bear with me, let them kill me. For better were it to die, than so to live as they would have thee. 18. Make it not any longer a matter of dispute or discourse. What are the signs and proprieties of a good man, but really and actually to be such? 19. Ever to represent unto thyself, and to set before thee, both the general age and time of the world, and the whole substance of it, and how all things particular in respect of these are for their substance, as one of the least seeds that is, and for their duration, as the turning of the pestle in the mortar once about, then to fix thy mind upon every particular object of the world, and to conceive it as it is indeed as already being in the state of dissolution and of change, tending to some kind of either putrefaction or dispersion, or whatsoever else it is, that is the death, as it were, of everything in his own kind. 20. Consider them through all actions and occupations of their lives, as when they eat and when they sleep, when they are in the act of necessary exoneration and when in the act of lust. Again, when they either are in their greatest exaltation and in the middle of all their pomp and glory, or being angry and displeased in great state and majesty, as from an higher place they chide and rebuke. How base and slavish but a little while ago they were fain to be, that they might come to this, and within a very little while what will be their estate, when death hath once seized upon them. 21. That is best for everyone that the common nature of all doth send unto everyone, and then is it best when she doth send it. 22. The earth, saith the poet, doth often long after the rain, so is the glorious sky often as desirous to fall upon the earth, which argues a mutual kind of love between them. And so, say I, doth the world bear a certain affection of love to whatsoever shall come to pass, with thine affection shall mine concur, O world. The same, and no other, shall the object of my longing be which is of thine. Now that the world doth love it is true indeed, so is it as commonly said, and acknowledged ledged, when according to the Greek phrase, imitated by the Latins, of things that used to be, we say commonly, that they love to be. 23. Either thou dost continue in this kind of life, and that is it, which so long thou hast been used unto, and therefore tolerable, or thou doest retire, or leave the world, and that of thine own accord, and then thou hast thy mind, or thy life is cut off, and then mayst thou rejoice that thou hast ended thy charge. 
one of these must needs be. Be therefore of good comfort. 24. Let it always appear and be manifest unto thee that solitariness and desert places by many philosophers so much esteemed of and affected are of themselves but thus and thus, and that all things are them to them that live in towns and converse with others as they are the same nature everywhere to be seen and observed. To them that have retired themselves to the top of mountains and to desert havens or what other desert and inhabited places soever. For anywhere it thou wilt, mayest thou quickly find and apply that to thyself, which Plato saith of his philosopher, in a place as private and retired, saith he, as if he were shut up and enclosed about in some shepherd's lodge on the top of a hill, there by thyself to put these questions to thyself or to enter in these considerations. What is my chief and principal part which hath power over the rest? What is now the present estate of it as I use it? And what is it that I employ it about? Is it now void of reason or no? Is it free and separated? Or so affixed, so congealed and grown together as it were with the flesh, that it is swayed by the motions and inclinations of it? 25. He that runs away from his master is a fugitive, but the law is every man's master. He therefore that forsakes the law is a fugitive. So is he, whosoever he be, that is either sorry, angry, or afraid, or for anything that either hath been, is, or shall be by his appointment, who is the Lord and Governor of the universe. For he truly and properly is nomos, or the law, as the only nemon, or distributor and dispenser of all things that happen unto anyone in his lifetime. Whatsoever then is either sorry, angry, or afraid, is a fugitive. 26. From man is the seed, that once cast into the womb, man hath no more to do with it. Another cause succeedeth, and undertakes the work, and in time brings a child, that wonderful effect from such a beginning, to perfection. Again, man lets food down through his throat, and that once down, he hath no more to do with it. Another cause succeedeth and distributeth this food into the senses and the affections, into life and into strength, and doth with it those other many and marvelous things that belong unto man. These things, therefore, that are so secretly and invisibly wrought and brought to pass, thou must use to behold and contemplate, and not the things themselves only, but the power also by which they are affected, that thou mayest behold it, though not with the eyes of the body, yet as plainly and visibly as thou canst see and discern the outward efficient cause of the depression and elevation of anything. 27. Ever to mind and consider with thyself how all things that now are have been heretofore much after the same sort and after the same fashion that now they are, and so to think of those things which shall be hereafter also. Moreover, whole dramata and uniform scenes or scenes that comprehend the lives and actions of men of one calling and profession, as many as either in thine own experience thou hast known, or by reading of ancient histories, as the whole court of Adrianus, the whole court of Antoninus Pius, the whole court of Philippus, that of Alexander, that of Croesus, to set them all before thine eyes. For thou shalt find that they are all but after one sort and fashion, only that the actors were others. 28. As a pig that cries and flings when his throat is cut, fancy to thyself every one to be, that grieves for any worldly thing and takes on. Such a one is he also, who upon his bed alone doth bewail the miseries of this our mortal life. And remember this, that unto reasonable creatures only it is granted that they may willingly and freely submit unto providence, but absolutely to submit, is a necessity imposed upon all creatures equally. 29. Whatsoever it is that thou goest about, consider of it by thyself, and ask thyself, What? Because I shall do this no more when I am dead, should therefore death seem grievous unto me. 30. When thou art offended with any man's transgression, presently reflect upon thyself, and consider what thou thyself art guilty of in the same kind as that thou also perchance dost think it a happiness either to be rich, or to live in pleasure, or to be praised and commended, 
and so of the rest in particular. For this, if thou shalt call to mind, thou shalt soon forget thine anger, especially when at the same time this also shall concur in thy thoughts, that he was constrained by his error and ignorance so to do. For how can he choose as long as he is of that opinion? Do thou therefore, if thou canst, take away that from him, that forceth him to do as he doth? 31. When thou seest Satiro, think of Socraticus and Eutyches or Hymen, and when Euphrates, think of Eutychio and Silvanus, when Alciphron, of Tropaeophorus, when Xenophon, of Crito or Severus. And when thou doest look upon thyself, fancy unto thyself some one or other of the king Azars, and so for every one, some one or other that hath been for a state and profession answerable unto him. Then let this come to thy mind at the same time, and where now are they all, nowhere or anywhere? For so shalt thou at all time be able to perceive how all worldly things are but as the smoke that vanisheth away, or indeed mere nothing, especially when thou shalt call to mind this also, that whatsoever is once changed shall never be again as long as the world endureth. And thou then, how long shalt thou endure? And why doth it not suffice thee, if virtuously, and as becometh thee, thou mayest pass that portion of time, how little soever it be, that is allotted unto thee? 32. What a subject, and what a course of life is it, that thou doest so much desire to be rid of? For all these things, what are they, but fit objects for an understanding that beholdeth everything according to its true nature to exercise itself upon? Be patient, therefore, until that, as a strong stomach that turns all things into his own nature, and as a great fire that turneth in flame and light, whatsoever thou doest cast into it, thou have made these things also familiar, and as it were natural unto thee. 33. Let it not be in any man's power to say truly of thee that thou art not truly simple or sincere and open or not good. Let him be deceived whosoever he be that shall have any such opinion of thee. For all this doth depend of thee. For who is it that should hinder thee from being either truly simple or good? Do thou only resolve rather not to live than not to be such? For indeed neither doth it stand with reason that he should live that is not such. What then is it that may upon this present occasion, according to best reason and discretion, either be said or done? For whatsoever it be, it is in thy power either to do it or to say it, and therefore seek not any pretenses, as though thou wert hindered. Thou wilt never cease groaning and complaining, until such time as that, what pleasure is unto the voluptuous, be unto thee, to do in everything that presents itself, whatsoever may be done conformably and agreeably to the proper constitution of man, or to man as he is a man. For thou must account that pleasure, whatsoever it be, that thou mayest do according to thine own nature. And to do this, every place will fit thee. Unto the cylindrus, or roller, it is not granted to move everywhere according to its own proper motion, as neither unto the water, nor unto the fire, nor unto any other thing, that either is merely natural, or natural and sensitive, but not rational for many things, there be that can hinder their operations. But of the mind and understanding this is the proper privilege, that according to its own nature, and as it will itself, it can pass through every obstacle that it finds, and keep straight on forwards. Setting therefore before thine eyes this happiness and felicity of thy mind, whereby it is able to pass through all things and is capable of all motions, whether as the fire upwards, or as the stone downwards, or as the cylindrus through that which is sloping. Content thyself with it, and seek not after any other thing. For all other kind of hindrances that are not hindrances of thy mind, either they are proper to the body, or merely proceed from the opinion, reason not making that resistance that it should, but basely, and cowardly suffering itself to be foiled, and of themselves can neither wound, nor do any hurt at all. Else must he of necessity, whosoever he be that meets with any of them, become worse than he was before, for so is it in all other subjects, 
that that is thought hurtful unto them, whereby they are made worse. But here contrariwise man, if he make that good use of them that he should, is rather the better and the more praiseworthy for any of those kind of hindrances than otherwise. But generally remember that nothing can hurt a natural citizen that is not hurtful unto the city itself, nor anything hurt the city that is not hurtful unto the law itself. But none of these casualties or external hindrances do hurt the law itself, or are contrary to that course of justice and equity by which public societies are maintained. Neither therefore do they hurt either city or citizen. 34. As he that is bitten by a mad dog is afraid of everything almost that he seeth, so unto him whom the dogmata have once bitten, or in whom true knowledge hath made an impression, everything almost that he sees or reads, be it never so short or ordinary, doth afford a good memento, to put him out of all grief and fear as that of the poet. The winds blow upon the trees and their leaves fall upon the ground. Then do the trees begin to bud again, and by the springtime they put forth new branches. So is the generation of men. Some come into the world and others go out of it. Of these leaves then thy children are, and they also that applaud thee so gravely, or that applaud thy speeches, with that their usual acclamation, Axiopistos, O wisely spoken I, and speak well of thee, as on the other side, they that stick not to curse thee, they that privately and secretly dispraise and deride thee, they also are but leaves, and they also that shall follow, in whose memories the names of men famous after death is preserved, they are but leaves neither, for even so is it of all these worldly things, their spring comes, and they are put forth, then blows the wind and they go down, and then in lieu of them grow others out of the wood, or common matter of all things like unto them. But to endure but for a while is common unto all. Why then showedest thou so earnestly either seek after these things, or fly from them as though they should endure forever? Yet a little while, and thine eyes will be closed up, and for him that carries thee to thy grave shall another mourn within a while after. 35. A good eye must be good to see whatsoever is to be seen, and not green things only, for that is proper to sore eyes. So must a good ear and a good smell be ready for whatsoever is either to be heard or smelt, and a good stomach as indifferent to all kinds of food as a millstone is to whatsoever she was made for to grind. As ready, therefore, must a sound understanding be for whatsoever shall happen. But he that saith, O oh, that my children might live, and O oh, that all men might commend me for whatsoever I do, is an eye that seeks after green things, or as teeth after that which is tender. 36. There is not any man that is so happy in his death, but that some of those that are by him when he dies will be ready to rejoice at his supposed calamity. Is it one that was virtuous and wise indeed? Will there not someone or other be found who thus will say to himself, Well, now at last shall I be at rest from this pedagogue. He did not indeed otherwise trouble us much, but I know well enough that in his heart he did much condemn us. Thus will they speak of the virtuous. But as for us, alas, I how many things be there, for which there be many that glad would be to be rid of us. This therefore, if thou shalt think of whensoever thou diest, thou shalt die the more willingly, when thou shalt think with thyself. I am now to depart from that world, wherein those that have been my nearest friends and acquaintances, they whom I have so much suffered for, so often prayed for, and for whom I have taken such care, even they would have me die, hoping that after my death they shall live happier than they did before. What then should any man desire to continue here any longer? Nevertheless, whensoever thou diest, thou must not be less kind and loving unto them for it. But as before, see them, continue to be their friend, to wish them well and meekly and gently to carry thyself towards them. But yet so that on the other side, it make thee not the more unwilling to die. But as it fareth with them that die an easy quick death, whose soul is soon separated from their bodies. 
so must thy separation from them be. To these had nature joined and annexed me. Now she parts us. I am ready to depart, as from friends and kinsmen, but yet without either reluctancy or compulsion, for this also is according to nature. 37. Use thyself. As often as thou seest any man do anything, presently, if it be possible, to say unto thyself, What is this man's end in this his action? But begin this course with thyself first of all, and diligently examine thyself concerning whatsoever thou doest. Remember that that which sets a man at work and hath power over the affections to draw them either one way or the other way is not any external thing properly, but that which is hidden within every man's dogmata and opinions. That, that is rhetoric, that is life, that, to speak true, is man himself. As for thy body, which as a vessel or a case compasseth thee about, and the many and curious instruments that it hath annexed unto it, let them not trouble thy thoughts, for of themselves they are but as a carpenter's axe, but that they are born with us and naturally sticking unto us. But otherwise, without the inward cause that hath power to move them and to restrain them, those parts are of themselves of no more use unto us than the shuttle is of itself to the weaver, or the pen to the writer, or the whip to the coachman. The Eleventh Book The natural properties and privileges of a reasonable soul are that she seethe herself, that she can order and compose herself, that she makes herself as she will herself, that she reaps her own fruits whatsoever, whereas plants, trees, unreasonable creatures, what fruit soever, be it either fruit properly or analogically only, they bear, they bear them unto others and not to themselves. Again, whensoever and wheresoever, sooner or later, her life doth end, she hath her own end nevertheless. For it is not with her, as with dancers and players, who if they be interrupted in any part of their action, the whole action must needs be imperfect, but she in what part of time or action soever she be surprised, can make that which she hath in her hand whatsoever it be, complete and full, so that she may depart with that comfort. I have lived, neither want I anything of that which properly did belong unto me. Again, she compasseth the whole world, and penetrateth into the vanity, and mere outside, wanting substance and solidity of it, and stretcheth herself unto the infiniteness of eternity, and the revolution or restoration of all things after a certain period of time, to the same state and place as before, she fetcheth about and doth comprehend in herself, and considers withal, and sees clearly this, that neither they that shall follow us shall see any new thing that we have not seen, nor they that went before anything more than we. But that he that is once come to forty, if he have any wit at all, can in a manner, for that they are all of one kind, see all things, both past and future. As proper is it and natural to the soul of man to love her neighbor, to be true and modest, and to regard nothing so much as herself, which is also the property of the law, whereby by the way it appears that sound reason and justice comes all to one, and therefore that justice is the chief thing that reasonable creatures ought to propose unto themselves as their end. 2. A pleasant song or dance. The Pancratius' exercise, sports that thou art wont to be much taken with, thou shalt easily contemn. If the harmonious voice thou shalt divide into so many particular sounds whereof it doth consist, and of every one in particular shall ask thyself, whether this or that sound is it, that doth so conquer thee, for thou wilt be ashamed of it, and so for shame, if accordingly thou shalt consider it, every particular motion and posture by itself, and so for the wrestler's exercise too. Generally then, whatsoever it be besides virtue, and those things that proceed from virtue that thou art subject to be much affected with, Remember presently thus to divide it, and by this kind of division, in each particular to attain unto the contempt of the whole. This thou must transfer and apply to thy whole life also. 3. That soul which is ever ready even now presently, if need be, from the body, 
whether by way of extinction or dispersion or continuation in another place and a state to be separated, how blessed and happy is it. But this readiness of it, it must proceed, not from an obstinate and peremptory resolution of the mind, violently and passionately set upon opposition, as Christians are wont, but from a peculiar judgment, with discretion and gravity, so that others may be persuaded also and drawn to the like example, but without any noise and passionate exclamations. For, have I done anything charitably? Then am I benefited by it. See that this upon all occasions may present itself unto thy mind, and never cease to think of it. What is thy profession? To be good. And how should this be well brought to pass, but by certain theorems and doctrines, some concerning the nature of the universe, and some concerning the proper and particular constitution of man. 5. Tragedies were at first brought in and instituted to put men in mind of worldly chances and casualties, that these things in the ordinary course of nature did so happen, that men that were much pleased and delighted by such accidents upon this stage would not by the same things in a greater stage be grieved and afflicted, for here you see what is the end of all such things, and that even they that cry out so mournfully to Cytheron must bear them for all their cries and exclamations as well as others. And in very truth many good things are spoken by these poets, as that, for example, is an excellent passage. But if so be that I and my two children be neglected by the gods, they have some reason even for that. And again, it will but little avail thee to storm and rage against the things themselves. Again, to reap one's life as a ripe ear of corn. And whatsoever else is to be found in them, that is of the same kind. After the tragedy, the ancient comedy was brought in, which had the liberty to inveigh against personal vices. Being therefore through this her freedom and liberty of speech of very good use and effect, to restrain men from pride and arrogancy. To which end it was that Diogenes took also the same liberty. After these, what were either the middle or new comedy admitted for, but merely, or for the most part at least, for the delight and pleasure of curious and excellent imitation, it will steal away, look to it. Why, no man denies, but that these also have some good things whereof that may be one. But the whole drift and foundation of that kind of dramatical poetry, what is it else? But as we have said, six, how clearly doth it appear unto thee that no other course of thy life could fit a true philosopher's practice better than this very course that thou art now already in, seven. A branch cut off from the continuity of that which was next unto it must needs be cut off from the whole tree so a man that is divided from another man is divided from the whole society. A branch is cut off by another, but he that hates and is averse cuts himself off from his neighbor and knows not that at the same time he divides himself from the whole body or corporation. But herein is the gift and mercy of God, the author of this society, in that once cut off, we may grow together and become part of the whole again. But if this happen often, the misery is that the further a man is run in this division, the harder he is to be reunited and restored again. And however the branch, which once cut of afterwards was grafted in, gardeners can tell you is not like that which sprouted together at first and still continued in the unity of the body. 8. To grow together like fellow branches in matter of good correspondence and affection, but not in matter of opinions. They that shall oppose thee in thy right courses, as it is not in their power to divert thee from thy good action, so neither let it be to divert thee from thy good affection towards them. But be it thy care to keep thyself constant in both, both in a right judgment and action, and in true meekness towards them, that either shall do their endeavor to hinder thee, or at least will be displeased with thee for what thou hast done. For to fail in either, either in the one to give over for fear, or in the other to forsake thy natural affection towards him, who by nature is both thy friend and thy kinsman, is equally base 
and much savoring of the disposition of a cowardly fugitive soldier. 9. It is not possible that any nature should be inferior unto art, since that all arts imitate nature. If this be so, that the most perfect and general nature of all natures should in her operation come short of the skill of arts, is most improbable. Now common is it to all arts, to make that which is worse for the better's sake. Much more then doth the common nature do the same. Hence is the first ground of justice. From justice all other virtues have their existence. For justice cannot be preserved if either we settle our minds and affections upon worldly things, or be apt to be deceived or rash and inconstant. 10. The things themselves, which either to get or to avoid thou art put to so much trouble, come not unto thee themselves, but thou in a manner goest unto them. Let then thine own judgment and opinion concerning those things be at rest. And as for the things themselves, they stand still and quiet, without any noise or stir at all. And so shall all pursuing and flying cease. 11. Then is the soul as Empedocles doth liken it, like unto a sphere or globe, when she is all of one form and figure, when she neither greedily stretcheth out herself unto anything, nor basely contracts herself, or lies flat and dejected, but shineth all with light, whereby she does see and behold the true nature, both that of the universe and her own in particular. 12. Will any contemn me? Let him look to that upon what grounds he does it. My care shall be that I may never be found either doing or speaking anything that doth truly deserve contempt. Will any hate me? Let him look to that. I, for my part, will be kind and loving unto all, and even unto him that hates me, whomsoever he be, will I be ready to show his error, not by way of exprobation or ostentation of my patience, but ingenuously and meekly, such as was that famous Phocion, if so be that he did not dissemble. For it is inwardly that these things must be, that the gods who look inwardly, and not upon the outward appearance, may behold a man truly free from all indignation and grief. For what hurt can it be unto thee whatsoever any man else doth, as long as thou mayest do that which is proper and suitable to thine own nature? Wilt not thou, a man wholly appointed to be both what, and as the common good shall require, accept of that which is now seasonable to the nature of the universe? 13. They contemn one another, and yet they seek to please one another. And whilst they seek to surpass one another in worldly pomp and greatness, they most debase and prostitute themselves in their better part, one to another. 14. How rotten and insincere is he that saith, I am resolved to carry myself hereafter towards you with all ingenuity and simplicity. O man, what dost thou mean? What needs this profession of thine? The thing itself will show it. It ought to be written upon thy forehead. No sooner thy voice is heard, than thy countenance must be able to show what is in thy mind. Even as he that is loved knows presently by the looks of his sweetheart what is in her mind. Such must he be for all the world that is truly simple and good, as he whose armholes are offensive, that whosoever stands by, as soon as ever he comes near him, may, as it were, smell him whether he will or no. But the affectation of simplicity is nowise laudable. There is nothing more shameful than perfidious friendship. Above all things, that must be avoided. However true goodness, simplicity, and kindness cannot so be hidden, but that, as we have already said, in the very eyes and countenance they will show themselves. 15. To live happily is an inward power of the soul when she is affected with indifferency towards those things that are by their nature indifferent. To be thus affected, she must consider all worldly objects both divided and whole, remembering withal that no object can of itself beget any opinion in us, neither can come to us, but stands without still and quiet, but that we ourselves beget, and as it were print in ourselves opinions concerning them. Now it is in our power not to print them, and if they creep in and lurk in some corner, it is in our power to wipe them off. Remembering, moreover, 
that this care and circumspection of thine is to continue but for a while, and then thy life will be at an end. And what should hinder but that thou mayest do well with all these things? For if they be according to nature, rejoice in them, and let them be pleasing and acceptable unto thee. But if they be against nature, seek thou that which is according to thine own nature, and whether it be for thy credit or no, use all possible speed for the attainment of it, for no man ought to be blamed for seeking his own good and happiness. 16. Of everything thou must consider from whence it came, of what things it doth consist, and into what it will be changed, what will be the nature of it, or what it will be like unto when it is changed, and that it can suffer no hurt by this change. And as for other men's either foolishness or wickedness, that it may not trouble and grieve thee. First generally thus, what reference have I unto these? And that we are all born for one another's good, then more particularly after another consideration. As a ram is first in a flock of sheep, and a bull in a herd of cattle, so am I born to rule over them. Begin yet higher, even from this. If Adam's be not the beginning of all things, then which to believe nothing can be more absurd, then must we needs grant that there is a nature that doth govern the universe. If such a nature, then are all worse things made for the better's sake, and all better for one another's sake. Secondly, what manner of men they be, at board, and upon their beds, and so forth. But above all things, how they are forced by their opinions that they hold, to do what they do, and even those things that they do, with what pride and self-conceit they do them. Thirdly, that if they do these things rightly, thou hast no reason to be grieved. But if not rightly, it must needs be that they do them against their wills and through mere ignorance. For as, according to Plato's opinion, no soul doth willingly err, so by consequent neither doth it anything otherwise than it ought but against her will. Therefore are they grieved, whensoever they hear themselves charged, either of injustice, or unconscionableness, or covetousness, or in general, of any injurious kind of dealing towards their neighbors. Fourthly, that thou thyself doest transgress in many things, and art even such another as they are. And though perchance thou doest forbear the very act of some sins, Yet hast thou in thyself an habitual disposition to them, but that either through fear, or vainglory, or some such other ambitious foolish respect, thou art restrained. Fifthly, that whether they have sinned or no, thou doest not understand perfectly. For many things are done by way of discreet policy, and generally a man must know many things first, before he be able truly and judiciously to judge of another man's action. Sixthly, that whensoever thou doest take on grievously, or makest great woe, little doest thou remember then, that a man's life is but for a moment of time, and that within a while we shall all be in our graves. Seventhly, that it is not the sins and transgressions themselves that trouble us properly, for they have their existence in their minds and understandings only, that commit them but our own opinions concerning those sins. Remove then, and be content to part with that conceit of thine, that it is a grievous thing, and thou hast removed thine anger. But how should I remove it? How? Reasoning with thyself that it is not shameful. For if that which is shameful be not the only true evil that is, thou also wilt be driven, whilst thou doest follow the common instinct of nature, to avoid that which is evil, to commit many unjust things, and to become a thief, and anything that will make to the attainment of thy intended worldly ends. Eighthly, how many things may and do oftentimes follow upon such fits of anger and grief, far more grievous in themselves than those very things which we are so grieved or angry for. Ninthly, that meekness is a thing unconquerable, if it be true and natural and not affected or hypocritical. For how shall even the most fierce and malicious that thou shalt conceive 
be able to hold on against thee, if thou shalt still continue meek and loving unto him, and that even at that time when he is about to do thee wrong, thou shalt be well disposed and in good temper, with all meekness to teach him, and to instruct him better? As for example, my son, we were not born for this, to hurt and annoy one another. It will be thy hurt, not mine, my son. And so to show him forcibly and fully that it is so in very deed, and that neither bees do it one to another, nor any other creatures that are naturally sociable. But this thou must do, not scoffingly, not by way of exprobation, but tenderly without any harshness of words. Neither must thou do it by way of exercise or ostentation, that they that are by and hear thee may admire thee, but so always that nobody be privy to it, but himself alone. Yea, though there be more present at the same time, these nine particular heads, as so many gifts from the muses, see that thou remember well, and begin one day, whilst thou art yet alive, to be a man indeed. But on the other side thou must take heed, as much to flatter them, as to be angry with them, for both are equally uncharitable and equally hurtful. And in thy passions, take it presently to thy consideration, that to be angry is not the part of a man, but that to be meek and gentle, as it savors of more humanity, so of more manhood, that in this there is strength and nerves, or vigor and fortitude, whereof anger and indignation is altogether void. For the nearer everything is unto unpassionateness, the nearer it is unto power. And as grief doth proceed from weakness, so doth anger. For both, both he that is angry and that grieveth, have received a wound, and cowardly have as it were yielded themselves unto their affections. If thou wilt have a tenth also, receive this tenth gift from Hercules the guide and leader of the muses. That is a madman's part, to look that there should be no wicked men in the world, because it is impossible. Now for a man to brook well enough, that there should be wicked men in the world, but not to endure that any should transgress against himself, is against all equity, and indeed tyrannical. 17. For several dispositions or inclinations there be of the mind and understanding, which to be aware of, thou must carefully observe. And whensoever thou doest discover them, thou must rectify them, saying to thyself concerning every one of them, This imagination is not necessary, this is uncharitable, this thou shalt speak as another man's slave, or instrument, than which nothing can be more senseless and absurd. For the fourth, thou shalt sharply check and upbraid thyself. For that thou doest suffer that more divine part in thee, to become subject and obnoxious to that more ignoble part of thy body, and the gross lusts and concupiscences thereof. 18. What portion soever, either of air or fire, there be in thee, although by nature it tend upwards, submitting nevertheless to the ordinance of the universe, it abides here below in this mixed body. So whatsoever is in thee, either earthy or humid, although by nature it tend downwards, yet is it against its nature both raised upwards and standing or consistent. So obedient are even the elements themselves to the universe, abiding patiently wheresoever, though against their nature, they are placed until the sound, as it were, of their retreat and separation. Is it not a grievous thing, then, that thy reasonable part only should be disobedient, and should not endure to keep its place? Yea, though it be nothing enjoined that is contrary unto it, but that only which is according to its nature. For we cannot say of it when it is disobedient, as we say of the fire, or air, that it tends upwards towards its proper element, for then goes it the quite contrary way. For the motion of the mind to any injustice, or incontinency, or to sorrow, or to fear, is nothing else but a separation from nature. Also when the mind is grieved for anything that has happened by the divine providence, then doth it likewise forsake its own place, for it was ordained unto holiness and godliness, which specially consist in an humble submission to God 
and his providence in all things, as well as unto justice, these also being part of those duties which as naturally sociable we are bound unto, and without which we cannot happily converse one with another, yea, in the very ground and fountain indeed of all just actions. 19. He that hath not one and the self-same general end always as long as he liveth cannot possibly be one and the self-same man always. But this will not suffice except thou add also what ought to be this general end. For as the general conceit and apprehension of all those things which upon no certain ground are by the greater part of men deemed good cannot be uniform and agreeable, but that only which is limited and restrained by some certain proprieties and conditions, as of community, that nothing be conceived good, which is not commonly and publicly good, so must the end also that we propose unto ourselves be common and sociable. For he that doth direct all his own private motions and purposes to that end, all his actions will be agreeable and uniform, and by that means will be still the same man. 20. Remember the fable of the country mouse and the city mouse, and the great fright and terror that this was put into. 21. Socrates was wont to call the common conceits and opinions of men, the common bugbears of the world, the proper terror of silly children. 22. The Lacedaemonians at their public spectacles were wont to appoint seats and forms for their strangers in the shadow. They themselves were content to sit anywhere. 3. What Socrates answered unto Perdiccas, why he did not come unto him, lest of all deaths I should die the worst kind of death, said he, that is, not able to requite the good that hath been done unto me. 24. In the ancient mystical letters of the Ephesians, there was an item that a man should always have in his mind some one or other of the ancient worthies. 25. The Pythagoreans were wont betimes in the morning the first thing they did, to look up unto the heavens, to put themselves in mind of them who constantly and invariably did perform their task, as also to put themselves in mind of orderliness, or good order, and of purity, and of naked simplicity, for no star or planet hath any cover before it. 26. How Socrates looked when he was fain to gird himself with a skin, Xanthippa his wife having taken away his clothes and carried them abroad with her, and what he said to his fellows and friends who were ashamed, and out of respect to him did retire themselves when they saw him thus decked. 27. In matter of writing or reading, thou must needs be taught before thou can do either, much more in matter of life. For thou art born a mere slave, to thy senses and brutish affections, destitute without teaching of all true knowledge and sound reason. Phew, my heart smiled within me. They will accuse even virtue herself with heinous and opprobrious words. 29. As they that long after figs in winter when they cannot be had, so are they that long after children before they be granted them. As often as a father kisseth his child, he should say secretly with himself, said Epictetus. Tomorrow, perchance, shall he die. But these words be ominous. No words ominous, said he, that signify anything that is natural, in very truth indeed not more ominous than this, to cut down grapes when they are ripe, green grapes, ripe grapes, dried grapes, or raisins, so many changes and mutations of one thing, not into that which was not absolutely but rather so many several changes and mutations, not into that which hath no being at all, but into that which is not yet in being. 31. Of the free will there is no thief or robber out of Epictetus. Whose is this also, that we should find a certain art and method of assenting, and that we should always observe with great care and heed the inclinations of our minds, that they may always be with their due restraint and reservation? always charitable, and according to the true worth of every present object, and as for earnest longing, that we should altogether avoid it, and to use averseness in those things only that wholly depend of our own wills. It is not about ordinary petty matters, believe it, 
that all our strife and contention is, but whether with the vulgar we should be mad, or by the help of philosophy wise and sober, said he. Cantutrine. Socrates said, What will you have? The souls of reasonable or unreasonable creatures? Of reasonable. But what? Of those whose reason is sound and perfect? Or of those whose reason is vitiated and corrupted? Of those whose reason is sound and perfect? Why then labor ye not for such? Because we have them already. What then do ye so strive and contend between you? The twelfth book on Whatsoever thou doest hereafter aspire unto, thou mayest even now enjoy and possess, if thou doest not envy thyself thine own happiness. And that will be, if thou shalt forget all that is past, and for the future refer thyself wholly to the divine providence, and shalt bend and apply all thy present thoughts and intentions to holiness and righteousness, to holiness in accepting willingly whatsoever is sent, by the divine providence, as being that which the nature of the universe hath appointed unto thee, which also hath appointed thee for that, whatsoever it be. To righteousness, in speaking the truth freely and without ambiguity, and in doing all things justly and discreetly. Now in this good course, let not other men's either wickedness or opinion or voice hinder thee. No, nor the sense of this thy pampered mass of flesh, for let that which suffers look to itself. If therefore whensoever the time of thy departing shall come, thou shalt readily leave all things, and shalt respect thy mind only, and that divine part of thine, and this shall be thine only fear, not that some time or other thou shalt cease to live, but thou shalt never begin to live according to nature, then shalt thou be a man indeed, worthy of that world, from which thou hadst thy beginning, then shalt thou cease to be a stranger in thy country, and to wonder at those things that happen daily, as things strange and unexpected, and anxiously to depend of divers things that are not in thy power. 2. God beholds our minds and understandings bare and naked from these material vessels and outsides, and all earthly dross. For with his simple and pure understanding, he pierceth into our inmost and purest parts, which from his as it were by a water pipe and channel, first flowed and issued. This, if thou also shalt use to do, thou shalt rid thyself of that manifold luggage wherewith thou art round about encumbered. For he that does regard neither his body, nor his clothing, nor his dwelling, nor any such external furniture, must needs gain unto himself great rest and ease. Three things there be in all, which thou doest consist of, thy body, thy life, and thy mind. Of these the two former are so far forth thine, as that thou art bound to take care for them. But the third alone is that which is properly thine. If then thou shalt separate from thyself, that is from thy mind, whatsoever other men either do or say, or whatsoever thou thyself hast heretofore either done or said, and all troublesome thoughts concerning the future, and whatsoever, as either belonging to thy body or life, is without the jurisdiction of thine own will, and whatsoever in the ordinary course of human chances and accidents doth happen unto thee, so that thy mind, keeping herself loose and free from all outward coincidental entanglements, always in a readiness to depart, shall live by herself and to herself, doing that which is just, accepting whatsoever doth happen, and speaking the truth always, if, I say, thou shalt separate from thy mind whatsoever by sympathy might adhere unto it, and all time, both past and future, and shalt make thyself in all points and respects, like unto Empedocles his allegorical sphere, all round and circular, and shalt think of no longer life than that which is now present, then shalt thou be truly able to pass the remainder of thy days without troubles and distractions, nobly and generously disposed, and in good favor and correspondency with that spirit which is within thee. 3. I have often wondered how it should come to pass that every man loving himself best should more regard other men's opinions concerning himself than his own. For if any god or grave master standing by 
should command any of us to think nothing by himself, but what he should presently speak out. No man were able to endure it, though but for one day. Thus do we fear more what our neighbors will think of us than what we ourselves. For how come it to pass that the gods, having ordered all other things so well and so lovingly, should be overseen in this one only thing, that whereas then hath been some very good men that have made many covenants, as it were, with God, and by many holy actions and outward services contracted a kind of familiarity with him, that these men, when once they are dead, should never be restored to life, but be extinct forever. But this thou mayest be sure of, that this, if it be so indeed, would never have been so ordered by the gods, had it been fit otherwise. For certainly it was possible, had it been more just so, and had it been according to nature, the nature of the universe would easily have borne it. But now because it is not so, if so be that it be not so indeed, be therefore confident that it was not fit, it should be so, for thou seest thyself, that now seeking after this matter, how freely thou doest argue and contest with God. But were not the gods both just and good in the highest degree, thou durst not thus reason with them. Now if just and good, it could not be that in the creation of the world they should either unjustly or unreasonably oversee anything. 5. Use thyself even unto those things that thou doest at first despair of. For the left hand we see, which for the most part lieth idle because not used, yet doth it hold the bridle with more strength than the right, because it hath been used unto it. 6. Let these be the objects of thy ordinary meditation, to consider what manner of men both for soul and body we ought to be, whensoever death shall surprise us, the shortness of this our mortal life, the immense vastness of the time that hath been before, and will he after us, the frailty of every worldly material object, all these things to consider and behold clearly in themselves, all disguisement of external outside being removed and taken away. Again, to consider the efficient causes of all things, the proper ends and references of all actions, what pain is in itself, what pleasure, what death, what fame or honor, how every man is the true and proper ground of his own rest and tranquillity, and that no man can truly be hindered by any other, that all is but conceit and opinion. As for the use of thy dogmata, thou must carry thyself in the practice of them, rather like unto a Pancratiastes, or one that at the same time both fights and wrestles with hands and feet, than a gladiator. For this, if he lose his sword that he fights with, he is gone whereas the other hath still his hand free, which he may easily turn and manage at his will. 7. All worldly things thou must behold and consider, dividing them into matter, form, and reference, or their proper end. 8. How happy is man in this his power that hath been granted unto him, that he needs not do anything but what God shall approve, and that he may embrace contentedly whatsoever God doth send unto him. 9. Whatsoever doth happen in the ordinary course and consequence of natural events, neither the gods, for it is not possible that they either wittingly or unwittingly should do anything amiss, nor men, for it is through ignorance and therefore against their wills that they do anything amiss, must be accused. None then must be accused. 10. How ridiculous and strange is he that wonders at anything that happens in this life in the ordinary course of nature. 11. Either fate, and that either an absolute necessity and unavoidable decree, or a placeable and flexible providence, or all is a mere casual confusion, void of all order and government. If an absolute and unavoidable necessity, why doest thou resist? If a placeable and exorable providence, make thyself worthy of the divine help and assistance. If all be a mere confusion without any moderator or governor, then hast thou reason to congratulate thyself, that in such a general flood of confusion thou thyself hast obtained a reasonable faculty, whereby thou mayest govern thine own life and actions. But if thou beest carried away with the flood, 
It must be thy body perchance, or thy life, or some other thing that belongs unto them that is carried away, thy mind and understanding cannot. Or should it be so that the light of a candle indeed is still bright and lightsome until it be put out, and should truth and righteousness and temperance cease to shine in thee, whilst thou thyself hast any being? 12. At the conceit and apprehension that such and such a one hath sinned, thus reason with thyself. What do I know whether this be a sin indeed, as it seems to be? But if it be, what do I know but that he himself hath already condemned himself for it? And that is all one, as if a man should scratch and tear his own face, an object of compassion rather than of anger. Again, that he that would not have a vicious man to sin is like unto him that would not have moisture in the fig, nor children to whelp, nor a horse to neigh, nor anything else that in the course of nature is necessary. For what shall he do that hath such an habit? If thou therefore beest powerful and eloquent, remedy it if thou canst. 13. If it be not fitting, do it not. If it be not true, speak it not. Ever maintain thine own purpose and resolution free from all compulsion and necessity. 14. Of everything that presents itself unto thee, to consider what the true nature of it is, and to unfold it, as it were, by dividing it into that which is formal, that which is material, the true use or end of it, and the just time that it is appointed to last. 15. It is high time for thee to understand that there is somewhat in thee better and more divine than either thy passions or thy sensual appetites and affections. What is now the object of my mind is it fear, or suspicion, or lust, or any such thing? To do nothing rashly without some certain end. Let that be thy first care. The next, to have no other end than the common good. For alas, yet a little while, and thou art no more. No more will any, either of those things that now thou seest, or of those men that now are living, be any more. For all things are by nature appointed soon to be changed, turned, and corrupted, that other things might succeed in their room. 16. Remember that all is but opinion, and all opinion depends of the mind. Take thine opinion away, and then as a ship that hath stricken in within the arms and mouth of the harbor, a present calm, all things safe and steady, a bay, not capable of any storms and tempests, as the poet hath it. 17. No operation whatsoever, it he, ceasing for a while, can be truly said to suffer any evil, because it is at an end. Neither can he that is the author of that operation, for this very respect, because his operation is at an end, be said to suffer any evil. Likewise, then, neither can the whole body of all our actions, which is our life, if in time it cease, be said to suffer any evil for this very reason, because it is at an end, nor he truly be said to have been ill-affected that did put a period to this series of actions. Now this time, or certain period, depends of the determination of nature, sometimes of particular nature, as when a man dieth old, but of nature in general, however, the parts whereof thus changing one after another, the whole world still continues fresh and new, now that is ever best and most seasonable, which is for the good of the whole. Thus it appears that death of itself can neither be hurtful to any in particular, because it is not a shameful thing, for neither is it a thing that depends of our own will, nor of itself contrary to the common good. And generally, as it is both expedient and seasonable to the whole, that in that respect it must needs be good, it is that also, which is brought unto us by the order and appointment of the divine providence, so that he whose will and mind in these things runs along with the divine ordinance, and by this concurrence of his will and mind with the divine providence, is led and driven along, as it were by God himself, may truly be termed and esteemed the Theophoritos, or divinely led and inspired. 18. These three things thou must have always in a readiness, First, concerning thine own actions, whether thou doest nothing either idly or otherwise, then justice and equity do require. 
and concerning those things that happen unto thee externally, that either they happen unto thee by chance or by providence, of which two to accuse either is equally against reason. Secondly, what like unto our bodies are whilest yet rude and imperfect, until they be animated, and from their animation until their expiration, of what things they are compounded, and into what things they shall be dissolved. Thirdly, how vain all things will appear unto thee when, from on high as it were, looking down thou shalt contemplate all things upon earth, and the wonderful mutability that they are subject unto, considering withal the infinite both greatness and variety of things aerial and things celestial that are round about it, and that as often as thou shalt behold them, thou shalt still see the same, as the same things, so the same shortness of continuance of all those things. And behold, these be the things that we are so proud and puffed up for. 19. Cast away from thee opinion, and thou art safe. And what is it that hinders thee from casting of it away? When thou art grieved at anything, hast thou forgotten that all things happen according to the nature of the universe? and that him only it concerns who is in fault, and moreover that what is now done is that which from ever hath been done in the world and will ever be done and is now done everywhere. How nearly all men are allied one to another by a kindred not of blood nor of seed but of the same mind. Thou hast also forgotten that every man's mind partakes of the deity and issueth from thence and that no man can properly call anything his own no, not his son, nor his body, nor his life. For that they all proceed from that one who is the giver of all things, that all things are but opinion, that no man lives properly, but that very instant of time which is now present, and therefore that no man, whensoever he dieth, can properly be said to lose any more than an instant of time. 20. Let thy thoughts ever run upon them, who once for some one thing or other were moved with extraordinary indignation, who were once in the highest pitch of either honor or calamity, or mutual hatred and enmity, or of any other fortune or condition whatsoever. Then consider what's now become of all those things. All is turned to smoke, all to ashes, and a mere fable, and perchance not so much as a fable, as also whatsoever is of this nature, as Fabius Catilinus in the field, Lucius Lupus, and Stertinius, at Baie Tiberius, at Capre and Velius Rufus, and all such examples of vehement prosecution in worldly matters. Let these also run in thy mind at the same time, and how vile every object of such earnest and vehement prosecution is, and how much more agreeable to true philosophy it is for a man to carry himself in every matter that offers itself, justly and moderately, as one that followeth the gods with all simplicity. For for a man to be proud and high conceited that he is not proud and high conceited is of all kind of pride and presumption the most intolerable. 21. To them that ask thee, where hast thou seen the gods, or how knowest thou certainly that there be gods, that thou art so devout in their worship? I answer first of all, that even to the very eye they are in some manner visible and apparent, Secondly, neither have I ever seen mine own soul, and yet I respect and honor it. So then for the gods, by the daily experience that I have of their power and providence towards myself and others, I know certainly that they are, and therefore worship them. 22. Herein doth consist happiness of life, for a man to know thoroughly the true nature of everything, what is the matter and what is the form of it, with all his heart and soul, ever to do that which is just, and to speak the truth. What then remaineth but to enjoy thy life in a course and coherence of good actions, one upon another immediately succeeding and never interrupted, though for never so little a while? 23. There is but one light of the sun, though it be intercepted by walls and mountains, and other thousand objects. There is but one common substance of the whole world, though it be concluded and restrained into several different bodies, 
in number infinite. There is but one common soul, though divided into innumerable particular essences and natures. So is there but one common intellectual soul, though it seem to be divided. And as for all other parts of those generals which we have mentioned as either sensitive souls or subjects, these of themselves, as naturally irrational, have no common mutual reference one unto another, though many of them contain a mind or reasonable faculty in them, whereby they are ruled and governed. But of every reasonable mind, this the particular nature, that it hath reference to whatsoever is of her own kind, and desireth to be united, neither can this common affection, or mutual unity and correspondency, be here intercepted or divided, or confined to particulars as those other common things are. 24. What dost thou desire? To live long. What? To enjoy the operations of a sensitive soul, or of the appetitive faculty? Or wouldst thou grow, and then decrease again? Wouldst thou long be able to talk, to think and reason with thyself? Which of all these seems unto thee a worthy object of thy desire? Now if of all these thou doest find that they be but little worth in themselves, proceed on unto the last, which is in all things to follow God and reason. But for a man to grieve that by death he shall be deprived of any of these things, is both against God and reason. 5. What a small portion of vast and infinite eternity it is that is allowed unto every one of us, and how soon it vanisheth into the general age of the world, of the common substance and of the common soul also, what a small portion is allotted unto us, and in what a little clod of the whole earth, as it were, it is that thou doest crawl. After thou shalt rightly have considered these things with thyself, Fancy not anything else in the world any more to be of any weight and moment but this, to do that only which thine own nature doth require, and to conform thyself to that which the common nature doth afford. 26. What is the present estate of my understanding? For herein lieth all indeed. As for all other things, they are without the compass of mine own will. And if without the compass of my will, then are they as dead things unto me, and as it were mere smoke. 27. To stir up a man to the contempt of death, this among other things, is of good power and efficacy, that even they who esteemed pleasure to be happiness, and pain misery, did nevertheless many of them contemn death as much as any. And can death be terrible to him, to whom that only seems good, which in the ordinary course of nature is seasonable, to him, to whom, whether his actions be many or few, so they be all good, is all one. And who, whether he behold the things of the world being always the same, either for many years or for few years only, is altogether indifferent. O man, as a citizen thou hast lived and conversed in this great city the world, whether just for so many years or no, what is it unto thee? Thou hast lived, Thou mayest be sure, as long as the laws and orders of the city required, which may be the common comfort of all, why then should it be grievous unto thee, if not a tyrant, nor an unjust judge? But the same nature that brought thee in doth now send thee out of the world, as if the praetor should fairly dismiss him from the stage whom he had taken in to act a while. Oh, but the play is not yet at an end, there are but three acts yet acted of it. Thou hast well said, for in matter of life, three acts is the whole play. Now to set a certain time to every man's acting belongs unto him only, who as first he was of thy composition, so is now the cause of thy dissolution. As for thyself, thou hast to do with neither. Go thy ways, then well pleased and contented, for so is he that dismisseth thee. The Discourses by Epictetus, Book 1, Chapter 1 Of the things which are in our power and not in our power Of all the faculties you will find not one which is capable of contemplating itself, and, consequently, not capable either of approving or disapproving. How far does the grammatic art possess the contemplating power? 
as far as forming a judgment about what is written and spoken, and how far music, as far as judging about melody, does either of them then contemplate itself? By no means. But when you must write something to your friend, grammar will tell you what words you must write. But whether you should write or not, grammar will not tell you. And so it is with music as to musical sounds. But whether you should sing at the present time and play on the lute, or do neither, music will not tell you. What faculty then will tell you? That which contemplates both itself and all other things. And what is this faculty? The rational faculty. For this is the only faculty that we have received which examines itself, what it is, and what power it has, and what is the value of this gift, and examines all other faculties. For what else is there which tells us that golden things are beautiful? For they do not say so themselves. Evidently it is the faculty which is capable of judging of appearances. What else judges of music, grammar, and other faculties proves their uses and points out the occasions for using them. Nothing else. As then it was fit to be so, that which is best of all and supreme over all is the only thing which the gods have placed in our power, the right use of appearances. But all other things they have not placed in our power. Was it because they did not choose? I indeed think that if they had been able, they would have put these other things also in our power, but they certainly could not. For as we exist on the earth, and are bound to such a body and to such companions, how was it possible for us not to be hindered as to these things by externals? But what says Zeus? Epictetus, if it were possible, I would have made both your little body and your little property free and not exposed to hindrance. But now be not ignorant of this, this body is not yours, but it is clay finely tempered. And since I was not able to do for you what I have mentioned, I have given you a small portion of us. This faculty of pursuing an object and avoiding it, and the faculty of desire and aversion, and in a word the faculty of using the appearances of things. And if you will take care of this faculty and consider it your only possession, you will never be hindered, never meet with impediments. You will not lament, you will not blame, you will not flatter any person. Well, do these seem to you small matters? I hope not. Be content with them then and pray to the gods. But now, when it is in our power to look after one thing and to attach ourselves to it, we prefer to look after many things, and to be bound to many things, to the body and to property, and to brother and to friend, and to child and to slave. Since then we are bound to many things, we are depressed by them and dragged down. For this reason, when the weather is not fit for sailing, we sit down and torment ourselves, and continually look out to see what wind is blowing. It is north. What is that to us? When will the west wind blow? When it shall choose, my good man, or when it shall please Aeolus? For God has not made you the manager of the winds, but Aeolus. What then? We must make the best use that we can of the things which are in our power, and use the rest according to their nature. What is their nature then? As God may please. Must I then alone have my head cut off? What? Would you have all men lose their heads that you may be consoled? Will you not stretch out your neck as Lateranus did at Rome, when Nero ordered him to be beheaded? For when he had stretched out his neck, and received a feeble blow, which made him draw it in for a moment, he stretched it out again. And a little before, when he was visited by Epaphroditus, Nero's freedman, who asked him about the cause of offense which he had given, he said, If I choose to tell anything, I will tell your master.
What then should a man have in readiness in such circumstances? What else then, what is mine, and what is not mine, and permitted to me, and what is not permitted to me? I must die. Must I then die lamenting? I must be put in chains. Must I then also lament? I must go into exile. Does any man then hinder me from going with smiles and cheerfulness and contentment? Tell me the secret which you possess. I will not, for this is in my power. But I will put you in chains. Man, what are you talking about? Me in chains? You may fetter my leg, but my will not even Zeus himself can overpower. I will throw you into prison. My poor body, you mean. I will cut your head off. When, then, have I told you that my head alone cannot be cut off? These are the things which philosophers should meditate on, which they should write daily, in which they should exercise themselves. Thrasea used to say, I would rather be killed today than banished tomorrow. What, then, did Rufus say to him? If you choose death as the heavier misfortune, how great is the folly of your choice? But if, as the lighter, who has given you the choice? Will you not study to be content with that which has been given to you? What, then, did Agrippina say? He said, I am not a hindrance to myself. When it was reported to him that his trial was going on in the Senate, he said, I hope it may turn out well but it is the fifth hour of the day. This was the time when he was used to exercise himself and then take the cold bath. Let us go and take our exercise. After he had taken his exercise, one comes and tells him, You have been condemned. To banishment, he replies, or to death. To banishment. What about my property? It is not taken from you. Let us go to Aresia then, he said and dine. This it is to have studied what a man ought to study, to have made desire, aversion, free from hindrance, and free from all that a man would avoid. I must die, if now I am ready to die, if after a short time I now dine because it is the dinner hour, after this I will then die. How? Like a man who gives up what belongs to another. Book 1, Chapter 2 how a man on every occasion can maintain his proper character. To the rational animal only is the irrational intolerable, but that which is rational is tolerable. Blows are not naturally intolerable. How is that? See how the Lacedaemonians endure whipping when they have learned that whipping is consistent with reason. To hang yourself is not intolerable. When, then, you have the opinion that it is rational, you go and hang yourself. In short, if we observe, we shall find that the animal man is pained by nothing so much as by that which is irrational, and, on the contrary, attracted to nothing so much as to that which is rational. But the rational and the irrational appear such in a different way to different persons, just as the good and the bad, the profitable and the unprofitable. For this reason particularly, we need discipline in order to learn how to adapt the preconception of the rational and the irrational to the several things conformably to nature. But in order to determine the rational and the irrational, we use not only the of external things, but we consider also what is appropriate to each person. For to one man it is consistent with reason to hold a chamber pot for another, and to look to this only, that if he does not hold it, he will receive stripes and he will not receive his food. But if he shall hold the pot, he will not suffer anything hard or disagreeable. But to another man not only does the holding of a chamber pot appear intolerable for himself, but intolerable also for him to allow another to do this office for him. If, then, you ask me whether you should hold the chamber pot or not, I shall say to you that the receiving of food is worth more than the not receiving of it, and the being scourged is a greater indignity than not being scourged, so that if you measure your interests by these things, go and hold the chamber pot. But this, 
you say, would not be worthy of me. Well then, it is you who must introduce this consideration into the inquiry, not I, for it is you who know yourself, how much you are worth to yourself, and at what price you sell yourself. For men sell themselves at various prices. For this reason, when Florus was deliberating whether he should go down to Nero's spectacles and also perform in them himself, Agrippinus said to him, Go down. And when Florus asked Agrippinus, Why do not you go down? Agrippinus replied, Because I do not even deliberate about the matter. For he who has once brought himself to deliberate about such matters, and to calculate the value of external things, comes very near to those who have forgotten their own character. For why do you ask me the question, whether death is preferable or life? I say, life. Pain or pleasure? I say, pleasure. But if I do not take a part in the tragic acting, I shall have my head struck off. Go then and take a part. But I will not. Why? Because you consider yourself to be only one thread of those which are in the tunic. Well, then it was fitting for you to take care how you should be like the rest of men, just as the thread has no design to be anything superior to the other threads. But I wish to be purple, that small part which is bright and makes all the rest appear graceful and beautiful. Why then do you tell me to make myself like the many? And if I do, how shall I still be purple? Priscus Helvidius also saw this and acted conformably. For when Vespasian sent and commanded him not to go into the Senate, he replied, it is in your power not to allow me to be a member of the Senate, but so long as I am, I must go in. Well, go in then, says the Emperor, but say nothing. Do not ask my opinion, and I will be silent. But I must ask your opinion, and I must say what I think right. But if you do, I shall put you to death. When then did I tell you that I am immortal? You will do your part, and I will do mine. It is your part to kill, it is mine to die, but not in fear, yours to banish me, mine to depart without sorrow. What good then did Priscus do, who was only a single person? And what good does the purple do for the toga? Why, what else than this? That it is conspicuous in the toga as purple, and is displayed also as a fine example to all other things. But in such circumstances, another would have replied to Caesar, who forbade him to enter the Senate, I thank you for sparing me. But such a man Vespasian would not even have forbidden to enter the Senate, for he knew that he would either sit there like an earthen vessel, or if he spoke, he would say what Caesar wished, and add even more. In this way, an athlete also acted who was in danger of dying unless his private parts were amputated. His brother came to the athlete who was a philosopher and said, Come, brother, what are you going to do? Shall we amputate this member and return to the gymnasium? But the athlete persisted in his resolution and died. When someone asked Epictetus how he did this, as an athlete or a philosopher, as a man, Epictetus replied, and a man who had been proclaimed among the athletes at the Olympic Games and had contended in them, a man who had been familiar with such a place, and not merely anointed in Batten's school. Another would have allowed even his head to be cut off, if he could have lived without it. Such is that regard to character which is so strong in those who have been accustomed to introduce it of themselves and conjoined with other things into their deliberations. Come then, Epictetus, shave yourself. If I am a philosopher, I answer, I will not shave myself, but I will take off your head. If that will do you any good, take it off. Some person asked, how then shall every man among us perceive what is suitable to his character? How, he replied, does the bull alone, when the lion has attacked, discover his own powers and put himself forward in defense of the whole herd? It is plain that with the powers, the perception of having them is immediately conjoined. And therefore, whoever of us has such powers will not be ignorant of them. Now a bull is not made suddenly, nor a brave man, but we must discipline ourselves in the winter for the summer campaign, 
and not rashly run upon that which does not concern us. Only consider at what price you sell your own will, if for no other reason, at least for this, that you sell it not for a small sum. But that which is great and superior perhaps belongs to Socrates, and such as are like him. Why then, if we are naturally such, are not a very great number of us like him? Is it true then that all horses become swift, that all dogs are skilled in tracking footprints? What then, since I am naturally dull, shall I for this reason take no pains? I hope not. Epictetus is not superior to Socrates, but if he is not inferior, this is enough for me. For I shall never be a Milo, and yet I do not neglect my body, nor shall I be a Croesus, and yet I do not neglect my property. Nor, in a word, do we neglect looking after anything because we despair of reaching the highest degree. Book 1, Chapter 3 How a man should proceed from the principle of God being the father of all men to the rest. If a man should be able to assent to this doctrine as he ought, that we are all sprung from God in an especial manner, and that God is the father both of men and of gods, I suppose that he would never have any ignoble or mean thoughts about himself. But if Caesar should adopt you, no one could endure your arrogance. And if you know that you are the son of Zeus, will you not be elated? Yet we do not so. But since these two things are mingled in the generation of man, body in common with the animals, and reason and intelligence in common with the gods, many incline to this kinship, which is miserable and mortal, and some few to that which is divine and happy. Since then it is of necessity that every man uses everything according to the opinion which he has about it. Those, the few, who think that they are formed for fidelity and modesty and assure use of appearances, have no mean or ignoble thoughts about themselves. But with the many it is quite the contrary. For they say, What am I? a poor, miserable man with my wretched bit of flesh. Wretched. Indeed, but you possess something better than your bit of flesh. Why then do you neglect that which is better, and why do you attach yourself to this? Through this kinship with the flesh, some of us inclining to it become like wolves, faithless and treacherous and mischievous. Some become like lions, savage and untamed but the greater part of us become foxes and other worse animals. For what else is a slanderer and a malignant man than a fox, or some other more wretched and meaner animal? See, then, and take care that you do not become some one of these miserable things. Book 1, Chapter 4 Of Progress or Improvement He who is making progress, having learned from philosophers that desire means the desire of good things, and aversion means aversion from bad things, having learned, too, that happiness and tranquility are not attainable by man otherwise than by not failing to obtain what he desires and not falling into that which he would avoid. Such a man takes from himself desire altogether and defers it, but he employs his aversion only on things which are dependent on his will. For if he attempts to avoid anything independent of his will, he knows that sometimes he will fall in with something which he wishes to avoid, and he will be unhappy. Now if virtue promises good fortune and tranquility and happiness, certainly also the progress toward virtue is progress toward each of these things. For it is always true that to whatever point the perfecting of anything leads us, progress is an approach toward this point. How then do we admit that virtue is such as I have said, and yet seek progress in other things and make a display of it, what is the product of virtue? Tranquility. Who then makes improvement? It is he who has read many books of Chrysippus. But does virtue consist in having understood Chrysippus? If this is so, progress is clearly nothing else than knowing a great deal of Chrysippus. But now we admit that virtue produces one thing, and we declare that approaching near to it is another thing, namely, progress or improvement. Such a person, says one, is already able to read Chrysippus by himself. Indeed, sir, you are making great progress. What kind of progress? 
But why do you mock the man? Why do you draw him away from the perception of his own misfortunes? Will you not show him the effect of virtue that he may learn where to look for improvement? Seek it there, wretch, where your work lies. And where is your work? In desire and in aversion, that you may not be disappointed in your desire, and that you may not fall into that which you would avoid, in your pursuit and avoiding, that you commit no error, in assent and suspension of assent, that you be not deceived. The first things and the most necessary are those which I have named. But if with trembling and lamentation you seek not to fall into that which you avoid, tell me how you are improving. Do you then show me your improvement in these things? If I were talking to an athlete, I should say, show me your shoulders. And then he might say, here are my halteres. You and your halteres look to that. I should reply, I wish to see the effect of the halteres. So, when you say, take the treatise on the active powers and see how I have studied it, I reply, slave, I am not inquiring about this, but how you exercise pursuit and avoidance, desire and aversion, how you design and purpose and prepare yourself, whether conformably to nature or not. If conformably, give me evidence of it, and I will say that you are making progress, but if not conformably, be gone, and not only expound your books, but write such books yourself. And what will you gain by it? Do you not know that the whole book costs only five denarii? Does then the expounder seem to be worth more than five denarii? Never then, look for the matter itself in one place, and progress toward it in another. Where then is progress? If any of you, withdrawing himself from externals, turns to his own will to exercise it, and to improve it by labor, so as to make it conformable to nature, elevated, free, unrestrained, unimpeded, faithful, modest. And if he has learned that he who desires or avoids the things which are not in his power can neither be faithful nor free, but of necessity he must change with them and be tossed about with them as in a tempest, and of necessity must subject himself to others who have the power to procure or prevent what he desires or would avoid, Finally, when he rises in the morning, if he observes and keeps these rules, bathes as a man of fidelity, eats as a modest man, in like manner, if in every matter that occurs he works out his chief principles as the runner does with reference to running, and the trainer of the voice with reference to the voice. This is the man who truly makes progress, and this is the man who has not traveled in vain. But if he has strained his efforts to the practice of reading books and labors only at this, and has traveled for this, I tell him to return home immediately, and not to neglect his affairs there. For this for which he has traveled is nothing. But the other thing is something to study how a man can rid his life of lamentation and groaning, and saying, Woe to me, and wretched that I am and to rid it also of misfortune and disappointment, and to learn what death is and exile and prison and poison, that he may be able to say when he is in fetters, Dear Crito, if it is the will of the gods that it be so, let it be so. And not to say, Wretched am I, an old man. Have I kept my gray hairs for this? Who is it that speaks thus? Do you think that I shall name some man of no repute and of low condition? Does not Priam say this? Does not Oedipus say this? Nay, all kings say it. For what else is tragedy than the perturbations of men who value externals exhibited in this kind of poetry? But if a man must learn by fiction that no external things which are independent of the will concern us for this, part I should like this fiction, by the aid of which I should live happily and undisturbed, but you must consider for yourselves what you wish. What then does Chrysippus teach us? The reply is, to know that these things are not false, from which happiness comes and tranquility arises. Take my books, and you will learn how true and conformable to nature are the things which make me free from perturbations. O oh, great good fortune, O oh, the great benefactor who points out the way.
To Triptolemus all men have erected temples and altars, because he gave us food by cultivation. But to him who discovered truth and brought it to light and communicated it to all, not the truth which shows us how to live, but how to live well. Who of you for this reason has built an altar, or a temple, or has dedicated a statue, or who worships God for this? Because the gods have given the vine, or wheat, we sacrifice to them. But because they have produced in the human mind that fruit by which they design to show us the truth which relates to happiness, shall we not thank God for this? Book 1 Chapter 5 Against the Academics If a man, said Epictetus, opposes evident truths, it is not easy to find arguments by which we shall make him change his opinion. But this does not arise either from the man's strength or the teacher's weakness. For when the man, though he has been confuted, is hardened like a stone, how shall we then be able to deal with him by argument? Now there are two kinds of hardening, one of the understanding, the other of the sense of shame. When a man is resolved not to assent to what is manifest, nor to desist from contradictions. Most of us are afraid of mortification of the body and would contrive all means to avoid such a thing. But we care not about the soul's mortification. And indeed, with regard to the soul, if a man be in such a state as not to apprehend anything or understand at all, we think that he is in a bad condition. But if the sense of shame and modesty are deadened, this we call even power, do you comprehend that you are awake? I do not, the man replies, for I do not even comprehend when in my sleep I imagine that I am awake. Does this appearance then not differ from the other? Not at all, he replies. Shall I still argue with this man? And what fire or what iron shall I apply to him to make him feel that he is deadened? He does perceive, but he pretends that he does not. He's even worse than a dead man. He does not see the contradiction. He is in a bad condition. Another does see it, but he is not moved and makes no improvement. He is even in a worse condition. His modesty is extirpated and his sense of shame and the rational faculty has not been cut off from him, but it is brutalized. Shall I name this strength of mind? Certainly not unless we also name it such in catamites, through which they do and say in public whatever comes into their head. Book 1, Chapter 6 Of Providence From everything which is or happens in the world, it is easy to praise providence if a man possesses these two qualities, the faculty of seeing what belongs and happens to all persons and things, and a grateful disposition. If he does not possess these two qualities, one man will not see the use of things which are and which happen. Another will not be thankful for them, even if he does know them. If God had made colors, but had not made the faculty of seeing them, what would have been their use? None at all. On the other hand, if he had made the faculty of vision, but had not made objects, Book 1, Chapter 7 of the use of sophistical arguments, and hypothetical, and the like. The handling of sophistical and hypothetical arguments, and of those which derive their conclusions from questioning, and in a word the handling of all such arguments, relates to the duties of life, though the many do not know this truth. For in every matter we inquire how the wise and good man shall discover the proper path and the proper method of dealing with the matter. Let then, people either say that the grave man will not descend into the contest of question and answer, or that, if he does descend into the contest, he will take no care about not conducting himself rashly or carelessly in questioning and answering. But if they do not allow either the one or the other of these things, they must admit that some inquiry ought to be made into those topics on which particularly questioning and answering are employed. For what is the end proposed in reasoning? To establish true propositions, 
to remove the false, to withhold assent from those which are not plain. Is it enough then to have learned only this? It is enough, a man may reply. Is it then also enough for a man who would not make a mistake in the use of coined money to have heard this precept, that he should receive the genuine drachmae and reject the spurious? It is not enough. What then ought to be added to this precept? What else than the faculty which proves and distinguishes the genuine and the spurious drachmae? Consequently also in reasoning what has been said is not enough. But is it necessary that a man should acquire the faculty of examining and distinguishing the true and the false, and that which is not plain? It is necessary. Besides this, what is proposed in reasoning? That you should accept what follows from that which you have properly granted. Well, is it then enough in this case also to know this? It is not enough. But a man must learn how one thing is a consequence of other things, and when one thing follows from one thing, and when it follows from several collectively. Consider then if it be not necessary that this power should also be acquired by him who purposes to conduct himself skillfully in reasoning, the power of demonstrating himself the several things which he has proposed, and the power of understanding the demonstrations of others, including of not being deceived by sophists, as if they were demonstrating. Therefore there has arisen among us the practice and exercise of conclusive arguments and figures, and it has been shown to be necessary. But in fact, in some cases, we have properly granted the premises or assumptions, and there results from them something, and though it is not true, yet nonetheless it does result. What then ought I to do? Ought I to admit the falsehood? And how is that possible? Well, should I say that I did not properly grant that which we agreed upon? But you are not allowed to do even this. Shall I then say that the consequence does not arise through what has been conceded? But neither is it allowed. What then must be done in this case? Consider if it is not this. As to have borrowed is not enough to make a man still a debtor. But to this must be added the fact that he continues to owe the money and that the debt is not paid. So it is not enough to compel you to admit the inference that you have granted the premises, but you must abide by what you have granted. Indeed, if the premises continue to the end, such as they were when they were granted, it is absolutely necessary for us to abide by what we have granted, and we must accept their consequences. But if the premises do not remain such as they were when they were granted, it is absolutely necessary for us also to withdraw from what we granted, and from accepting what does not follow from the words in which our concessions were made. For the inference is now not our inference, nor does it result with our assent, since we have withdrawn from the premises which we granted. We ought then both to examine such kind of premises, and such change and variation of them, by which in the course of questioning or answering, or in making the syllogistic conclusion, or in any other such way, the premises undergo variations, and give occasion to the foolish to be confounded, if they do not see what conclusions are. For what reason ought we to examine, in order that we may not in this matter be employed in an improper manner, nor in a confused way? and the same in hypotheses and hypothetical arguments. For it is necessary sometimes to demand the granting of some hypothesis as a kind of passage to the argument which follows. Must we then allow every hypothesis that is proposed, or not allow every one? And if not every one, which should we allow? And if a man has allowed an hypothesis, must he in every case abide by allowing it? Or must he sometimes withdraw from it, but admit the consequences and not admit contradictions? Yes, but suppose that a man says, If you admit the hypothesis of a possibility, I will draw you to an impossibility. 
With such a person shall a man of sense refuse to enter into a contest and avoid discussion and conversation with him. But what other man than the man of sense can use argumentation and is skillful in questioning and answering and incapable of being cheated and deceived by false reasoning? And shall he enter into the contest and yet not take care whether he shall engage in argument not rashly and not carelessly? And if he does not take care, how can he be such a man as we conceive him to be? But without some such exercise and preparation, can he maintain a continuous and consistent argument? Let them show this, and all these speculations become superfluous, and are absurd and inconsistent with our notion of a good and serious man. Why are we still indolent and negligent and sluggish, and why do we seek pretenses for not laboring and not being watchful in cultivating our reason? If then I shall make a mistake in these matters, may I not have killed my father? Slave, where was there a father in this matter that you could kill him? What then have you done? The only fault that was possible here is the fault which you have committed. This is the very remark which I made to Rufus when he blamed me for not having discovered the one thing omitted in a certain syllogism. I suppose, I said, that I have burnt the capital. Slave, he replied, was the thing omitted here the capital? Or are these the only crimes to burn the capital and to kill your father, but for a man to use the appearances resented to him rashly and foolishly and carelessly? not to understand argument, nor demonstration, nor sophism, nor, in a word, to see in questioning and answering what is consistent with that which we have granted or is not consistent. Is there no error in this? Book 1, Chapter 8 That the faculties are not safe to the uninstructed. In as many ways as we can change things which are equivalent to one another, in just so many ways we can change the forms of arguments and in thy memes in argumentation. This is an instance. If you have borrowed and not repaid, you owe me the money. You have not borrowed and you have not repaid. Then you do not owe me the money. To do this skillfully is suitable to no man more than to the philosopher. For if the in thy meme is all imperfect syllogism, it is plain that he who has been exercised in the perfect syllogism must be equally expert in the imperfect also. Why then do we not exercise ourselves and one another in this manner? Because, I reply, at present, though we are not exercised in these things and not distracted from the study of morality, by me at least, still we make no progress in virtue. What then must we expect if we should add this occupation? And particularly as this would not only be an occupation which would withdraw us from more necessary things, but would also be a cause of self-conceit and arrogance, and no small cause. For great is the power of arguing, and the faculty of persuasion, and particularly if it should be much exercised, and also receive additional ornament from language. And so universally, every faculty acquired by the uninstructed and weak brings with it the danger of these persons being elated and inflated by it. For by what means could one persuade a young man who excels in these matters that he ought not to become an appendage to them, but to make them an appendage to himself? Does he not trample on all such reasons and strut before us elated and inflated, not enduring that any man should reprove him and remind him of what he has neglected and to what he has turned aside? What then was not Plato a philosopher, I reply, and was not Hippocrates a physician? But you see how Hippocrates speaks. Does Hippocrates then speak thus in respect of being a physician? Why do you mingle things which have been accidentally united in the same men? And if Plato was handsome and strong, ought I also to set to work and endeavor to become handsome or strong, as if this was necessary for philosophy, because a certain philosopher was at the same time handsome and a philosopher? 
will you not choose to see and to distinguish in respect to what men become philosophers and what things belong to belong to them in other respects? And if I were a philosopher, ought you also to be made lame? What then? Do I take away these faculties which you possess? By no means, for neither do I take away the faculty of seeing. But if you ask me what is the good of man, I cannot mention to you anything else than that it is a certain disposition of the will with respect to appearances. Book 1, Chapter 9 How from the fact that we are akin to God a man may proceed to the consequences. If the things are true which are said by the philosophers about the kinship between God and man, what else remains for men to do than what Socrates did? Never in reply to the question, to what country you belong, say that you are an Athenian or a Corinthian, but that you are a citizen of the world. For why do you say that you are an Athenian? And why do you not say that you belong to the small nook only into which your poor body was cast at birth? Is it not plain that you call yourself an Athenian or Corinthian from the place which has a greater authority and comprises not only that small nook itself and all your family, but even the whole country from which the stock of your progenitors is derived down to you? He then who has observed with intelligence the administration of the world and has learned that the greatest and supreme and the most comprehensive community is that which is composed of men and God, and that from God have descended the seeds not only to my father and grandfather, but to all beings which are generated on the earth and are produced, and particularly to rational beings. For these only are by their nature formed to have communion with God, being by means of reason conjoined with him. Why should not such a man call himself a citizen of the world? Why not a son of God? And why should he be afraid of anything which happens among men? Is kinship with Caesar or with any other of the powerful in Rome sufficient to enable us to live in safety and above contempt and without any fear at all? And to have God for your maker and father and guardian, shall not this release us from sorrows and fears? But a man may say, Whence shall I get bread to eat when I have nothing? And how do slaves and runaways? On what do they rely when they leave their masters? Do they rely on their lands or slaves or their vessels of silver? They rely on nothing but themselves, and food does not fail them. And shall it be necessary for one among us who is a philosopher to travel into foreign parts and trust to and rely on others? and not to take care of himself, and shall he be inferior to irrational animals and more cowardly, each of which, being self-sufficient, neither fails to get its proper food, nor to find a suitable way of living, and one conformable to nature? I indeed think that the old man ought to be sitting here, not to contrive how you may have no mean thoughts, nor mean and ignoble talk about yourselves but to take care that there be not among us any young men of such a mind that when they have recognized their kinship to God and that we are fettered by these bonds, the body, I mean, and its possessions and whatever else on account of them is necessary to us for the economy and commerce of life, they should intend to throw off these things as if they were burdens painful and intolerable and to depart to their kinsmen. But this is the labor that your teacher and instructor ought to be employed upon, if he really were what he should be. You should come to him and say, Epictetus, we can no longer endure being bound to this poor body, and feeding it and giving it drink and rest and cleaning it, and for the sake of the body complying with the wishes of these and of those. Are not these things indifferent and nothing to us? And is not death no evil? And are we not in a manner kinsmen of God, and did we not come from Him? Allow us to depart to the place from which we came. Allow us to be released at last from these bonds by which we are bound and weighed down. Here there are robbers and thieves and courts of justice, and those who are named tyrants, 
and think that they have some power over us by means of the body and its possessions, permit us to show them that they have no power over any man. And I, on my part, would say, Friends, wait for God. When he shall give the signal and release you from this service, then go to him. But for the present, endure to dwell in this place where he has put you. Short indeed is this time of your dwelling here, and easy to bear for those who are so disposed. For what tyrant or what thief or what courts of justice are formidable to those who have thus considered as things of no value the body and the possessions of the body? Wait then, do not depart without a reason. Something like this ought to be said by the teacher to ingenuous youths. But now what happens? The teacher is a lifeless body, and you are lifeless bodies. When you have been well filled today, you sit down and lament about the morrow, how you shall get something to eat. Wretch, if you have it, you will have it. If you have it not, you will depart from life. The door is open. Why do you grieve? Where does there remain any room for tears? And where is there occasion for flattery? Why shall one man envy another? Why should a man admire the rich or the powerful, even if they be both very strong and of violent temper? For what will they do to us? We shall not care for that which they can do, and what we do care for that they cannot do. How did Socrates behave with respect to these matters? Why, in what other way than a man ought to do who was convinced that he was a kinsman of the gods? If you say to me now, said Socrates to his judges, we will acquit you on the condition that you no longer discourse in the way in which you have hitherto discoursed, nor trouble either our young or our old men, I shall answer. You make yourselves ridiculous by thinking that if one of our commanders has appointed me to a certain post, it is my duty to keep and maintain it, and to resolve to die a thousand times rather than desert it. But if God has put us in any place and way of life, we ought to desert it. Socrates speaks like a man who is really a kinsman of the gods, but we think about ourselves as if we were only stomachs and intestines and shameful parts. We fear, we desire, we flatter those who are able to help us in these matters, and we fear them also. A man asked me to write to Rome about him, a man who, as most people thought, had been unfortunate, for formerly he was a man of rank and rich, but had been stripped of all, and was living here, I wrote on his behalf in a submissive manner. But when he had read the letter, he gave it back to me and said, I wished for your help, not your pity. No evil has happened to me. Thus also Musonius Rufus, in order to try me, used to say, This and this will befall you from your master. And I replied that these were things which happen in the ordinary course of human affairs. Why then, said he, should I ask him for anything when I can obtain it from you? For in fact, what a man has from himself, it is superfluous and foolish to receive from another. Shall I then, who am able to receive from myself greatness of soul and a generous spirit, receive from you land and money or a magisterial office? I hope not. I will not be so ignorant about my own possessions. But when a man is cowardly and mean, what else must be done for him than to write letters as you would about a corpse? Please to grant us the body of a certain person, and a sextarius of poor blood. For such a person is, in fact, a carcass, and a sextarius of blood, and nothing more. But if he were anything more, he would know that one man is not miserable through the means of another. Book 1, Chapter 10 against those who eagerly seek preferment at Rome. If we applied ourselves as busily to our own work as the old men at Rome do to those matters about which they are employed, perhaps we also might accomplish something. I am acquainted with a man older than myself who is now superintendent of corn at Rome, 
and remember the time when he came here on his way back from exile, and what he said as he related the events of his former life, and how he declared that with respect to the future after his return, he would look after nothing else than passing the rest of his life in quiet and tranquility. For how little of life, he said, remains for me. I replied, you will not do it, but as soon as you smell Rome, you will forget all that you have said, and if admission is allowed even into the imperial palace, you will gladly thrust yourself in and thank God. If you find me, Epictetus, he answered, setting even one foot within the palace, think what you please. Well, what then did he do? Before he entered the city he was met by letters from Caesar, and as soon as he received them he forgot all, and ever after has added one piece of business to another. I wish that I were now by his side to remind him of what he said when he was passing this way, and to tell him how much better a seer I am than he is. Well then, do I say that man is an animal made for doing nothing? Certainly not. But why are we not active? For example, as to myself, as soon as day comes, in a few words I remind myself of what I must read over to my pupils. Then forthwith I say to myself, But what is it to me how a certain person shall read? The first thing for me is to sleep. And indeed, what resemblance is there between what other persons do and what we do? If you observe what they do, you will understand. And what else do they do all day long than make up accounts, inquire among themselves, give and take advice about some small quantity of grain, a bit of land, and such kind of profits? Is it then the same thing to receive a petition and to read in it? I entreat you to permit me to export a small quantity of corn, and one to this effect. I entreat you to learn from Chrysippus, what is the administration of the world, and what place in it the rational animal holds. Consider also who you are, and what is the nature of your good and bad. Are these things like the other? Do they require equal care, and is it equally base to neglect these and those? Well then, are we the only persons who are lazy and love sleep? No, but much rather you young men are. For we old men, when we see young men amusing themselves, are eager to play with them. And if I saw you active and zealous, much more should I be eager myself to join you in your serious pursuits. Book 1, Chapter 11 Of Natural Affection When he was visited by one of the magistrates, Epictetus inquired of him about several particulars and asked if he had children and a wife. The man replied that he had, and Epictetus inquired further how he felt under the circumstances. Miserable, the man said. Then Epictetus asked in what respect, for men do not marry and beget children in order to be wretched, but rather to be happy. But I, the man replied, am so wretched about my children that lately, when my little daughter was sick and was supposed to be in danger, I could not endure to stay with her, but I left home till a person sent me news that she had recovered. Well then, said Epictetus, do you think that you acted right? I acted naturally, the man replied, but convince me of this, that you acted naturally, and I will convince you that everything which takes place according to nature takes place rightly. This is the case, said the man, with all or at least most fathers. I do not deny that, but the matter about which we are inquiring is whether such behavior is right. For in respect to this matter, we must say that tumors also come for the good of the body, because they do come. And generally we must say that to do wrong is natural, because nearly all, or at least most of us, do wrong. Do you show me then how your behavior is natural? I cannot, he said. But do you rather show me how it is not according to nature and is not rightly done? Well said Epictetus, if we were inquiring about white and black, what criterion should we employ for distinguishing between them? The sight, he said. 
and if about hot and cold and hard and soft, what criterion? The touch. Well then, since we are inquiring about things which are according to nature, and those which are done rightly or not rightly, what kind of criterion do you think that we should employ? I do not know, he said, and yet not to know the criterion of colors and smells, and also of tastes, is perhaps no great harm. But if a man do not know the criterion of good and bad, and of things according to nature and contrary to nature, does this seem to you a small harm? The greatest harm, come tell me, do all things which seem to some persons to be good and becoming rightly appear such, and at present as to Jews and Syrians and Egyptians and Romans, is it possible that the opinions of all of them in respect to food are right? How is it possible, he said. Well, I suppose it is absolutely necessary that, if the opinions of the Egyptians are right, the opinions of the rest must be wrong. If the opinions of the Jews are right, those of the rest cannot be right. Certainly. But where there is ignorance, there also there is want of learning and training in things which are necessary. He assented to this. You then, said Epictetus, since you know this, for the future will employ yourself seriously about nothing else, and will apply your mind to nothing else than to learn the criterion of things which are according to nature, and by using it also to determine each several thing. But in the present matter I have so much as this to aid you toward what you wish. Does affection to those of your family appear to you to be according to nature and to be good? Certainly. Well, is such affection natural and good, and is a thing consistent with reason not good? By no means. Is then that which is consistent with reason in contradiction with affection? I think not. You are right. For if it is otherwise, it is necessary that one of the contradictions being according to nature, the other must be contrary to nature. Is it not so? It is, he said. Whatever then we shall discover to be at the same time affectionate and also consistent with reason, this we confidently declare to be right and good. Agreed. Well then, to leave your sick child and to go away is not reasonable, and I suppose that you will not say that it is. But it remains for us to inquire if it is consistent with affection. Yes, let us consider. Did you then, since you had an affectionate disposition to your child, do right when you ran off and left her? And has the mother no affection for the child? Certainly she has. Ought then the mother also to have left her, or ought she not? She ought not. And the nurse, does she love her? She does. Ought then she also to have left her? By no means. And the pedagogue, does he not love her? He does love her. Ought then he also to have deserted her? And so should the child have been left alone and without help on account of the great affection of you, the parents, and of those about her? Or should she have died in the hands of those who neither loved her nor cared for her? Certainly not. Now this is unfair and unreasonable, not to allow those who have equal affection with yourself to do what you think to be proper for yourself to do, because you have affection. It is absurd. Come then, if you were sick, would you wish your relations to be so affectionate, and all the rest, children and wife, as to leave you alone and deserted? By no means. And would you wish to be so loved by your own, that through their excessive affection you would always be left alone in sickness? Or for this reason would you rather pray, if it were possible, to be loved by your enemies and deserted by them? But if this is so, it results that your behavior was not at all an affectionate act. Well then, was it nothing which moved you and induced you to desert your child? And how is that possible? 
but it might be something of the kind which moved a man at Rome to wrap up his head while a horse was running which he favored. And when contrary to expectation the horse won, he required sponges to recover from his fainting fit. What then is the thing which moved? The exact discussion of this does not belong to the present occasion, perhaps, but it is enough to be convinced of this. If what the philosophers say is true, that we must not look for it anywhere without. But in all cases it is one and the same thing which is the cause of our doing or not doing something, of saying or not saying something, of being elated or depressed, of avoiding anything or pursuing, the very thing which is now the cause to me and to you, to you of coming to me and sitting and hearing, and to me of saying what I do say. And what is this? Is it any other than our will to do so? No other. But if we had willed otherwise, what else should we have been doing than that which we willed to do? This then was the cause of Achilles' lamentation, not the death of Patroclus. For another man does not behave thus on the death of his companion, but it was because he chose to do so. And to you this was the very cause of your then running away, that you chose to do so. And on the other side, if you should stay with her, the reason will be the same. And now you are going to Rome because you choose. And if you should change your mind, you will not go thither. And in a word, neither death nor exile nor pain nor anything of the kind is the cause of our doing anything or not doing, but our own opinions and our wills. Do I convince you of this or not? You do convince me. Such then as the causes are in each case, such also are the effects. When then we are doing anything not rightly, from this day we shall impute it to nothing else than to the will from which we have done it. And it is that which we shall endeavor to take away, and to extirpate more than the tumors and abscesses out of the body and in like manner we shall give the same account of the cause of the things which we do right. And we shall no longer allege as causes of any evil to us, either slave or neighbor, or wife or children, being persuaded that if we do not think things to he what we do think them to be, we do not the acts which follow from such opinions. And as to thinking or not thinking, that is in our power and not in externals, it is so, he said. From this day then we shall inquire into and examine nothing else, what its quality is or its state, neither land nor slaves nor horses nor dogs, nothing else than opinions. I hope so. You see then that you must become a scholasticus, an animal whom all ridicule, if you really intend to make an examination of your own opinions, and that this is not the work of one hour or day, you know yourself. Book 1, Chapter 12 Of Contentment With respect to gods, there are some who say that a divine being does not exist. Others say that it exists but is inactive and careless, and takes no forethought about anything. A third class say that such a being exists and exercises forethought, but only about great things and heavenly things, and about nothing on the earth. A fourth class say that a divine being exercises forethought both about things on the earth and heavenly things, but in a general way only, and not about things severally. There is a fifth class to whom Ulysses and Socrates belong, who say, I move not without thy knowledge. Before all other things, then, it is necessary to inquire about each of these opinions whether it is affirmed truly or not truly. For if there are no gods, how is it our proper end to follow them? And if they exist, but take no care of anything, in this case also, how will it be right to follow them? But if indeed they do exist and look after things, still if there is nothing communicated from them to men, nor in fact to myself, how even so is it right? The wise and good man, then, after considering all these things, submits his own mind to him who administers the whole, as good citizens do to the law of the state. 
He who is receiving instruction ought to come to the instructed with this intention. How shall I follow the gods in all things? How shall I be contented with the divine administration? And how can I become free? For he is free to whom everything happens according to his will and whom no man can hinder. What then? Is freedom madness? Certainly not for madness and freedom do not consist. But, you say, I would have everything result just as I like and in whatever way I like. You are mad, you are beside yourself. Do you not know that freedom is a noble and valuable thing? But for me inconsiderately to wish for things to happen as I inconsiderately like, this appears to be not only not noble, but even most base. For how do we proceed in the matter of writing? Do I wish to write the name of Dion as I choose? No, but I am taught to choose to write it as it ought to be written. And how with respect to music, in the same manner? And what universally in every art or science? Just the same. If it were not so, it would be of no value to know anything, if knowledge were adapted to every man's whim. Is it, then, in this alone, in this which is the greatest and the chief thing, I mean freedom, that I am permitted to will inconsiderately? By no means. But to be instructed is this, to learn to wish that everything may happen as it does. And how do things happen? As the disposer has disposed them, and he has appointed summer and winter, and abundance and scarcity, and virtue and vice, and all such opposites for the harmony of the whole. And to each of us he has given a body, and parts of the body, and possessions, and companions. Remembering then this disposition of things we ought to go to be instructed, not that we may change the constitution of things, for we have not the power to do it, nor is it better that we should have the power. But in order that as the things around us are what they are and by nature exist, we may maintain our minds in harmony with them things which happen. For can we escape from men? And how is it possible? And if we associate with them, can we chance them? Who gives us the power? What then remains, or what method is discovered of holding commerce with them? Is there such a method by which they shall do what seems fit to them, and we not the less shall be in a mood which is conformable to nature? but you are unwilling to endure and are discontented. And if you are alone, you call it solitude. And if you are with men, you call them knaves and robbers. And you find fault with your own parents and children and brothers and neighbors. But you ought, when you are alone, to call this condition by the name of tranquility and freedom and to think yourself like to the gods. And when you are with many, you ought not to call it crowd, nor trouble, nor uneasiness, but festival and assembly, and so accept all contentedly. What then is the punishment of those who do not accept? It is to be what they are. Is any person dissatisfied with being alone? Let him be alone. Is a man dissatisfied with his parents? Let him be a bad son and lament. Is he dissatisfied with his children? Let him be a bad father. Cast him into prison. What prison? Where he is already, for he is there against his will. And where a man is against his will, there he is in prison. So Socrates was not in prison, for he was there willingly. Must my leg then be lamed? Wretch, do you then on account of one poor leg find fault with the world? Will you not willingly surrender it for the whole? Will you not withdraw from it? Will you not gladly part with it to him who gave it? And will you be vexed and discontented with the things established by Zeus, which he with the Moirae who were present and spinning the thread of your generation defined and put in order? Know you not how small a part you are compared with the whole? I mean with respect to the body, for as to intelligence you are not inferior to the gods nor less. For the magnitude of intelligence is not measured by length nor yet by height, but by thoughts. Will you not then choose to place your good in that in which you are equal to the gods? Wretch that I am to have such a father and mother. 
What then was it permitted to you to come forth and to select and to say, Let such a man at this moment unite with such a woman that I may be produced? It was not permitted, but it was a necessity for your parents to exist first, and then for you to be begotten. Of what kind of parents? Of such as they were? Well then, since they are such as they are, is there no remedy given to you? Now, if you did not know for what purpose you possess the faculty of vision, you would be unfortunate and wretched if you closed your eyes when colors were brought before them. But in that you possess greatness of soul and nobility of spirit for every event that may happen, and you know not that you possess them, are you not more unfortunate and wretched? Things are brought close to you which are proportionate to the power which you possess, but you turn away this power most particularly at the very time when you ought to maintain it open and discerning. Do you not rather thank the gods that they have allowed you to be above these things which they have not placed in your power, and have made you accountable only for those which are in your power? As to your parents, the gods have left you free from responsibility, and so with respect to your brothers, and your body, and possessions, and death, and life. For what then have they made you responsible? For that which alone is in your power, the proper use of appearances. Why then do you draw on yourself the things for which you are not responsible? It is indeed a giving of trouble to yourself. Book 1, Chapter 13 How Everything May He Done Acceptably to the Gods When someone asked, how may a man eat acceptably to the gods, he answered, if he can eat justly and contentedly, and with equanimity, and temperately and orderly, will it not be also acceptably to the gods? But when you have asked for warm water and the slave has not heard, or if he did hear has brought only tepid water, or he is not even found to be in the house, then not to be vexed or to burst with passion, is not this acceptable to the gods? How then shall a man endure such persons as this slave? Slave yourself, will you not bear with your own brother, who has Zeus for his progenitor, and is like a son from the same seeds and of the same descent from above? But if you have been put in any such higher place, will you immediately make yourself a tyrant? Will you not remember who you are and whom you rule? that they are kinsmen, that they are brethren by nature, that they are the offspring of Zeus. But I have purchased them, and they have not purchased me. Do you see in what direction you are looking, that it is toward the earth, toward the pit, that it is toward these wretched laws of dead men? But toward the laws of the gods you are not looking. Book 1, Chapter 14 that the deity oversees all things. When a person asked him how a man could be convinced that all his actions are under the inspection of God, he answered, Do you not think that all things are united in one? I do, the person replied. Well, do you not think that earthly things have a natural agreement and union with heavenly things? I do. And how else so regularly as if by God's command when he bids the plants to flower, do they flower? When he bids them to send forth shoots, do they shoot? When he bids them to produce fruit, how else do they produce fruit? When he bids the fruit to ripen, does it ripen? When again he bids them to cast down the fruits, how else do they cast them down? And when to shed the leaves, do they shed the leaves? And when he bids them to fold themselves up and to remain quiet and rest, how else do they remain quiet and rest? And how else at the growth and the wane of the moon and at the approach and recession of the sun are so great an alteration and change to the contrary seen in earthly things? But our plants and our bodies so bound up and united with the whole and are not our souls much more? and our souls so bound up and in contact with God as parts of Him and portions of Him. And does not God perceive every motion of these parts as being His own motion connate with Himself? 
Now are you able to think of the divine administration and about all things divine and at the same time also about human affairs and to be moved by 10,000 things at the same time in your senses and in your understanding and to assent to some and to dissent from others and again as to some things to suspend your judgment. And do you retain in your soul so many impressions from so many and various things and being moved by them do you fall upon notions similar to those first impressed? And do you retain numerous arts and the memories of ten thousand things? And is not God able to oversee all things, and to be present with all, and to receive from all a certain communication? And is the sun able to illuminate so large a part of the all, and to leave so little not illuminated, that part only which is occupied by the earth's shadow? And he who made the sun itself and makes it go round, being a small part of himself compared with the whole, cannot he perceive all things? But I cannot, the man may reply, comprehend all these things at once. But who tells you that you have equal power with Zeus? Nevertheless, he has placed by every man a guardian, every man's demon, to whom he has committed the care of the man, a guardian who never sleeps, is never deceived. For to what better and more careful guardian could he have entrusted each of us? When, then, you have shut the doors and made darkness within, remember never to say that you are alone, for you are not. But God is within, and your demon is within. And what need have they of light to see what you are doing? To this God you ought to swear an oath, just as the soldiers do to Caesar. But they who are hired for pay swear to regard the safety of Caesar before all things. And you who have received so many and such great favors, will you not swear? Or when you have sworn, will you not abide by your oath? And what shall you swear? Never to be disobedient, never to make any charges, never to find fault with anything that he has given and never unwillingly to do or to suffer anything that is necessary. Is this oath like the soldier's oath? The soldiers swear not to prefer any man to Caesar. In this oath men swear to honor themselves before all. Book 1, Chapter 15 What Philosophy Promises When a man was consulting him how he should persuade his brother to cease being angry with him, Epictetus replied, Philosophy does not propose to secure for a man any external thing. If it did, philosophy would be allowing something which is not within its province. For as the carpenter's material is wood, and that of the statuary is copper, so the matter of the art of living is each man's life. What then is, my brothers? That again belongs to his own art, but with respect to yours it is one of the external things, like a piece of land like health, like reputation. But philosophy promises none of these. In every circumstance I will maintain, she says, the governing part conformable to nature. Whose governing part? His in whom I am, she says. How then shall my brother cease to be angry with me? Bring him to me and I will tell him. But I have nothing to say to you about his anger. When the man who was consulting him said, I seek to know this how, even if my brother is not reconciled to me, shall I maintain myself in a state conformable to nature? Nothing great, said Epictetus, is produced suddenly, since not even the grape or the fig is. If you say to me now that you want a fig, I will answer to you that it requires time. Let it flower first, then put forth fruit, and then ripen. Is, then, the fruit of a fig tree not perfected suddenly and in one hour? And would you possess the fruit of a man's mind in so short a time and so easily? Do not expect it, even if I tell you. Book 1, Chapter 16 of Providence Do not wonder if for other animals than man all things are provided for the body, not only food and drink, but beds also, and they have no need of shoes, nor bed materials, nor clothing. 
but we require all these additional things for animals not being made for themselves, but for service. It was not fit for them to be made so as to need other things. For consider what it would be for us to take care not only of ourselves, but also about cattle and asses, how they should be clothed, and how shod, and how they should eat and drink. Now as soldiers are ready for their commander, shod, clothed, and armed, but it would be a hard thing for the Chiliarch to go round and shoe or clothe his thousand men. So also nature has formed the animals which are made for service, already prepared and requiring no further care. So one little boy with only a stick drives the cattle. But now we, instead of being thankful that we need not take the same care of animals as of ourselves, complain of God on our own account. And yet, in the name of Zeus and the gods, any one thing of those which exist would be enough to make a man perceive the providence of God, at least a man who is modest and grateful. And speak not to me now of the great thins, but only of this, that milk is produced from grass, and cheese from milk and wool from skins. Who made these things or devised them? No one, you say. Oh, amazing shamelessness and stupidity. Well, let us omit the works of nature and contemplate her smaller acts. Is there anything less useful than the hair on the chin? What then has not nature used this hair also in the most suitable manner possible? Has she not by it distinguished the male and the female? Does not the nature of every man forthwith proclaim from a distance, I am a man? As such approach me, as such speak to me. Look for nothing else. See the signs? Again, in the case of women, as she has mingled something softer in the voice, so she has also deprived them of hair on the chin. You say, not so. The human animal ought to have been left without marks of distinction, and each of us should have been obliged to proclaim, I am a man. But how is not the sign beautiful and becoming and venerable? How much more beautiful than the cock's comb? How much more becoming than the lion's mane? For this reason, we ought to preserve the signs which God has given. We ought not to throw them away, nor to confound, as much as we can, the distinctions of the sexes. Are these the only works of providence in us? And what words are sufficient to praise them and set them forth according to their worth? For if we had understanding, ought we to do anything else both jointly and severally than to sing hymns and bless the Deity and to tell of His benefits? Ought we not, when we are digging and plowing and eating, to sing this hymn to God? Great is God who has given us such implements with which we shall cultivate the earth. Great is God who has given us hands the power of swallowing, a stomach imperceptible growth, and the power of breathing while we sleep. This is what we ought to sing on every occasion, and to sing the greatest and most divine hymn for giving us the faculty of comprehending these things and using a proper way. Well then, since most of you have become blind, ought there not to be some man to fill this office? and on behalf of all to sing the hymn to God. For what else can I do, a lame old man, than sing hymns to God? If then I was a nightingale, I would do the part of a nightingale. If I were a swan, I would do like a swan. But now I am a rational creature, and I ought to praise God. This is my work. I do it, nor will I desert this post, so long as I am allowed to keep it and I exhort you to join in this same song. Book 1, Chapter 17 That the Logical Art is Necessary Since reason is the faculty which analyses and perfects the rest, and it ought itself not to be unanalyzed, by what should it be analyzed? For it is plain that this should be done either by itself or by another thing. Either then this other thing also is reason, or something else superior to reason which is impossible. But if it is reason, 
again who shall analyze that reason? For if that reason does this for itself, our reason also can do it. But we shall require something else. The thing will go on to infinity and have no end. Reason, therefore, is analyzed by itself. Yes, but it is more urgent to cure our opinions and the like. Will you then hear about those things? Here. But if you should say, I know not whether you are arguing truly or falsely, and if I should express myself in any way ambiguously, and you should say to me, Distinguish, I will bear with you no longer, and I shall say to it is more urgent. This is the reason, I suppose, why they place the logical art first. As in the measuring of corn we place first the examination of the measure, but if we do not determine first what is a modius and what is a balance, how shall we be able to measure or weigh anything? In this case, then, if we have not fully learned and accurately examined the criterion of all other things, by which the other things are learned, shall we be able to examine accurately and to learn fully anything else? Yes, but the modius is only wood, and a thing which produces no fruit. But it is a thing which can measure corn. Logic also produces no fruit. As to this indeed we shall see. But then even if a man should rant this, it is enough that logic has the power of distinguishing and examining other things, and, as we may say, of measuring and weighing them. Who says this? Is it only Chrysippus and Zeno and Cleanthes? And does not Antisthenes say so? And who is it that has written that the examination of names is the beginning of education? And does not Socrates say so? And of whom does Xenophon write that he began with the examination of names, what each name signified? Is this then the great and wondrous thing to understand or interpret Chrysippus? Who says this? What then is the wondrous thing? To understand the will of nature? Well then, do you apprehend it yourself by your own power? And what more have you need of? For if it is true that all men err involuntarily, and you have learned the truth, of necessity you must act right. But in truth I do not apprehend the will of nature. Who then tells us what it is? They say that it is Chrysippus. I proceed and I inquire what this interpreter of nature says. I begin not to understand what he says. I seek an interpreter of Chrysippus. Well, consider how this is said, just as if it were said in the Roman tongue. What then is this superciliousness of the interpreter? There is no superciliousness which can justly he charged even to Chrysippus, if he only interprets the will of nature, but does not follow it himself. And much more is this so with his interpreter. For we have no need of Chrysippus for his own sake, but in order that we may understand nature. Nor do we need a diviner on his own account, but because we think that through him we shall know the future and understand the signs given by the gods. Nor do we need the viscera of animals for their own sake, but because through them signs are given. Nor do we look with wonder on the crow or raven, but on God, who through them gives signs. I go then to the interpreter of these things and the sacrificer, and I say, Inspect the viscera for me, and tell me what signs they give. The man takes the viscera, opens them, and interprets them. Man, he says, you have a will free by nature from hindrance and compulsion. This is written here in the viscera. I will show you this first in the matter of assent. Can any man hinder you from assenting to the truth? No man can. Can any man compel you to receive what is false? No man can. You see that in this matter you have the faculty of the will free from hindrance, free from compulsion, unimpeded. Well then, in the matter of desire and pursuit of an object, is it otherwise? And what can overcome pursuit except another pursuit? 
And what can overcome desire and aversion except another desire and aversion? But you object. If you place before me the fear of death, you do compel me. No, it is not what is placed before you that compels, but your opinion that it is better to do so and so than to die. In this matter, then, it is your opinion that compelled you, that is, will compelled will. For if God had made that part of himself, which he took from himself and gave to us, of such a nature as to be hindered or compelled either by himself or by another, he would not then be God, nor would he be taking care of us as he ought. This, says the diviner, I find in the victims. These are the things which are signified to you. If you choose, you are free. If you choose, you will blame no one. You will charge no one. All will be at the same time according to your mind and the mind of God. For the sake of this divination I go to this diviner and to the philosopher, not admiring him for this interpretation, but admiring the things which he interprets. Book 1, Chapter 18 That we ought not to, he angry with the errors of others. If what philosophers say is true, that all men have one principle, as in the case of assent, the persuasion that a thing is so, and in the case of dissent, the persuasion that a thing is not so, and in the case of a suspense of judgment, the persuasion that a thing is uncertain, so also in the case of a movement toward anything. The persuasion that a thing is for a man's advantage, and it is impossible to think that one thing is advantageous, and to desire another, and to judge one thing to be proper, and to move toward another. Why then are we angry with the many? They are thieves and robbers, you may say. What do you mean by thieves and robbers? They are mistaken about good and evil. Ought we then to be angry with them or to pity them? But show them their error, and you will see how they desist from their errors. If they do not see their errors, they have nothing superior to their present opinion. Ought not then this robber and this adulterer to be destroyed? By no means say so, but speak rather in this way. This man who has been mistaken and deceived about the most important things, and blinded not in the faculty of vision which distinguishes white and black, but in the faculty which distinguishes good and bad, should we not destroy him? If you speak thus, you will see how inhuman this is which you say, and that it is just as if you would say, Ought we not to destroy this blind and deaf man? But if the greatest harm is the privation of the greatest things, and the greatest thing in every man is the will or choice such as it ought to be, and a man is deprived of this will, why are you also angry with him? Man, you ought not to be affected contrary to nature by the bad things of another. Pity him, rather. Drop this readiness to be offended and to hate, and these words which the many utter, these accursed and odious fellows. How have you been made so wise at once? And how are you so peevish? Why then are we angry? Is it because we value so much the things of which these men rob us? Do not admire your clothes, and then you will not be angry with the thief. Do not admire the beauty of your wife, and you will not be angry with the adulterer. Learn that a thief and an adulterer have no place in the things which are yours, but in those which belong to others and which are not in your power. If you dismiss these things and consider them as nothing, with whom are you still angry? But so long as you value these things, be angry with yourself rather than with the thief and the adulterer. Consider the matter thus. You have fine clothes, your neighbor has not. You have a window, you wish to air the clothes. The thief does not know wherein man's good consists, but he thinks that it consists in having fine clothes, the very thing which you also think. Must he not then come and take them away? When you show a cake to greedy persons and swallow it all yourself, 
Do you expect them not to snatch it from you? Do not provoke them. Do not have a window. Do not air your clothes. I also lately had an iron lamp placed by the side of my household gods. Hearing a noise at the door, I ran down and found that the lamp had been carried off. I reflected that he who had taken the lamp had done nothing strange. What then? Tomorrow, I said, you will find an earthen lamp, for a man only loses that which he has. I have lost my garment. The reason is that you had a garment. I have pain in my head. Have you any pain in your horns? Why then are you troubled? For we only lose those things. We have only pains about those things which we possess. But the tyrant will chain. What? The leg. He will take away. What? The neck. What then will he not chain and not take away? The will. This is why the ancients taught the maxim, Know thyself. Therefore we ought to exercise ourselves in small things, and beginning with them, to proceed to the greater. I have pain in the head. Do not say, Alas. I have pain in the ear. Do not say, Alas. And I do not say that you are not allowed to groan, but do not groan inwardly. And if your slave is slow in bringing a bandage, do not cry out and torment yourself and say, Everybody hates me. For who would not hate such a man? For the future, relying on these opinions, walk about upright, free, not trusting to the size of your body, as an athlete for a man ought not to be invincible in the way that an ass is. Who then is the invincible? It is he whom none of the things disturb, which are independent of the will. Then examining one circumstance after another I observe, as in the case of an athlete, he has come off victorious in the first contest. Well then, as to the second, and what if there should be great heat? And what if it should be at Olympia? And the same I say in this case, if you should throw money in his way, he will despise it. Well, suppose you put a young girl in his way, what then? And what if it is in the dark? What if it should be a little reputation or abuse? And what if it should be praise? And what if it should be death? He is able to overcome all. What then if it be in heat? And what if it is in the rain? And what if he be in a melancholy mood? And what if he be asleep? He will still conquer. This is my invincible athlete. Book 1, Chapter 19 how we should behave to tyrants. If a man possesses any superiority, or thinks that he does when he does not, such a man, if he is uninstructed, will of necessity be puffed up through it. For instance, the tyrant says, I am master of all. And what can you do for me? Can you give me desire which shall have no hindrance? How can you? Have you the infallible power of avoiding what you would avoid? Have you the power of moving toward an object without error? And how do you possess this power? Come, when you are in a ship, do you trust to yourself or to the helmsman? And when you are in a chariot, to whom do you trust but to the driver? And how is it in all other arts? Just the same. In what then lies your power? All men pay respect to me. Well, I also pay respect to my platter, and I wash it and wipe it. And for the sake of my oil flask, I drive a peg into the wall. Well then, are these things superior to me? No, but they supply some of my wants, and for this reason I take care of them. Well, do I not attend to my ass? Do I not wash his feet? Do I not clean him? Do you not know that every man has regard to himself, and to you just the same as he has regard to his ass? For who has regard to you as a man? Show me. Who wishes to become like you? Who imitates you as he imitates Socrates? But I can cut off your head. You say right. I had forgotten that I must have regard to you, as I would to a fever in the bile, and raise an altar to you, as there is at Rome an altar to fever. What is it then that disturbs and terrifies the multitude? 
Is it the tyrant and his guards? I hope that it is not so. It is not possible that what is by nature free can be disturbed by anything else or hindered by any other thing than by itself. But it is a man's own opinions which disturb him, for when the tyrant says to a man, I will chain your leg, he who values his leg says, Do not have pity, but he who values his own will says, If it appears more advantageous to you, chain it. Do you not care? I do not care. I will show you that I am master. You cannot do that. Zeus has set me free. Do you think that he intended to allow his own son to be enslaved? But you are master of my carcass. Take it. So, when you approach me, you have no regard to me? No, but I have regard to myself. And if you wish me to say that I have regard to you also, I tell you that I have the same regard to you that I have to my pipkin. This is not a perverse self-regard, for the animal is constituted so as to do all things for itself. For even the sun does all things for itself, nay, even Zeus himself. But when he chooses to be the giver of rain and the giver of fruits and the father of gods and men, you see that he cannot obtain these functions and these names if he is not useful to man. And universally, he has made the nature of the rational animal such that it cannot obtain any one of its own proper interests if it does not contribute something to the common interest. In this manner and sense, it is not unsociable for a man to do everything for the sake of himself. For what do you expect? that a man should neglect himself and his own interest? And how in that case can there be one and the same principle in all animals, the principle of attachment to themselves? What then? When absurd notions about things independent of our will, as if they were good and bad, lie at the bottom of our opinions, we must of necessity pay regard to tyrants. For I wish that men would pay regard to tyrants only, and not also to the bedchamber men. How is it that the man becomes all at once wise when Caesar has made him superintendent of the close stool? How is it that we say immediately, Felicion spoke sensibly to me? I wish he were ejected from the bedchamber that he might again appear to you to be a fool. Epaphroditus had a shoemaker whom he sold because he was good for nothing. This fellow by some good luck was bought by one of Caesar's men and became Caesar's shoemaker. You should have seen what respect Epaphroditus paid to him. How does the good Felician do, I pray? Then if any of us asked, what is Master doing? The answer, he is consulting about something with Felician. Had he not sold the man as good for nothing? Who then made him wise all at once? This is an instance of valuing something else than the things which depend on the will. Has a man been exalted to the tribuneship? All who meet him offer their congratulations. One kisses his eyes, another the neck, and the slaves kiss his hands. He goes to his house. He finds torches lighted. He ascends the capital. He offers a sacrifice of the occasion. Now whoever sacrificed for having had good desires, for having acted conformably to nature, for in fact we thank the gods for those things in which we place our good, a person was talking to me today about the priesthood of Augustus. I say to him, Man, let the thing alone. You will spend much for no purpose. But he replies, Those who draw up agreements will write any name. Do you then stand by those who read them and say to such persons, It is I whose name is written there. And if you can now be present on all such occasions, what will you do when you are dead? My name will remain. Write it on a stone, and it will remain. But come, what remembrance of you will there be beyond Nicopolis? But I shall wear a crown of gold. If you desire a crown at all, take a crown of roses and put it on, for it will be more elegant in appearance. Book 1, Chapter 20 About Reason, How It Contemplates Itself Every art and faculty contemplates certain things especially. When then it is itself of the same kind with the objects which it contemplates, it must of necessity contemplate itself also. 
but when it is of an unlike kind, it cannot contemplate itself. For instance, the shoemaker's art is employed on skins, but itself is entirely distinct from the material of skins. For this reason, it does not contemplate itself. Again, the grammarian's art is employed about articulate speech. Is then the art also articulate speech? By no means. For this reason, it is not able to contemplate itself. Now reason, for what purpose has it been given by nature? For the right use of appearances. What is it then itself? A system of certain appearances. So by its nature it has the faculty of contemplating itself so. Again, sound sense. For the contemplation of what things does it belong to us, good and evil, and things which are neither. What is it then itself? Good. And want of sense, what is it? Evil. Do you see then that good sense necessarily contemplates both itself and the opposite? For this reason it is the chief and the first work of a philosopher to examine appearances and to distinguish them and to admit none without examination. You see even in the matter of coin in which our interest appears to be somewhat concerned how we have invented an art and how many means the assayer uses to try the value of coin, the sight, the touch, the smell, and lastly the hearing. He throws the coin down and observes the sound, and he is not content with its sounding once. But through his great attention, he becomes a musician. In like manner, where we think that to be mistaken and not to be mistaken make a great difference, there we apply great attention to discovering the things which can deceive. But in the matter of our miserable ruling faculty, yawning and sleeping, we carelessly admit every appearance, for the harm is not noticed. When then you would know how careless you are with respect to good and evil, and how active with respect to things which are indifferent. Observe how you feel with respect to being deprived of the sight of eyes, and how with respect of being deceived. And you will discover you are far from feeling as you ought to in relation to good and evil. But this is a matter which requires much preparation and much labor and study. Well then do you expect to acquire the greatest of arts with small labor? And yet the chief doctrine of philosophers is brief. If you would know, read Zeno's writings and you will see. For how few words it requires to say man's end is to follow the gods, and that the nature of good is a proper use of appearances. But if you say, what is God, what is appearance, and what is particular, and what is universal nature, then indeed many words are necessary. If then Epicures should come and say that the good must be in the body, in this case also many words become necessary, and we must be taught what is the leading principle in us, and the fundamental and the substantial. And as it is not probable that the good of a snail is in the shell, is it probable that the good of a man is in the body? But you yourself, Epicurus, possess something better than this. What is that in you which deliberates? What is that which examines everything? What is that which forms a judgment about the body itself, that it is the principal part? And why do you light your lamp and labor for us and write so many books? Is it that we may not be ignorant of the truth, who we are, and what we are with respect to you. Thus the discussion requires many words. Book 1, Chapter 21, Against Those Who Wish to Be Admired When a man holds his proper station in life, he does not gape after things beyond it. Man, what do you wish to happen to you? I am satisfied if I desire and avoid conformably to nature. If I employ movements toward and from an object as I am by nature formed to do, and purpose and design and assent, why then do you strut before us as if you had swallowed a spit? My wish has always been that those who meet me should admire me, and those who follow me should exclaim, O oh, the great philosopher, who are they by whom you wish to be admired? 
Are they not those of whom you are used to say that they are mad? Well then, do you wish to be admired by madmen? Book 1, Chapter 22 On Precognitions Precognitions are common to all men, and precognition is not contradictory to precognition. For who of us does not assume that good is useful and eligible, and in all circumstances that we ought to follow and pursue it? And who of us does not assume that justice is beautiful and becoming? When, then, does the contradiction arise? It arises in the adaptation of the precognitions to the particular cases. When one man says, he has done well, he is a brave man, and another says, not so, but he has acted foolishly, then the disputes arise among men. This is the dispute among the Jews and the Syrians and the Egyptians and the Romans, not whether holiness should be preferred to all things and in all cases should be pursued, but whether it is holy to eat pig's flesh or not holy. You will find this dispute also between Agamemnon and Achilles, for call them forth. What do you say? Agamemnon ought not that to be done which is proper and right? Certainly. Well, what do you say, Achilles? Do you not admit that what is good ought to be done? I do most, certainly. Adapt your precognitions then to the present matter. Here the dispute begins. Agamemnon says, I ought not to give up Chryseis to her father. Achilles says, You ought. It is certain that one of the two makes a wrong adaptation of the precognition of ought, or duty. Further, Agamemnon says, Then if I ought to restore Chryseis, it is fit that I take his prize from some of you. Achilles replies, Would you then take her whom I love? Yes, her whom you love. Must I then be the only man who goes without a prize? And must I be the only man who has no prize? Thus the dispute begins. What then is education? Education is the learning how to adapt the natural precognitions to the particular things conformably to nature, and then to distinguish that of things some are in our power, but others are not. In our power are will and all acts which depend on the will. Things not in our power are the body, the parts of the body, possessions, parents, brothers, children, country, and generally all with whom we live in society. In what then? Should we place the good? To what kind of things shall we adapt it? To the things which are in our power? Is not health then a good thing and soundness of limb and life? And are not children and parents and country who will tolerate you if you deny this? Let us then transfer the notion of good to these things. Is it possible then when a man sustains damage and does not obtain good things? that he can be happy? It is not possible. And can he maintain toward society a proper behavior? He cannot, for I am naturally formed to look after my own interest. If it is my interest to have an estate in land, it is my interest also to take it from my neighbor. If it is my interest to have a garment, it is my interest also to steal it from the bath. This is the origin of wars, civil commotions, tyrannies, conspiracies, and how shall I be still able to maintain my duty toward Zeus? For if I sustain damage and am unlucky, he takes no care of me. And what is he to me if he allows me to be in the condition in which I am? I now begin to hate him. Why then do we build temples? Why set up statues to Zeus, as well as to evil demons, such as to fever? And how is Zeus the savior, and how the giver of rain, and the giver of fruits? And in truth, if we place the nature of good in any such things, all this follows. What should we do then? This is the inquiry of the true philosopher who is in labor. Now I do not see what the good is, nor the bad. Am I not mad? Yes. But suppose that I place the good somewhere among the things which depend on the will. All will laugh at me. There will come some gray head wearing many gold rings on his fingers, 
and he will shake his head and say, Hear, my child, it is right that you should philosophize, but you ought to have some brains also. All this that you are doing is silly. You learn the syllogism from philosophers, but you know how to act better than philosophers do. Man, why then do you blame me if I know? What shall I say to this slave? If I am silent, he will burst. I must speak in this way. Excuse me, as you would excuse lovers. I am not my own master. I am mad. Book 1, Chapter 23 Against Epicurus Even Epicurus perceives that we are by nature social, but having once placed our good in the husk, he is no longer able to say anything else. For on the other hand, he strongly maintains this, that we ought not to admire nor to accept anything which is detached from the nature of good, and he is right in maintaining this. How then are we suspicious if we have no natural affection to our children? Why do you advise the wise man not to bring up children? Why are you afraid that he may thus fall into trouble? For does he fall into trouble on account of the mouse which is nurtured in the house? What does he care if a little mouse in the house makes lamentation to him? But Epicurus knows that if once a child is born, it is no longer in our power not to love it nor care about it. For this reason, Epicurus says that a man who has any sense also does not engage in political matters, for he knows what a man must do who is engaged in such things. For indeed, if you intend to behave among men as you do among a swarm of flies, what hinders you? But Epicurus, who knows this, ventures to say that we should not bring up children. But a sheep does not desert its own offspring, nor yet a wolf. And shall a man desert his child? What do you mean? That we should be as silly as sheep, but not even do they desert their offspring, or as savage as wolves, but not even do wolves desert their young. Well, who would follow your advice if he saw his child weeping after falling on the ground? For my part, I think that even if your mother and your father had been told by an oracle that you would say what you have said, they would not have cast you away. Book 1, Chapter 24 How We Should Struggle with Circumstances It is circumstances which show what men are. Therefore, when a difficulty falls upon you, remember that God, like a trainer of wrestlers, has matched you with a rough young man. For what purpose, you may say? Why, that you may become an Olympic conqueror, but it is not accomplished without sweat. In my opinion, no man has had a more profitable difficulty than you have had, if you choose to make use of it as an athlete would deal with a young antagonist. We are now sending a scout to Rome, but no man sends a cowardly scout, who, if he only hears a noise and sees a shadow anywhere, comes running back in terror and reports that the enemy is close at hand. So now, if you should come and tell us, fearful is the state of affairs at Rome, Terrible is death, terrible is exile, terrible is calumny, terrible is poverty. Fly, my friends, the enemy is near. We shall answer, be gone, prophesy for yourself. We have committed only one fault, that we sent such a scout. Diogenes, who was sent as a scout before you, made a different report to us. He says that death is no evil, for neither is it base. He says that fame is the noise of madmen. And what has this spy said about pain, about pleasure, and about poverty? He says that to be naked is better than any purple robe, and to sleep on the bare ground is the softest bed. And he gives us a proof of each thing that he affirms his own courage, his tranquility, his freedom, and the healthy appearance and compactness of his body. There is no enemy, he says. All is peace. How so, Diogenes? See, he replies, if I am struck, if I have been wounded, if I have fled from any man. This is what a scout ought to be. But you come to us and tell us one thing after another. Will you not go back and you will see clearer when you have laid aside fear? What then shall I do? 
What do you do when you leave a ship? Do you take away the helm or the oars? What then do you take away? You take what is your own, your bottle and your wallet. And now if you think of what is your own, you will never claim what belongs to others. The emperor says, lay aside your laticlave. See, I put on the angusticlave. Lay aside this also. See, I have only my toga. Lay aside your toga. See, I am naked. But you still raise my envy. Take then all my poor body. When at a man's command I can throw away my poor body, do I still fear him? But a certain person will not leave to me the succession to his estate. What then? Had I forgotten that not one of these things was mine? How then do we call them mine? Just as we call the bed in the inn. If then the innkeeper at his death leaves you the beds all well, but if he leaves them to another, he will have them, and you will seek another bed. If then you shall not find one, you will sleep on the ground. Only sleep with a good will and snore, and remember that tragedies have their place among the rich and kings and tyrants, but no poor man fills a part in the tragedy except as one of the chorus. Kings indeed commence with prosperity, ornament the palaces with garlands. Then about the third or fourth act they call out, O Kitheron, why didst thou receive me? Slave, where are the crowns, where the diadem? The gods help thee not at all. When then you approach any of these persons, remember this, that you are approaching a tragedian, not the actor, but Oedipus himself. But you say, such a man is happy, for he walks about with many. And I also place myself with the many and walk about with many. In some, remember this, the door is open. Be not more timid than little children, but as they say, when the thing does not please them, I will play no loner, so do you. When things seem to you of such a kind, say I will no longer play and be gone. But if you stay, do not complain. Book One, Chapter 25 On the Same If these things are true, and if we are not silly and are not acting hypocritically when we say that the good of man is in the will, and the evil too, and that everything else does not concern us, why are we still disturbed? Why are we still afraid? The things about which we have been busied are in no man's power and the things which are in the power of others we care not for. What kind of trouble have we still? But give me directions. Why should I give you directions? Has not Zeus given you directions? Has he not given to you what is your own free from hindrance and free from impediment, and what is not your own subject to hindrance and impediment? What directions, then? What kind of orders did you bring when you came from him? Keep by every means what is your own. Do not desire what belongs to others. Fidelity is your own. Virtuous shame is your own. Who then can take these things from you? Who else than yourself will hinder you from using them? But how do you act? When you seek what is not your own, you lose that which is your own. Having such promptings and commands from Zeus, what kind do you still ask from me? Am I more powerful than he? Am I more worthy of confidence? But if you observe these, do you want any others besides? Well, but he has not given these orders, you will say. Produce your precognitions. Produce the proofs of philosophers. Produce what you have often heard. And produce what you have said yourself. Produce what you have read. Produce what you have meditated on and you will then see that all these things are from God. How long then is it fit to observe these precepts from God and not to break up the play, as long as the play is continued with propriety? In the Saturnalia, a king is chosen by lot, for it has been the custom to play at this game. The king commands, Do you drink? Do you mix the wine? Do you sing? Do you go? Do you come? I obey that the game may be broken up through me. But if he says, 
think that you are in evil plight? I answer, I do not think so, and who compel me to think so? Further, we agreed to play Agamemnon and Achilles. He who is appointed to play Agamemnon says to me, Go to Achilles and tear from him Briseis. I go. He says, Come and I come. For as we behave in the matter of hypothetical arguments, so ought we to do in life. Suppose it to be night. I suppose that it is night. Well then, is it day? No, for I admitted the hypothesis that it was night. Suppose that you think that it is night. Suppose that I do, but also think that it is night. That is not consistent with the hypothesis. So in this case also, suppose that you are unfortunate. Well, suppose so. Are you then unhappy? Yes. Well then, are you troubled with an unfavorable demon? Yes. But think also that you are in misery. This is not consistent with the hypothesis, and another forbids me to think so. How long then must we obey such orders? As long as it is profitable, and this means as long as I maintain that which is becoming and consistent. Further, some men are sour and of bad temper, and they say, I cannot sup with this man to be obliged to hear him telling daily how he fought in Mycia. I told you, brother, how I ascended the hill. Then I began to be besieged again. But another says, I prefer to get my supper and to hear him talk as much as he likes. And do you compare these estimates? Only do nothing in a depressed mood, nor as one afflicted, nor as thinking that you are in misery, for no man compels you to that. Has it smoked in the chamber? If the smoke is moderate, I will stay. If it is excessive, I go out, for you must always remember this and hold it fast, that the door is open. Well, but you say to me, do not live in Nicopolis, I will not live there, nor in Athens, I will not live in Athens, nor in Rome, I will not live in Rome, live in Gyarus, I will live in Gyarus, but it seems like a great smoke to live in Gyarus, and I depart to the place where no man will hinder me from living, for that dwelling place is open to all, and as to the last garment, that is the poor body, no one has any power over me beyond this. This was the reason why Demetrius said to Nero, You threaten me with death, but nature threatens you. If I set my admiration on the poor body, I have given myself up to be a slave. If on my little possessions, I also make myself a slave, for I immediately make it plain with what I may be caught. As if the snake draws in his head, I tell you to strike that part of him which he guards. And do you, he assured, that whatever part you choose to guard, that part your master will attack. Remembering this, whom will you still flatter or fear? But I should like to sit where the senators sit. Do you see that you are putting yourself in straits? You are squeezing yourself. How then shall I see well in any other way in the amphitheater? Man, do not be a spectator at all, and you will not be squeezed. Why do you give yourself trouble, or wait a little, and when the spectacle is over, seat yourself in the place reserved for the senators and son yourself? For remember this general truth, that it is we who squeeze ourselves, who put ourselves in straits, that is our opinions squeeze us, and put us in straits. For what is it to be reviled? Stand by a stone and revile it, and what will you gain? If then a man listens like a stone, what profit is there to the reviler? But if the reviler has as a stepping stone the weakness of him who is reviled, then he accomplishes something. Strip him. What do you mean by him? Lay hold of his garment. Strip it off. I have insulted you. Much good may it do you. This was the practice of Socrates. This was the reason why he always had one face but we choose to practice and study anything rather than the means by which we shall be unimpeded and free. You say, philosophers talk paradoxes, but are there no paradoxes in the other arts? And what is more paradoxical than to puncture a man's eye in order that he may see? If anyone said this to a man ignorant of the surgical art, 
would he not ridicule the speaker? Where is the wonder then if in philosophy also many things which are true appear paradoxical to the inexperienced? Book 1, Chapter 26 What is the law of life? When a person was reading hypothetical arguments, Epictetus said, This also is an hypothetical law that we must accept what follows from the hypothesis. But much before this law is the law of life that we must act conformably to nature. For if in every matter and circumstance we wish to observe what is natural, it is plain that in everything we ought to make it our aim that is consequent, shall not escape us, and that we do not admit the contradictory. First then, philosophers exercise us in theory which is easier, and then next they lead us to the more difficult things. For in theory there is nothing which draws us away from following what is taught. But in the matters of life many are the things which distract us. He is ridiculous, then, who says that he wishes to begin with the matters of real life, for it is not easy to begin with the more difficult things, and we ought to employ this fact as an argument to those parents who are vexed at their children learning philosophy. Am I doing wrong, then, my father? And do I not know what is suitable to me and becoming? If indeed this can neither be learned nor taught, why do you blame me? But if it can, he taught, teach me. And if you cannot, allow me to learn from those who say that they know how to teach. For what do you think? Do you suppose that I voluntarily fall into evil and miss the good? I hope that it may not be so. What is then the cause of my doing wrong? Ignorance. Do you not choose then that I should get rid of my ignorance? Who was ever taught by anger the art of a pilot or music? Do you think then that by means of your anger I shall learn the art of life? He only is allowed to speak in this way who has shown such an intention. But if a man only intending to make a display at a banquet and to show that he is acquainted with hypothetical arguments, reads them and attends the philosophers. What other object has he than that some man of senatorian rank who sits by him may admire? For there are the really great materials, and the riches here appear to be trifles there. This is the reason why it is difficult for a man to be master of the appearances, where the things which disturb the judgment are great. I know a certain person who complained, as he embraced the knees of Epaphroditus, that he had only one hundred and fifty times ten thousand denarii remaining. What then did Epaphroditus do? Did he laugh at him, as we slaves of Epaphroditus did? No, but he cried out with amazement, Poor man, how did you keep silence? How did you endure it? When Epictetus had reproved the person who was reading the hypothetical arguments and the teacher who had suggested the reading was laughing at the reader, Epictetus said to the teacher, You are laughing at yourself. You did not prepare the young man, nor did you ascertain whether he was able to understand these matters, but perhaps you are only employing him as a reader. Well then, said Epictetus, if a man has not ability enough to understand a complex, do we trust him in giving praise? Do we trust him in giving blame? Do we allow that he is able to form a judgment about good or bad? And if such a man blames anyone, does the man care for the blame? And if he praises anyone, is the man elated, when in such small matters as an hypothetical syllogism, he who praises cannot see what is consequent on the hypothesis. This then is the beginning of philosophy, a man's perception of the state of his ruling faculty. For when a man knows that it is weak, then he will not employ it on things of the greatest difficulty. But at present, if men cannot swallow even a morsel, they buy whole volumes and attempt to devour them. And this is the reason why they vomit them up or suffer indigestion and then come gripings, defluxes, and fevers. Such men ought to consider what their ability is. In theory, it is easy to convince an ignorant person. 
but in the affairs of real life, no one offers himself to be convinced, and we hate the man who has convinced us. But Socrates advised us not to live a life which is not subjected to examination. Book 1, Chapter 27 In how many ways appearances exist, and what aids we should provide against them? Appearances to us in four ways, for either things appear as they are, or they are not, and do not even appear to be, or they are, and do not appear to be, or they are not, and yet appear to be. Further, in all these cases to form a right judgment is the office of an educated man. But whatever it is that annoys us, to that we ought to apply a remedy. If the sophisms of Pyrrho and of the academics are what annoys, we must apply the remedy to them. If it is the persuasion of appearances by which some things appear to be good when they are not good, let us seek a remedy for this. If it is habit which annoys us, we must try to seek aid against habit. What aid then can we find against habit, the contrary habit? You hear the ignorant say, that unfortunate person is dead. His father and mother are overpowered with sorrow. He was cut off by an untimely death and in a foreign land. Hear the contrary way of speaking. Tear yourself from these expressions. Oppose to one habit the contrary habit. To sophistry oppose reason, and the exercise and discipline of reason. Against persuasive appearances, we ought to have manifest precognitions, cleared of all impurities and ready to hand. When death appears an evil, we ought to have this rule in readiness, that it is fit to avoid evil things, and that death is a necessary thing. For what shall I do, and where shall I escape it? Suppose that I am not Sarpedon, the son of Zeus, nor able to speak in this noble way. I will go, and I am resolved either to behave bravely myself or to give to another the opportunity of doing so. If I cannot succeed in doing anything myself, I will not grudge another the doing of something noble. Suppose that it is above our power to act thus. Is it not in our power to reason thus? Tell me where I can escape death. Discover for me the country. Show me the men to whom I must go whom death does not visit. Discover to me a charm against death. If I have not one, what do you wish me to do? I cannot escape from death. Shall I not escape from the fear of death? But shall I die lamenting and trembling? For the origin of perturbation is this, to wish for something, and that this should not happen. Therefore, if I am able to change externals according to my wish, I change them. But if I cannot, I am ready to tear out the eyes of him who hinders me. For the nature of man is not to endure to be deprived of the good, and not to endure the falling into the evil. Then at last, when I am neither able to change circumstances, nor to tear out the eyes of him who hinders me, I sit down and groan, and abuse whom I can, Zeus and the rest of the gods, for if they do not care for me, what are they to me? Yes, but you will be an impious man. In what respect, then, will it be worse for me than it is now? To sum up, remember this, that unless piety and your interest be in the same thing, piety cannot be maintained in any man. Do not these things seem necessary? Let the followers of Pyrrho and the academics come and make their objections. For I... As to my part, have no leisure for these disputes, nor am I able to undertake the defense of common consent. If I had a suit even about a bit of land, I would call in another to defend my interests. With what evidence then am I satisfied? With that which belongs to the matter in hand. How indeed perception is affected, whether through the whole body or any part, perhaps I cannot explain for both opinions perplex me. But that you and I are not the same, I know with perfect certainty. How do you know it? When I intend to swallow anything, I never carry it to your bee month but to my own. 
When I intend to take bread, I never lay hold of a broom, but I always go to the bread as to a mark. And you yourselves who take away the evidence of the senses, do you act otherwise? Who among you, when he intended to enter a bath, ever went into a mill? What then? Ought we not with all our power to hold to this also, the maintaining of general opinion and fortifying ourselves against the arguments which are directed against it? Who denies that we ought to do this? Well, he should do it who is able, who has leisure for it. But as to him who trembles and is perturbed and is inwardly broken in heart, he must employ his time better on something else. Book 1, Chapter 28 That we ought not to, he angry with men. And what are the small and the great things among men? What is the cause of assenting to anything? the fact that it appears to be true. It is not possible then to assent to that which appears not to be true. Why? Because this is the nature of the understanding, to incline to the true, to be dissatisfied with the false, and in matters uncertain to withhold assent. What is the proof of this? Imagine, if you can, that it is now night. It is not possible. Take away your persuasion that it is day. It is not possible. Persuade yourself or take away your persuasion that the stars are even in number. It is impossible. When, then, any man assents to that which is false, be assured that he did not intend to assent to it as false. For every soul is unwillingly deprived of the truth, as Plato says, but the falsity seemed to him to be true. Well, in Acts, what have we of the like kind as we have here truth or falsehood? We have the fit and the not fit, the profitable and the unprofitable, that which is suitable to a person and that which is not, and whatever is like these. Can then a man think that a thing is useful to him and not choose it? He cannot. How says Medea? Tis true I know what evil I shall do but passion overpowers the better counsel. She thought that to indulge her passion and take vengeance on her husband was more profitable than to spare her children. It was so, but she was deceived. Show her plainly that she is deceived and she will not do it. But so long as you do not show it, what can she follow except that which appears to herself? Nothing else. Why then are you angry with the unhappy woman that she has been bewildered about the most important things and has become a viper instead of a human creature? And why not, if it is possible, rather pity, as we pity the blind and the lame, those who are blinded and maimed in the faculties which are supreme? Whoever then clearly remembers this, that to man the measure of every act is the appearance, whether the thing appears good or bad, if good, he is free from blame. If bad, himself suffers the penalty. For it is impossible that he who is deceived can be one person, and he who suffers another person. Whoever remembers this will not be angry with any man, will not be vexed at any man, will not revile or blame any man, nor hate nor quarrel with any man. So then all these great and dreadful deeds have this origin, in the appearance? Yes, this origin and no other. The Iliad is nothing else than appearance and the use of appearances. It appeared to Paris to carry off the wife of Menelaus. It appeared to Helen to follow him. If then it had appeared to Menelaus to feel that it was a gain to be deprived of such a wife, what would have happened? Not only a we would the Iliad have been lost, but the Odyssey also. On so small a matter then did such great things depend. But what do you mean by such great things? Wars and civil commotions, and the destruction of many men and cities. And what great matter is this? Is it nothing? But what great matter is the death of many oxen and many sheep, and many nests of swallows or storks being burnt or destroyed? Are these things then like those? Very like. Bodies of men are destroyed and the bodies of oxen and sheep. 
the dwellings of men are burnt, and the nests of storks. What is there in this great or dreadful? Or show me what is the difference between a man's house and a stork's nest, as far as each is a dwelling, except that man builds his little houses of beams and tiles and bricks, and the stork builds them of sticks and mud. Are a stork and a man, then, like things? What say you? In body they are very much alike. Does a man then differ in no respect from a stork? Don't suppose that I say so, but there is no difference in these matters. In what, then, is the difference? Seek, and you will find that there is a difference in another matter. See whether it is not in a man the understanding of what he does. See if it is not in social community, in fidelity, in modesty, in steadfastness, in intelligence. Where then is the great good and evil in men? It is where the difference is. If the difference is preserved and remains fenced round, and neither modesty is destroyed, nor fidelity, nor intelligence, then the man also is preserved. But if any of these things is destroyed and stormed like a city, then the man too perishes. And in this consist the great things. Paris, you say, sustained great damage then when the Hellenes invaded, and when they ravaged Troy, and when his brothers perished, by no means, for no man is damaged by an action which is not his own. But what happened at that time was only the destruction of Storks's nests. Now the ruin of Paris was when he lost the character of modesty, fidelity, regard to hospitality, and to decency. When was Achilles ruined? Was it when Patroclus died? Not so, but it happened when he began to be angry, when he wept for a girl, when he forgot that he was at Troy not to get mistresses but to fight. These things are the ruin of men. This is being besieged. This is the destruction of cities. When right opinions are destroyed, when they are corrupted, when then women are carried off, when children are made captives, and when the men are killed, are these not evils? How is it then that you add to the facts these opinions? Explain this to me also. I shall not do that. But how is it that you say that these are not evils? Let us come to the rules. Produce the precognitions. For it is because this is neglected that we cannot sufficiently wonder at what men do. When we intend to judge of weights, we do not judge by guess. Where we intend to judge of straight and crooked, we do not judge by guess. In all cases where it is our interest to know what is true in any matter, never will any man among us do anything by guess. But in things which depend on the first and on the only cause of doing right or wrong, of happiness or unhappiness, of being unfortunate or fortunate, there only we are inconsiderate and rash. There is then nothing like scales, nothing like a rule. But some appearance is presented, and straightway I act according to it. Must I then suppose that I am superior to Achilles or Agamemnon, so that they by following appearances do and suffer so many evils? And shall not the appearance be sufficient for me? And what tragedy has any other beginning? The Atreus of Euripides, what is it? An appearance. The Oedipus of Sophocles, what is it? An appearance. The Phoenix, an appearance. The Hippolytus, an appearance. What kind of a man then do you suppose him to be who pays no regard to this matter? And what is the name of those who follow every appearance? They are called madmen. Do we then act at all differently? Book 1, Chapter 29, On Constancy. The being of the good is a certain will. The being of the bad is a certain kind of will. What then are externals? Materials for the will, about which the will being conversant shall obtain its own good or evil. How shall it obtain the good? If it does not admire the materials. For the opinions about the materials, if the opinions are right, make the will good. But perverse and distorted opinions make the will bad. God has fixed this law and says, 
If you would have anything good, receive it from yourself. You say, no, but I have it from another. Do not so, but receive it from yourself. Therefore, when the tyrant threatens and calls me, I say, whom do you threaten? If he says, I will put you in chains, I say, you threaten my hands and my feet. If he says, I will cut off your head, I reply, you threaten my head. If he says, I will throw you into prison, I say, you threaten the whole of this poor body. If he threatens me with banishment, I say the same. Does he then not threaten you at all? If I feel that all these things do not concern me, he does not threaten me at all. But if I fear any of them, it is I whom he threatens. Whom then do I fear? The master of what? The master of things which are in my own power? There is no such master. Do I fear the master of things which are not in my power? And what are these things to me? Do you philosophers then teach us to despise kings? I hope not. Who among us teaches to claim against them the power over things which they possess? Take my poor body, take my property, take my reputation, take those who are about me. If I advise any persons to claim these things, they may truly accuse me. Yes, but I intend to command your opinions also. And who has given you this power? How can you conquer the opinion of another man? By applying terror to it, he replies, I will conquer it. Do you not know that opinion conquers itself and is not conquered by another? But nothing else can conquer will except the will itself. For this reason, too, the law of God is most powerful and most just, which is this. Let the stronger always be superior to the weaker. Ten are stronger than one. For what? For putting in chains, for killing, for dragging whither they choose, for taking away what a man has. The ten therefore conquer the one in this, in which they are stronger. In what then are the ten weaker? if the one possess right opinions and the others do not. Well then, can the ten conquer in this matter? How is it possible? If we were placed in the scales, must not the heavier draw down the scale in which it is? How strange, then, that Socrates should have been so treated by the Athenians. Slave, why do you say Socrates? Speak of the thing as it is. How strange that the poor body of Socrates should have been carried off and dragged to prison by stronger men, and that any one should have given hemlock to the poor body of Socrates, and that it should breathe out the life. Do these things seem strange? Do they seem unjust? Do you, on account of these things, blame God? Had Socrates then no equivalent for these things? Where then for him was the nature of good? Whom shall we listen to, you or him? And what does Socrates say? Anitus and Melitus can kill me, but they cannot hurt me. And further he says, If it so pleases God, so let it be. But show me that he who has the inferior principles overpowers him who is superior in principles. You will never show this, nor come near showing it. For this is the law of nature and of God, that the superior shall always overpower the inferior. In what? In that in which it is superior. One body is stronger than another. Many are stronger than one. The thief is stronger than he who is not a thief. This is the reason why I also lost my lamb. Because in wakefulness the thief was superior to me. But the man bought the lamp at this price. For a lamp he became a thief, a faithless fellow, and like a wild beast, this seemed to him a good bargain, be it so. But a man has seized me by the cloak and is drawing me to the public place. Then others bawl out, Philosopher, what has been the use of your opinions? See, you are dragged to prison. You are going to be beheaded. And what system of philosophy could F have made so that, if a stronger man should have laid hold of my cloak, I should not be dragged off. That if ten men should have laid hold of me and cast me into prison, 
I should not be cast in. Have I learned nothing else then? I have learned to see that everything which happens, if it be independent of my will, is nothing to me. I may ask if you have not gained by this. Why then do you seek advantage in anything else than in that in which you have learned that advantage is? Then sitting in prison I say, The man who cries out in this way neither hears what words mean nor understands what is said, nor does he care at all to know what philosophers say or what they do. Let him alone. But now, he says to the prisoner, Come out from your prison. If you have no further need of me in prison, I come out. If you should have need of me again, I will enter the prison. How long will you act thus? So long as reason requires me to be with the body. But when reason does not require this, take away the body and fare you well. Only we must not do it inconsiderately, nor weakly, nor for any slight reason. For on the other hand, God does not wish it to be done, and he has need of such a world and such inhabitants in it. But if he sounds the signal for retreat, as he did to Socrates, we must obey him who gives the signal, as if he were a general. Well then, ought we to say such things to the many? Why should we? Is it not enough for a man to be persuaded himself? When children come clapping their hands and crying out, Today is the good Saturnalia, do we say, the Saturnalia are not good, by no means, but we clap our hands also. Do you also then, when you are not able to make a man change his mind, be assured that he is a child, and clap your hands with him, and if you do not choose to do this, keep silent, a man must keep this in mind, and when he is called to any such difficulty, he should know that the time is come for showing if he has been instructed. For he who has come into a difficulty is like a young man from a school who has practiced the resolution of syllogisms. And if any person proposes to him an easy syllogism, he says, Rather propose to me a syllogism which is skillfully complicated that I may exercise myself on it. Even athletes are dissatisfied with slight young men and say, he cannot lift me. This is a youth of noble disposition. But when the time of trial is come, one of you must weep and say, I wish that I had learned more. A little more of what? If you did not learn these things in order to show them in practice, why did you learn them? I think that there is someone among you who are sitting here, who is suffering like a woman in labor and saying, Oh, that such a difficulty does not present itself to me as that which has come to this man. Oh, that I should be wasting my life in a corner when I might be crowned at Olympia. When will anyone announce to me such a contest? Such ought to be the disposition of all of you. Even among the gladiators of Caesar, there are some who complain grievously that they are not brought forward and matched and they offer up prayers to God and address themselves to their superintendents entreating that they might fight. And will no one among you show himself such? I would willingly take a voyage for this purpose and see what my athlete is doing, how he is studying his subject. I do not choose such a subject, he says. Why, is it in your power to take what subject you choose? There has been given to you such a body as you have, such parents, such brethren, such a country, such a place in your country. Then you come to me and say, change my subject. Have you not abilities which enable you to manage the subject which has been given to you? It is your business to propose. It is mine to exercise myself well. However, you do not say so, but you say, do not propose to me such a tropic, but such. Do not urge against me such an objection, but such. There will be a time, perhaps, when tragic actors will suppose that they are masks and buskins and the long cloak. I say these things, man, are your material and subject. 
Utter something that we may know whether you are a tragic actor or a buffoon, for both of you have all the rest in common. If anyone then should take away the tragic actor's buskins and his mask, and introduce him on the stage as a phantom, is the tragic actor lost, or does he still remain? If he has voice, he still remains. An example of another kind. Assume the governorship of a province. I assume it, and when I have assumed it, I show how an instructed man behaves. Lay aside the laticlave, and clothing yourself in rags, come forward in this character. What then have I not the power of displaying a good voice? How then do you now appear, as a witness summoned by God? Come forward, you, and bear testimony for me, for you are worthy to be brought forward as a witness by me. Is anything external to the will good or bad? Do I hurt any man? Have I made every man's interest dependent on any man except himself? What testimony do you give for God? I am in a wretched condition, Master, and I am unfortunate. No man cares for me. No man gives me anything. All blame me. All speak ill of me. Is this the evidence that you are going to give and disgrace his summons, who has conferred so much honor on you and thought you worthy of being called to bear such testimony. But suppose that he who has the power has declared, I judge you to be impious and profane. What has happened to you? I have been judged to be impious and profane. Nothing else, nothing else. But if the same person had passed judgment on an hypothetical syllogism and had made a declaration, the conclusion that if it is day, it is light, I declare to be false. What has happened to the hypothetical syllogism? Who is judged in this case? Who has been condemned? The hypothetical syllogism, or the man who has been deceived by it? Does he then, who has the power of making any declaration about you know what is pious or impious? Has he studied it, and has he learned it? Where? From whom? Then is it the fact that a musician pays no regard to him who declares that the lowest chord in the lyre is the highest, nor yet a geometrician, if he declares that the lines from the center of a circle to the circumference are not equal? And shall he who is really instructed pay any regard to the uninstructed man when he pronounces judgment on what is pious and what is impious, on what is just and unjust? Oh, the signal wrong done by the instructed. Did they learn this here? Will you not leave the small arguments about these matters to others, to lazy fellows, that they may sit in a corner and receive their sorry pay, or grumble that no one gives them anything? And will you not come forward and make use of what you have learned? For it is not these small arguments that are wanted now. The writings of the Stoics are full of them. What then is the thing which is wanted? A man who shall apply them, one who by his acts shall bear testimony to his words. Assume I entreat you, this character, that we may no longer use in the schools the examples of the ancients, but may have some example of our own. To whom then does the contemplation of these matters belong? To him who has leisure, for man is an animal that loves contemplation. But it is shameful to contemplate these things as runaway slaves do. We should sit, as in a theater, free from distraction, and listen at one time to the tragic actor, at another time to the lute player, and not do as slaves do. As soon as the slave has taken his station, he praises the actor and at the same time looks round. Then, if anyone calls out his master's name, the slave is immediately frightened and disturbed. It is shameful for philosophers thus to contemplate the works of nature. For what is a master? Man is not the master of man, but death is, and life and pleasure and pain. For if he comes without these things, bring Caesar to me and you will see how firm I am. But when he shall come with these things, 
thundering and lightning, and when I am afraid of them, what do I do then except to recognize my master like the runaway slave? But so long as I have any respite from these terrors as a runaway slave stands in the theater, so do I. I bathe, I drink, I sing. But all this I do with terror and uneasiness. But if I shall release myself from my masters, that is from those things by means of which masters are formidable. What further trouble have I? What master have I still? What then? Ought we to publish these things to all men? No, but we ought to accommodate ourselves to the ignorant and to say, This man recommends to me that which he thinks good for himself. I excuse him. For Socrates also excused the jailer, who had the charge of him in prison, and was weeping when Socrates was going to drink the poison, and said, How generously he laments over us. Does he then say to the jailer that for this reason we have sent away the women? No, but he says it to his friends who were able to hear it. And he treats the jailer as a child. Book 1, Chapter 30 What we ought to have ready in difficult circumstances. When you are going into any great personage, remember that another also from above sees what is going on, and that you ought to please him rather than the other. He, then, who sees from above, asks you, In the schools, what used you to say about exile and bonds and death and disgrace? I used to say that they are things indifferent. What, then, do you say of them now? Are they changed at all? No. Are you changed, then? No. Tell me, then, what things are indifferent, the things which are independent of the will. Tell me also what follows from this. The things which are independent of the will are nothing to me. Tell me also about the good. What was your opinion? A will such as we ought to have, and also such a use of appearances. And the end. What is it? To follow thee. Do you say this now also? I say the same now also. Then go into the great personage boldly, and remember these things, and you will see what a youth is who has studied these things when he is among men who have not studied them. I indeed imagine that you will have such thoughts as these. Why do we make so great and so many preparations for nothing? Is this the thing which men name power? Is this the antechamber? This the men of the bedchamber? This the armed guards? Is it for this that I listen to so many discourses? All this is nothing but I have been preparing myself for something great. The Handbook of Epictetus, Chapter 1, 1 On the one hand, there are things that are in our power, whereas other things are not in our power. In our power are opinion, impulse, desire, aversion, and in a word, whatever is our own doing. Things not in our power include our body, our possessions, our reputations, our status, and in a word, whatever is not our own doing. 2. Now things that are in our power are by nature free, unhindered, unimpeded, but things not in our power are weak, slavish, hindered, and belong to others. 3. Remember therefore that whenever you suppose those things that are by nature slavish to be free, or those things that belong others to be your own, you will be hindered, miserable, and distressed, and you will find fault with both gods and men. If, however, you suppose to be yours, only what is yours, and what belongs to another to belong to another, as indeed it does, no one will ever compel you, no one will hinder you. You will find fault with no one, reproach no one, nor act against your own will. You will have no enemies, and no one will harm you, for no harm can touch you. 4. Thus, when aiming at such great things, remember that securing them requires more than a modest effort. Some things you will have to give up altogether, and others you will have to put aside for the time being. If you want such great things, but at the same time strive for status and wealth, 
you may well not even obtain these latter things because you are seeking the former. At any rate, you will certainly fail to secure those former great things which alone bring freedom and happiness. 5. Straight away then, train yourself to say to every unpleasant impression, You are an impression, and by no means what you appear to be. Then examine it and test it by the rules that you have. Firstly, in this way especially, by asking whether it concerns things that are in our power or things that are not in our power. And if it concerns something not in our power, have ready to hand the answer. This is nothing to me. Chapter 2 1. Remember that on the one hand desires command you to obtain what you long for, and on the other, aversions command you to avoid what you dislike. Those who fail to gain what they desire are unfortunate, whilst those who fall into what they seek to avoid are miserable. So if you seek to avoid only those things contrary to nature, amongst the things that are in your power, you will accordingly fall into nothing to which you are averse. But if you seek to avoid sickness or death or poverty, you will be miserable. 2. Therefore remove altogether your aversion for anything that is not in our power and transfer it to those things contrary to nature that are in our power. For the time being, completely restrain your desires. For if you desire any of those things not in our power, you are bound to suffer misfortune. For of those things in our power, which it would be proper to desire, none is yet within your grasp. Use only choice and refusal, but use even these lightly, with reservation and without straining. Chapter 3 with respect to any of those things you find attractive or useful or have a fondness for, recall to mind what kind of thing it is, beginning with the most trifling. So if you are fond of an earthen pot, say, I am fond of an earthen pot. Then you will not be upset if it gets broken. When you kiss your child or wife, say that you are kissing a human being. Then, should they die, you will not be distressed. Chapter 4 When you are about to undertake some task, remind yourself what sort of business it is. If you are going out to bathe, bring to mind what happens at the baths. There will be those who splash you, those who will jostle you. Some will be abusive to you, and others will steal from you. And thus, you will undertake the affair more securely if you say to yourself from the start, I wish to take a bath but also to keep my moral character in accordance with nature. Do likewise with every undertaking. For thus, if anything should happen that interferes with your bathing, be ready to say, Oh well, it was not only this that I wanted, but also to keep my moral character in accordance with nature, and I cannot do that if I am irritated by things that happen. Chapter 5 it is not circumstances themselves that trouble people, but their judgments about those circumstances. For example, death is nothing terrible, for if it were, it would have appeared so to Socrates. But having the opinion that death is terrible, this is what is terrible. Therefore, whenever we are hindered or troubled or distressed, let us never blame others, but ourselves, that is, our own opinions. The uneducated person blames others for their failures. Those who have just begun to be instructed blame themselves. Those whose learning is complete blame neither others nor themselves. Chapter 6 Do not take pride in any excellence that is not your own. If a horse were to say proudly, I am beautiful, one could put up with that. But when you say proudly, I have a beautiful horse, Remember that you are boasting about something good that belongs to the horse. What then belongs to you? The use of impressions. Whenever you are in accordance with nature regarding the way you use impressions, then be proud, for then you will be proud of a good that is your own. 
Chapter 7 Just as on a voyage, when the ship has anchored, if you go ashore to get water, you may also pick up a shellfish or a vegetable from the path. But you should keep your thoughts fixed on the ship, and you should look back frequently in case the captain calls. And if he should call, you must give up all these other things to avoid being bound and thrown on board like a sheep. So in life also, if instead of a vegetable and a shellfish, you are given a wife and a child, nothing will prevent you from taking them. But if the captain calls, give up all these things and run to the ship without even turning to look back. And if you are old, do not even go far from the ship, lest you are missing when the call comes. Chapter 8 do not demand that things should happen just as you wish, but wish them to happen just as they do, and all will be well. Chapter 9 Illness interferes with one's body, but not with one's moral character, unless one so wishes. Lameness interferes with one's leg, but not with one's moral character. Say this to yourself regarding everything that happens to you, for you will find that what happens interferes with something else, but not with you. Chapter 10 On every occasion when something happens to you, remember to turn to yourself to see what capacity you have for dealing with it. If you are attracted to a beautiful boy or woman, you will find that self-control is the capacity to use for that. If hardship befalls you, you will find endurance. If abuse, you will find patience. Make this your habit, and you will not be carried away by impressions. Chapter 11 Never say of anything, I have lost it, but rather, I have given it back. Has your child died? It has been given back. Has your wife died? She has been given back. Has your land been taken from you? Well, that too has been given back but the one who took it from me is a bad man. What concern is it of yours by whose hand the giver asks for its return? For the time that these things are given to you, take care of them as things that belong to another, just as travelers do an inn. Chapter 12, 1. If you want to make progress, set aside all considerations like these. If I neglect my affairs, I will have nothing to live on. If I do not punish my slave boy, he will be bad. For it is better to die of hunger, free from distress and fear, than to live perturbed amidst plenty. It is better for your slave boy to be bad than for you to be wretched. 2. Begin therefore with little things. The olive oil is spilled, the wine is stolen. Say to yourself, this is the price for peace of mind and this is the price for being free of troubles. Nothing can be had without paying the price. And when you call your slave boy, bear in mind that it is quite possible he won't heed you. Or even if he does heed you, it is quite possible that he won't do the things you tell him to. But he is not in so fine a position that your peace of mind depends upon him. Chapter 13 If you want to make progress, Submit to appearing foolish and stupid with regard to external things. Do not wish to appear knowledgeable about anything, and if others think you amount to something, distrust yourself. For you should know that it is not easy both to keep your moral character in accordance with nature, and to keep secure external things. For in attending to one, you will inevitably neglect the other. Chapter 14 1. It is foolish to wish that your children and your wife and your friends should live forever, for you are wishing for things to be in your power which are not, and wishing for what belongs to others to be your own. It is foolish in the same way, too, to wish that your slave boy should never do wrong, for now you want badness not to be badness, but something else. However, if you wish not to fail in what you desire, this you are able to do. Exercise yourself, therefore, in what you are able to do. 2. A personal, 
Tem's master is the one who has power over that which is wished for or not wished for, so as to secure it or take it away. Therefore, anyone who wishes to be free should neither wish for anything nor avoid anything that depends on others. Those who do not observe this rule will of necessity be the slaves of others. Chapter 15 Remember, you ought to behave in life as you would at a banquet. Something is carried round and comes to you. Reach out and take a modest portion. It passes by. Do not stop it. It has not yet arrived. Do not stretch your desire towards it, but wait until it comes to you. So it should be concerning your children, your wife, your status, your wealth, and one day you will be worthy to share a banquet with the gods. If, however, you do not take these things, even when they are put before you, but have no regard for them, not only will you share a banquet with the gods, but also rule with them. By acting in this way, Diogenes and Heraclitus, and people like them, were deservedly gods, and were deservedly called so. Chapter 16 when you see someone weeping in grief because their child has gone abroad or because they have lost their property, take care not to be carried away by the impression that these external things involve them in anything bad, but be ready to say immediately, This person is not distressed by what has happened, for it does not distress anyone else, but by the judgment they make of it. Do not hesitate, however, to sympathize with words or if it so happens to weep with them. But take care not to weep inwardly. Chapter 17 Remember that you are an actor in a play of such a kind as the playwright chooses, short, if he wants it short, long if he wants it long. If he wants you to play the part of a beggar, play even this part well, and so also for the parts of a disabled person, an administrator, or a private individual. For this is your business, to play well the part you are given. But choosing it belongs to another. Chapter 18 When a raven croaks inauspiciously, do not be carried away by the impression, but straight away draw a distinction and say to yourself, This portent signifies nothing with respect to me, but only with regard to my body, my possessions, my reputation, my children, or my wife. To me, however, all portents are auspicious, if I wish them so. For however the affair turns out, it is in my power to benefit from it. Chapter 19 1. You can be invincible if you never enter a contest in which it is not in your power to win. 2. Beware that, when you see someone honored before others, enjoying great power or otherwise highly esteemed, you do not get carried away by the impression and think them happy. For if the essence of good lies in what is in our power, it is wrong to feel envy or jealousy, and you yourself will not wish to be praetor, senator or consul, but someone who is free. There is only one way to attain this end, and this is to have no concern for the things that are not in our power. Chapter 20 Remember that the insult does not come from the person who abuses you or hits you, but from your judgment that such people are insulting you. Therefore, whenever someone provokes you, be aware that it is your own opinion that provokes you. Try, therefore, in the first place, not to be carried away by your impressions, for if you can gain time and delay, you will more easily control yourself. Chapter 21 let death and exile and all other things that seem terrible appear daily before your eyes, but especially death, ah, and you will never entertain any abject thought, nor long for anything excessively. Chapter 22 If you set your heart on philosophy, be prepared from the very start to be ridiculed and jeered at by many people who will say, Suddenly he's come back to us a philosopher, and... Where do you suppose he got that supercilious look? Now, for your part, do not show a supercilious look, 
but hold fast to the things that seem best to you as someone who has been assigned to this post by God. And remember that if you persist in your principles, those who at first ridiculed you will later admire you. But if, on the other hand, you are defeated by such people, you will be doubly ridiculed. Chapter 23 If at any time it should happen that you turn to external things with the aim of pleasing someone, understand that you have ruined your life's plan. Be content then, in everything with being a philosopher. And if you wish also to be regarded as such, appear so to yourself, and that will be sufficient. Chapter 24 1. Do not be troubled by thoughts such as these. I will be valued by no one my whole life long, a nobody everywhere. For if lacking value is something bad, which it is, you cannot be involved in anything bad through other people, any more than you can be involved in anything disgraceful. Is it any business of yours, then, to acquire status? or to be invited to a banquet? Certainly not. How then can this be regarded as lacking value? And how will you be a nobody everywhere, when all you have to be is a somebody concerning those things that are in your power, with respect to which you can be someone of the greatest value? 2. But my friends, you say, will lack support. What do you mean, lack support? Certainly they won't get much cash from you, neither will you make them Roman citizens. Who told you then that these things are amongst those that are in our power, and not the business of other people? And who can give to others things they do not have themselves? 3. Get some money then, someone says, so that we can have some too. If I can get it whilst also preserving my self-respect, my trustworthiness, my magnanimity, show me how, and I will get it. But if you ask me to forsake those things that are good, and my own, in order that you may acquire those things that are not good, see for yourself how unfair and thoughtless you are. Besides, what would you rather have, money, or a friend who is trustworthy and has self-respect? Therefore help me towards this end, and do not ask me to do anything by which I will lose those very qualities. 4. But my country, you say, as far as it depends on me, will be without my help. The Handbook of Epictetus 7, Revised, 2003, 10-10. I ask again, what help do you mean? It will not have colonnades and bathhouses on your account. But what does that mean? For neither is it provided with shoes by a smith, nor weapons by a shoemaker. It is enough if everyone properly attends to their own business. But if you were to provide it with another trustworthy citizen who has self-respect, would that not be of use to your country? Yes. Well then, you also cannot be useless to it. 5. What place then, you ask, will I have in the community? That which you may have whilst also preserving your trustworthiness and self-respect. But if, by wishing to be useful, you throw away these qualities, of what use can you be to your community if you become shameless and untrustworthy? Chapter 25 1. Has someone been honored above you at a banquet, or in a greeting, or in being called in to give advice? If these things are good, you should be pleased for the person who has received them. If, on the other hand, they are bad, do not be upset that you did not receive them yourself. Remember, with respect to acquiring things that are not in our power, you cannot expect an equal share if you do not behave in the same way as other people. 2. How is it possible, if you do not hang around someone's door, accompany them or praise them, to have an equal share with people who do these things. You will be unjust, therefore, and insatiable if you refuse to pay the price for which these things are sold, but wish instead to obtain them for nothing. 3. For what price are lettuces sold? An obol, let's say. 
when someone else then pays an obol and takes the lettuce, whilst you, not paying it, go without. Do not imagine that this person has gained an advantage over you. Whereas they have the lettuce, you still have the obol that you did not pay. 4. So, in the present case, if you have not been invited to someone's banquet, that is because you have not paid them the price for which a banquet is sold. They sell it for praise. They sell it for flattery. Pay the price, then, for which it is sold, if you think this will be to your advantage. But if at the same time you do not want to pay the one, yet wish to receive the other, you are insatiable and foolish. 5. Do you have nothing, then, in place of the banquet? You have this. You have not had to praise the person you did not want to praise, and you have not had to bear the insolence of their doorkeepers. Chapter 26 We can understand the will of nature from those things in which we do not differ from one another. For example, when our neighbor's slave has broken a cup, we are immediately ready to say, well, such things happen. Understand then, that when your own cup gets broken, you should react in just the same way as when someone else's cup gets broken. Apply the same principle to matters of greater importance. Has someone else's child or wife died? There is no one who would not say, such is the way of things. But when someone's own child dies, they immediately cry, woe is me. How wretched I am. But we should remember how we feel when we hear of the same thing happening to other people. Chapter 27 Just as a target is not set up in order to be missed, so neither does the nature of evil exist in the world. Chapter 28 How angry you would be if someone handed over your body to just any person who happened to meet you. Are you not ashamed then, when you hand over your mind to just any person you happen to meet, such that when they abuse you, you are upset and troubled? Chapter 29 1. In every undertaking, consider what comes first and what comes after, then proceed to the action itself. Otherwise, you will begin with a rush of enthusiasm, having failed to think through the consequences only to find that later, when difficulties appear, you will give up in disgrace. 2. Do you want to win at the Olympic Games? So do I, by the gods. For that is a fine achievement. But consider what comes first and what comes after, and only then begin the task. You must be well disciplined, submit to a diet, abstain from sweet things, follow a training schedule at the set times, in the heat, in the cold, no longer having cold drinks or wine just when you like. In a word, you must hand yourself over to your trainer, just as you would to a doctor. And then, when the contest comes, you may strain your wrist, twist your ankle, swallow lots of sand, sometimes be whipped, and after all that, suffer defeat. 3. Think about all this, and if you still want to, then train for the games, otherwise you will behave like children, who first play at being wrestlers, then at being gladiators, then they blow trumpets, then act in a play. In the same way, you will first be an athlete, then a gladiator, then an orator, then a philosopher. But you will do none of these things wholeheartedly. But like a monkey, you will mimic whatever you see, as first one thing, then another, takes your fancy. All this because you do not undertake anything after properly considering it from all sides, but randomly and half-heartedly. 4. So it is when some people go to see a philosopher and hear someone speak such as Euphrates, and who can speak like him? They too want to be philosophers. 5. But first consider what sort of undertaking this is, then examine your own capacities to see if you can bear it. So you want to be a pentathlete or a wrestler? Look at your arms, your thighs, examine your back. Different people are naturally suited to different tasks. 6. 
do you think that if you do these things you can still eat in the same way, drink in the same way, give way to anger and irritation, just as you do now? You must go without sleep, endure hardship, live away from home, be looked down on by a slave boy, be laughed at by those whom you meet, and in everything get the worst of it, in honors, in status, in the law courts, and in every little affair. 7. Consider carefully whether you are willing to pay such a price for peace of mind, freedom and serenity, for if you are not, do not approach philosophy and do not behave like children, being first a philosopher, next a tax collector, then an orator, and later a procurator of the emperor. These things are not compatible. You must be one person, either good or bad. You must cultivate either your ruling principle or external things. Seek to improve things inside or things outside. That is, you must play the role either of a philosopher or an uneducated person. Chapter 30. The actions that are appropriate for us can generally be determined by our relationships. He is your father. This tells you to take care of him, to yield to him in all things, to put up with him when he abuses you or beats you. But he is a bad father. Nature did not provide for you a good father, but a father. Your brother wrongs you? Well then, maintain your relationship to him. Do not think about what he is doing, but about what you will have to do if you want to keep your moral character in accordance with nature. For no one can harm you unless you wish it. You will be harmed only when you think you are harmed. If you get into the habit of looking at the relationships implied by neighbor, citizen, commander, you will discover what is proper to expect from each. Chapter 31 1. Know that the most important thing regarding devotion to the gods is to have the right opinions about them, that they exist and administer the universe well and justly, to stand ready to obey them, to submit to everything that happens, and to follow it willingly as something being accomplished by the most perfect intelligence. Do this, and you will never blame the gods nor accuse them of neglecting you. 2. But you will not be able to do this unless you remove the notions of good and bad from things that are not in our power. For if you believe that anything not in our power is good or bad, then when you fail to get what you want or get what you do not want, it is inevitable that you will blame and hate those responsible. 3. For every living thing naturally flees and avoids things that appear harmful and their causes, and pursues and admires things that are beneficial and their causes. It is impossible, then, for someone who thinks they are being harmed to take delight in what they suppose is causing the harm, just as it is impossible for them to take delight in the harm itself. 4. This is why even a father is reproached by his son when he does not give him a share of those things the son regards as good. Thus, in thinking a king's throne to be something good, Eteocles and Polynices became enemies. This is why the farmer reproaches the gods, and so too the sailor, the merchant, and those who lose their wives and children. For people are devoted to what they find advantageous. Therefore, whoever takes proper care of their desires and aversions at the same time also cares properly for their devotion. 5. But it is everyone's duty to offer libations, sacrifices, and first fruits according to tradition, with a pure disposition, not slovenly or carelessly, neither too meanly nor beyond our means. Chapter 32 1. When you make use of divination, Remember that you do not know how events will turn out. This is what you have come to learn from the diviner. But if you really are a philosopher, you know before you come what sort of thing it is. For if it is one of the things that are not in our power, then necessarily what will happen will be neither good nor bad. 2. 
therefore do not bring desire and aversion to the diviner, for if you do, you will be fearful of what you may hear. But go with the understanding that everything that happens will be indifferent and of no concern to you. For whatever it may be, it is in your power to make good use of it, and that no one can hinder you in this. Go with confidence to the gods as your counselors, and afterwards, when some advice has been given, remember from whom you have received it, and whose counsel you will be disregarding if you disobey. 3. Approach the diviner in the way Socrates thought appropriate, that is, only in those cases when the whole question turns upon the outcome of events, and when there are no means afforded by reason or any other art for discovering what is going to happen. Therefore, when it is your duty to share a danger with a friend or with your country, do not ask the diviner whether you should share the danger. For even if the diviner should happen to tell you that the omens are unfavorable, that death is foretold, or mutilation to some part of the body, or exile, even at this risk, reason requires you to stand by your friend or share the danger with your country. Pay attention, therefore, to the greater diviner, Pythian Apollo, who threw from the temple the man who did not help his friend when he was being murdered. Chapter 33 1. From the outset, establish for yourself a certain character and disposition that you will maintain both when you are by yourself and with other people. 2. For the most part, keep silent or say only what is required in few words. On rare occasions when circumstances call for it, we will speak, but not about ordinary things, not about gladiators, nor horse racing, not about athletes, nor about food and drink, which are the usual topics. And especially do not talk about people, blaming or praising or comparing them. 3. If at all possible, turn the conversation of the company by what you say to more suitable topics. And if you happen to be alone amidst strangers, keep silent. 4. Do not laugh a great deal, nor at many things, nor without restraint. 5. Avoid swearing oaths altogether if possible, otherwise refuse to do so as far as circumstances allow. 6. Avoid banquets given by strangers and uneducated people. But if there is ever an occasion to join in them, take every care never to slip into the ways of the uneducated. Be assured that if your companion is dirty, it is inevitable that in their company you will become dirty yourself, even if you happen to start out clean. 7. As to things concerning the body, take only what bare necessity requires with respect to such things as food, drink, clothing, shelter, and household slaves, Exclude everything that is for outward show or luxury. 8. As for sex, you should stay pure before marriage as far as you can. But if you have to indulge, do only what is lawful. However, do not be angry with those who do indulge or criticize them, and do not boast of the fact that you do not yourself indulge. 9. If you are told that someone is saying bad things about you, do not defend yourself against what is said, but answer, Obviously this person is ignorant of my other faults, otherwise they would not have mentioned only these ones. 10. It is not necessary for the most part to go to public games, but if it is ever appropriate for you to go, show that your first concern is for no one other than yourself. That is, Wish only to happen what does happen, and wish only those to win who do win, and in this way you will meet with no hindrance. Refrain entirely from shouting or laughing at anyone, or getting greatly excited. And after you have left, do not talk a great deal about what happened, except in so far as it contributes to your own improvement, for doing so would make it clear that you have been impressed by the spectacle. 11. Do not go randomly or thoughtlessly to public readings, but when you do go, maintain your own dignity and equanimity, and guard against offending anyone. 
12. When you are about to meet someone, especially someone who enjoys high esteem, ask yourself what Socrates or Zeno would have done in such circumstances, and you will have no difficulty in making proper use of the occasion. 13. When you go to see someone who has great power, propose to yourself that you will not find them at home, that you will be shut out, that the doors will be slammed in your face, that this person will pay no attention to you. And if in spite of all this it is your duty to go, then go and bear what happens, and never say to yourself, it wasn't worth the trouble. For that is the way of the uneducated person, someone who is bewildered by external things. 14. In conversations, avoid talking at great length or excessively about your own affairs and adventures. However pleasant it may be for you to talk about the risks you have run, it is not equally pleasant for other people to hear about your adventures. 15. Avoid also trying to excite laughter, for this is the sort of behavior that slips easily into vulgarity and at the same time is liable to diminish the respect your neighbors have for you. 16. There is danger also in lapsing into foul language. So whenever anything like this happens, if the opportunity arises, go so far as to rebuke those who behave this way. Otherwise, by keeping silent and blushing and frowning, make it clear that you disapprove of such language. Chapter 34. When you get an impression of some pleasure, as in the case of other impressions, guard against being carried away by it, but let the matter wait for you and delay a little. Now consider these two periods of time that during which you will enjoy the pleasure, and that when the pleasure has passed, during which you will regret it and reproach yourself. Next set against these how pleased you will be if you refrain, and how you will commend yourself. When, however, the time comes to act, take care that the attraction, allure and seductiveness of the pleasure do not overcome you. But set against all this, the thought of how much better it is to be conscious of having won this victory over it. Chapter 35 When you do something from a clear judgment that it ought to be done, never try to avoid being seen doing it, even if you expect most people to disapprove. If, however, it would not be right to do it, avoid the deed itself. But if it is right, why be afraid of anyone who wrongly disapproves? Chapter 36 just as the propositions, it is day and it is night, can be used meaningfully in a disjunctive proposition, but make no sense in a conjunctive proposition. So at a feast, to choose the largest share may make sense with respect to nourishing the body, but makes no sense for maintaining the proper kind of social feeling. Therefore, when you are eating with someone else, Bear in mind not merely the value to your body of what is set before you, but also the value of maintaining the proper respect for your host. Chapter 37 If you undertake a role that is beyond your capacities, you both disgrace yourself in that one, and also fail in the role that you might have filled successfully. Chapter 38 Just as in walking about you take care not to step on a nail or twist your ankle, so also you should take care not to harm your ruling principle. If we guard against this in every action, we will engage in affairs with greater security. Chapter 39 Every one of Tim's body is the measure for their possessions, as the foot is a measure for the shoe. If then you hold this principle, you will maintain the proper measure. But if you go beyond it, you will inevitably be carried over a cliff. Thus, in the case of the shoe, if you go beyond the foot, first you will get a gilded shoe, then a purple one, and then an embroidered one. For once you have gone beyond the measure, there is no limit. Chapter 40 Once they reach the age of 14 years, women are addressed by men as ladies. Accordingly, when they see that there is nothing else but pleasing men with sex, they begin to use makeup and dress up, and to place all their hopes in that. 
It is worth our while, then, to make sure they understand that they are valued for nothing other than their good behavior and self-respect. Chapter 41 It is a sign of foolishness to spend a lot of time on things that concern the body, such as exercising a great deal, eating and drinking a lot, defecating and having sex. These are things that should be done in passing. Instead, you should turn your whole attention to the care of your mind. Chapter 42 When someone treats you badly or says bad things about you, remember that they do or say these things because they think it is appropriate. This is because it is not possible for someone to act on how things appear to you, but on how things appear to them. Accordingly, if someone has a wrong opinion, because this is the person who has been deceived, it is they who suffer the harm. In the same way, if someone supposes that a true conjunction is false, it is not the conjunction that is harmed, but the person who has been deceived. If you proceed, then, from these principles, you will be gentle with the person who abuses you, saying on all such occasions, to them, this is how it seems. Chapter 43 Every circumstance has two handles. Use one, and it may be carried, but use the other, and it cannot be carried. Therefore, whenever your brother treats you unjustly, do not take hold of the matter by the handle that he has wronged you, for this is the handle by which the matter cannot be carried, but rather by the other handle, that he is your brother, that you were raised up together, and you will take hold of it using the handle by which it may be carried. Chapter 44 These inferences are invalid. I am richer than you. Therefore, I am better than you. I am more eloquent than you. Therefore, I am better than you. But these are better argued. I am richer than you. Therefore, my property is greater than yours. I am more eloquent than you. Therefore, my speech is superior to yours. For you, of course, are neither property nor speech. Chapter 45 Does someone bathe hastily? Do not say that they do so badly, but hastily. Does someone drink a great deal of wine? Do not say that they do this badly, but that they drink a great deal. For until you understand their motives, how do you know that what they do is bad? Understand this, and you will never receive convincing impressions but assent to quite different ones. Chapter 46 1. On no occasion call yourself a philosopher, and do not talk a great deal amongst uneducated people about philosophical principles, but do what follows from those principles. For example, at a banquet do not talk about how people ought to eat, but eat as someone should. Remember how Socrates had so completely eliminated ostentation that people would come to him wanting him to introduce them to philosophers, and he would take them off to other philosophers. So little did he care about being overlooked. 2. And if a discussion about philosophical principles should arise in uneducated people, keep silent for the most part, for there is great danger that you will immediately vomit up what you have not yet digested. And when someone says to you that you know nothing, and you are not offended, then know that you have begun your work. For sheep do not present their fodder to the shepherd to show how much they have eaten, but they digest their food within to produce wool and milk on the outside. So do not display your philosophical principles to uneducated people, but show them the actions that result from the principles when you digest them. Chapter 47 once you have adapted your body to plain, simple living, do not make a show of it. When you drink water, do not declare on every occasion that you are drinking water. If you want to train yourself to endure hardships, do it by yourself, away from other people. Do not embrace statues, but if you are ever thirsty, take a mouthful of cold water and spit it out without telling anyone. Chapter 48 1. 
The condition and character of the uneducated person is this. They never look for benefit or harm to come from themselves, but from external things. The condition and character of the philosopher is this. They look for every benefit and harm to come from themselves. 2. The signs that someone is making progress are these. They blame no one. They praise no one. They find fault with no one. They accuse no one. They never say anything of themselves, as though they amount to something or know anything. When they are impeded or hindered, they blame themselves. If someone praises them, they laugh inwardly at the person who praises them. And if anyone censures them, they make no defense. They go about as if they were sick, cautious not to disturb what is healing before they are fully recovered. 3. They have rid themselves of all desires and have transferred their aversion to only those things contrary to nature that are in our power. They have no strong preferences in regard to anything. If they appear foolish or ignorant, they do not care. In a word, they keep guard over themselves as though they are their own enemy lying in wait. Chapter 49 when someone prides themselves on being able to understand and explain Chrysippus, say to yourself, if Chrysippus had not written obscurely, this person would have nothing on which to pride themselves. But what do I want? To understand nature and to follow her. Therefore I seek someone who can explain this to me, and when I hear that Chrysippus can do so, I go to him. But I do not understand his writings so I seek someone who can explain them to me. Now, up to this point, there is nothing to be proud of. When I find someone to explain them, what remains is my putting his principles into practice. This is the only thing to be proud of. But if I am impressed merely by the act of explaining, what else have I accomplished but become a philologist instead of a philosopher? except only that I can explain Chrysippus instead of Homer. No, when someone says to me, explain Chrysippus to me, rather than feel proud, I would blush when I am unable to manifest actions that agree and harmonize with Chrysippus's teaching. Chapter 50. Abide by the principles you have adopted as if they were divine laws, as if it would be sacrilegious to transgress them. Pay no attention to what people say about you, for this is no longer yours. Chapter 51 1. For how long will you put off demanding of yourself the best, and never to transgress the dictates of reason? You have received the philosophical principles to which you ought to agree, and you have accepted them. What sort of teacher are you waiting for, that you put off improving yourself until they come? You are no longer a child, but a grown adult. If you remain negligent and lazy, always piling up delay upon delay, fixing first one day, then another, after which you will attend to yourself, you will fail to make progress without even realizing, but will continue to live as someone uneducated until you die. 2. From this moment, commit yourself to living as an adult as someone who is making progress, and let everything that appears best to you be a law that you cannot transgress. And if you are presented with anything laborious, or something pleasant, with anything reputable or disreputable, remember that the contest is now, that the Olympic Games are now, that it is no longer possible to put them off, and that progress is won or lost, as the result of just once giving in. 3. This is how Socrates attained perfection, by paying attention to nothing but reason in everything that he encountered. But even if you are not yet Socrates, you should live as someone who wishes to be Socrates. Chapter 52 1. The first and most necessary topic in philosophy concerns putting principles to practical use, such as we ought not to lie. 
The second is concerned with demonstrations such as, why is it that we ought not to lie? And the third is concerned with confirming and articulating the first two. For example, why is this a demonstration? For what is a demonstration? What is entailment? What is contradiction? What is truth? And what is falsehood? Two, thus the third topic of study is necessary for the second and the second is necessary for the first. But the most necessary, the one where we ought to rest, is the first. But we do the opposite. We spend our time on the third topic. Upon this we expend all our efforts, whilst entirely neglecting the first topic. Thus, whilst at the same time as lying, we are more than ready to explain why it is wrong to lie. Chapter 53 1. We must always have these thoughts at hand. Lead me, Zeus, and you too, Destiny, wherever you have assigned me to go, and I'll follow without hesitating. But if I'm not willing, because I am bad, I'll follow all the same. 2. Whosoever properly with fate complies, we say is wise, and understands things divine. 3. Well, Credo, if this pleases the gods, let it happen this way. 4. Certainly, Anitus and Melitus may put me to death, but they cannot harm me. Epicurus, letter to Menwicius. Greetings. Let no one be slow to seek wisdom when he is young, nor weary in the search of it when he has grown old. For no age is too early or too late for the health of the soul. And to say that the season for studying philosophy has not yet come, or that it is past and gone, is like saying that the season for happiness is not yet, or that it is now no more. Therefore both old and young alike ought to seek wisdom, the former in order that, as age comes over him, he may be young in good things because of the grace of what has been, and the latter in order that, while he is young, he may at the same time be old, because he has no fear of the things which are to come. So we must exercise ourselves in the things which bring happiness, since, if that be present, we have everything, and if that be absent, all our actions are directed towards attaining it. Those things which without ceasing I have declared unto you, do them, and exercise yourself in them, holding them to be the elements of right life. First believe that God is a living being immortal and happy, according to the notion of a God indicated by the common sense of mankind. And so believing you shall not affirm of him anything that is foreign to his immortality or that is repugnant to his happiness. Believe about him whatever may uphold both his happiness and his immortality. For there are gods, and the knowledge of them is manifest. But they are not such as the multitude believe seeing that men do not steadfastly maintain the notions they form respecting them. Not the man who denies the gods worshipped by the multitude, but he who affirms of the gods what the multitude believes about them is truly impious. For the utterances of the multitude about the gods are not true preconceptions but false assumptions. Hence it is that the greatest evils happen to the wicked, and the greatest blessings happen to the good, from the hand of the gods, seeing that they are always favorable to their own good qualities and take pleasure in men like themselves, but reject as alien whatever is not of their kind. Accustom yourself to believing that death is nothing to us, for good and evil imply the capacity for sensation, and death is the privation of all sentience. Therefore a correct understanding that death is nothing to us makes the mortality of life enjoyable not by adding to life a limitless time, but by taking away the yearning after immortality. For life has no terrors for him who has thoroughly understood that there are no terrors for him in ceasing to live. Foolish, therefore, is the man who says that he fears death, not because it will pain when it comes, but because it pains in the prospect. Whatever causes no annoyance when it is present causes only a groundless pain in the expectation. Death, therefore, the most awful of evils, is nothing to us, 
seeing that when we are, death is not come, and when death is come, we are not. It is nothing then either to the living or to the dead, for with the living it is not, and the dead exist no longer. But in the world, at one time men shun death as the greatest of all evils, and at another time choose it as a respite from the evils in life. The wise man does not deprecate life, nor does he fear the cessation of life. The thought of life is no offense to him, nor is the cessation of life regarded as an evil. And even as men choose of food not merely and simply the larger portion, but the more pleasant, so the wise seek to enjoy the time which is most pleasant and not merely that which is longest. And he who admonishes the young to live well and the old to make a good end speaks foolishly, not merely because of the desirability of life, but because the same exercise at once teaches to live well and to die well. Much worse is he who says that it were good not to be born, but when once one is born to pass quickly through the gates of Hades. For if he truly believes this, why does he not depart from life? It would be easy for him to do so once he were firmly convinced. If he speaks only in jest, his words are foolishness as those who hear him do not believe. We must remember that the future is neither wholly ours nor wholly not ours, so that neither must we count upon it as quite certain to come, nor despair of it as quite certain not to come. We must also reflect that of desires some are natural, others are groundless, and that of the natural, some are necessary as well as natural, and some natural only. And of the necessary desires, some are necessary if we are to be happy, some if the body is to be rid of uneasiness, some if we are even to live. He who has a clear and certain understanding of these things will direct every preference and aversion toward securing health of body and tranquility of mind seeing that this is the sum and end of a happy life. For the end of all our actions is to be free from pain and fear, and when once we have attained all this, the tempest of the soul is laid, seeing that the living creature has no need to go in search of something that is lacking, nor to look for anything else by which the good of the soul and of the body will be fulfilled. When we are pained because of the absence of pleasure, then, and then only, do we feel the need of pleasure. Wherefore we call pleasure the Alpha and Omega of a happy life. Pleasure is our first and kindred good. It is the starting point of every choice and of every aversion, and to it we come back, inasmuch as we make feeling the rule by which to judge of every good thing. And since pleasure is our first and native good, for that reason, we do not choose every pleasure whatsoever, but will often pass over many pleasures when a greater annoyance ensues from them. And often we consider pain superior to pleasures when submission to the pains for a long time brings us as a consequence a greater pleasure. While therefore all pleasure because it is naturally akin to us is good, not all pleasure is should be chosen, just as all pain is an evil and yet not all pain is to be shunned. It is, however, by measuring one against another, and by looking at the conveniences and inconveniences, that all these matters must be judged. Sometimes we treat the good as an evil, and the evil, on the contrary, as a good. Again, we regard independence of outward things as a great good, not so as in all cases to use little, but so as to be contented with little if we have not much, being honestly persuaded that they have the sweetest enjoyment of luxury, who stand least in need of it, and that whatever is natural is easily procured and only the vain and worthless hard to win. Plain fare gives as much pleasure as a costly diet, when once the pain of want has been removed, while bread and water confer the highest possible pleasure when they are brought to hungry lips. To habituate oneself, therefore, to simple and inexpensive diet supplies all that is needful for health, 
and enables a man to meet the necessary requirements of life without shrinking, and it places us in a better condition when we approach at intervals a costly fare and renders us fearless of fortune. When we say then that pleasure is the end and aim, we do not mean the pleasures of the prodigal or the pleasures of sensuality, as we are understood to do by some through ignorance, prejudice, or willful misrepresentation. By pleasure we mean the absence of pain in the body and of trouble in the soul. It is not an unbroken succession of drinking bouts and of revelry, not sexual lust, not the enjoyment of the fish and other delicacies of a luxurious table, which produce a pleasant life. It is sober reasoning, searching out the grounds of every choice and avoidance, and banishing those beliefs through which the greatest tumults take possession of the soul. Of all this, the beginning and the greatest good is wisdom. Therefore, wisdom is a more precious thing even than philosophy. From it spring all the other virtues, for it teaches that we cannot live pleasantly without living wisely, honorably, and justly, nor live wisely, honorably, and justly without living pleasantly. For the virtues have grown into one with a pleasant life, and a pleasant life is inseparable from them. Who then is superior in your judgment to such a man? He holds a holy belief concerning the gods and is altogether free from the fear of death. He has diligently considered the end fixed by nature and understands how easily the limit of good things can be reached and attained and how either the duration or the intensity of evils is but slight. Fate, which some introduce as sovereign over all things, he scorns, affirming rather that some things happen of necessity, others by chance, others through our own agency. For he sees that necessity destroys responsibility and that chance is inconstant, whereas our own actions are autonomous, and it is to them that praise and blame naturally attach. It were better indeed to accept the legends of the gods than to bow beneath that yoke of destiny which the natural philosophers have imposed. The one holds out some faint hope that we may escape if we honor the gods, while the necessity of the naturalists is deaf to all entreaties. Nor does he hold chance to be a god, as the world in general does, for in the acts of a god there is no disorder, nor to be a cause, though an uncertain one for he believes that no good or evil is dispensed by chance to men so as to make life happy, though it supplies the starting point of great good and great evil. He believes that the misfortune of the wise is better than the prosperity of the fool. It is better, in short, that what is well judged in action should not owe its successful issue to the aid of chance. Exercise yourself in these and related precepts day and night both by yourself and with one who is like-minded, then never, either in waking or in dream, will you be disturbed, but will live as a god among men. For man loses all semblance of mortality by living in the midst of immortal blessings. Epicurus Principal Doctrines 1. A blessed and indestructible being has no trouble himself and brings no trouble upon any other being. So he is free from anger and partiality, for all such things imply weakness. 2. Death is nothing to us, for that which has been dissolved into its elements experiences no sensations, and that which has no sensation is nothing to us. 3. The magnitude of pleasure reaches its limit in the removal of all pain. When such pleasure is present, so long as it is uninterrupted, there is no pain either of body or of mind or of both together. 4. Continuous bodily pain does not last long. Instead, pain, if extreme, is present a very short time, and even that degree of pain which slightly exceeds bodily pleasure does not last for many days at once. Diseases of long duration allow an excess of bodily pleasure over pain. 5. It is impossible to live a pleasant life without living wisely and honorably and justly, 
and it is impossible to live wisely and honorably and justly without living pleasantly. Whenever any one of these is lacking, when, for instance, the man is not able to live wisely, though he lives honorably and justly, it is impossible for him to live a pleasant life. 6. In order to obtain protection from other men, any means for attaining this end is a natural good. 7. Some men want fame and status, thinking that they would thus make themselves secure against other men. If the life of such men really were secure, they have attained a natural good. If, however, it is insecure, they have not attained the end which by nature's own prompting they originally sought. 8. No pleasure is a bad thing in itself, but the things which produce certain pleasures entail disturbances many times greater than the pleasures themselves. 9. If every pleasure had been capable of accumulation, not only over time, but also over the entire body, or at least over the principal parts of our nature, then pleasures would never differ from one another. 10. If the things that produce the pleasures of profligate men really freed them from fears of the mind concerning celestial and atmospheric phenomena, the fear of death and the fear of pain, if further they taught them to limit their desires, we should never have any fault to find with such persons, for they would then be filled with pleasures from every source, and would never have pain of body or mind, which is what is bad. 11. If we had never been troubled by celestial and atmospheric phenomena, nor by fears about death, nor by our ignorance of the limits of pains and desires, we should have had no need of natural science. 12. It is impossible for someone to dispel his fears about the most important matters if he doesn't know the nature of the universe but still gives some credence to myths. So without the study of nature there is no enjoyment of pure pleasure. 13. There is no advantage to obtaining protection from other men, so long as we are alarmed by events above or below the earth or in general by whatever happens in the boundless universe. 14. Protection from other men, secured to some extent by the power to expel and by material prosperity, comes in its purest form from a quiet life withdrawn from the multitude. 15. The wealth required by nature is limited and is easy to procure, but the wealth required by vain ideals extends to infinity. 16. Chance seldom interferes with the wise man. His greatest and highest interests have been, are, and will be directed by reason throughout his whole life. 17. The just man is most free from disturbance, while the unjust is full of the utmost disturbance. 18. Bodily pleasure does not increase when the pain of want has been removed. After that it only admits of variation. The limit of mental pleasure, however, is reached when we reflect on these bodily pleasures and their related emotions, which used to cause the mind the greatest alarms. 19. Unlimited time and limited time afford an equal amount of pleasure, if we measure the limits of that pleasure by reason. 20. The flesh receives as unlimited the limits of pleasure, and to provide it requires unlimited time. But the mind, intellectually grasping what the end and limit of the flesh is, and banishing the terrors of the future, procures a complete and perfect life, and we have no longer any need of unlimited time. Nevertheless, the mind does not shun pleasure, and even when circumstances make death imminent, the mind does not lack enjoyment of the best life. 21. He who understands the limits of life knows that it is easy to obtain that which removes the pain of want and makes the whole of life complete and perfect. Thus he has no longer any need of things which involve struggle. 22. We must consider both the ultimate end and all clear sensory evidence to which we refer our opinions, for otherwise everything will be full of uncertainty and confusion. 23. 
If you fight against all your sensations, you will have no standard to which to refer, and thus no means of judging even those sensations which you claim are false. 24. If you reject absolutely any single sensation without stopping to distinguish between opinion about things awaiting confirmation and that which is already confirmed to be present, whether in sensation or in feelings or in any application of intellect to the presentations, you will confuse the rest of your sensations by your groundless opinion, and so you will reject every standard of truth. If in your ideas based upon opinion, you hastily affirm as true all that awaits confirmation as well as that which does not, you will not avoid error, as you will be maintaining the entire basis for doubt in every judgment between correct and incorrect opinion. 25. If you do not on every occasion refer each of your actions to the ultimate end prescribed by nature, but instead of this in the act of choice or avoidance turn to some other end, your actions will not be consistent with your theories. 26. All desires that do not lead to pain when they remain unsatisfied are unnecessary, but the desire is easily got rid of when the thing desired is difficult to obtain or the desires seem likely to produce harm. 27. Of all the means which wisdom acquires to ensure happiness throughout the whole of life, by far the most important is friendship. 28. The same conviction which inspires confidence that nothing we have to fear is eternal or even of long duration, also enables us to see that in the limited evils of this life, nothing enhances our security so much as friendship. 29. Of our desires, some are natural and necessary. Others are natural but not necessary. And others are neither natural nor necessary, but are due to groundless opinion. 30. Those natural desires which entail no pain when unsatisfied, though pursued with an intense effort, are also due to groundless opinion. And it is not because of their own nature they are not got rid of, but because of man's groundless opinions. 31. Natural justice is a pledge of reciprocal benefit to prevent one man from harming or being harmed by another. 32. Those animals which are incapable of making binding agreements with one another not to inflict nor suffer harm are without either justice or injustice. And likewise, for those peoples who either could not or would not form binding agreements not to inflict nor suffer harm. 33. There never was such a thing as absolute justice, but only agreements made in mutual dealings among men in whatever places at various times, providing against the infliction or suffering of harm. 34. Injustice is not an evil in itself, but only in consequence of the fear which is associated with the apprehension of being discovered by those appointed to punish such actions. 35. It is impossible for a man who secretly violates the terms of the agreement not to harm or be harmed to feel confident that he will remain undiscovered, even if he has already escaped ten thousand times. For until his death he is never sure that he will not be detected. 36. In general, justice is the same for all, for it is something found mutually beneficial in men's dealings, but in its application to particular places or other circumstances, the same thing is not necessarily just for everyone. 37. Among the things held to be just by law, whatever is proved to be of advantage in men's dealings has the stamp of justice, whether or not it be the same for all. But if a man makes a law and it does not prove to be mutually advantageous, then this is no longer just. And if what is mutually advantageous varies and only for a time corresponds to our concept of justice, nevertheless for that time it is just for those who do not trouble themselves about empty words, but look simply at the facts. 38. Where without any change in circumstances the things held to be just by law are seen not to correspond with the concept of justice in actual practice, 
such laws are not really just. But wherever the laws have ceased to be advantageous because of a change in circumstances, in that case the laws were for that time just when they were advantageous for the mutual dealings of the citizens, and subsequently ceased to be just when they were no longer advantageous. 39. The man who best knows how to meet external threats makes into one family all the creatures he can, and those he cannot, he at any rate does not treat as aliens, and where he finds even this impossible he avoids all dealings, and so far as is advantageous excludes them from his life. 40. Those who possess the power to defend themselves against threats by their neighbors, being thus in possession of the surest guarantee of security, live the most pleasant life with one another, and their enjoyment of the fullest intimacy is such that if one of them dies prematurely, the others do not lament his death as though it called for pity. 